So good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this roundtable discussion at an early hour and after the music night. I hope you enjoyed yesterday. Um, so um, this um, roundtable discussion today will be on um, inclusion and legitimacy in multi-stakeholder internet governance model, and uh, we'll be discussing um, ICANN as an example. Um, inclusion is a cornerstone uh, of legitimacy for multi-stakeholder approaches to internet governance. And one of the key arguments for supporting multi-stakeholder models is being equally inclusive to stakeholders from all sectors, regions, genders, languages, races, age groups, and etc. But how does this inclusive diversity work in practice? Does multi-stakeholder governance of uh, internet provide everyone with due opportunities to participate? What is the impact of this on effectiveness and fairness of the decision-making process? Um, all uh, are valid questions uh, that we uh, need to discuss. And today we'll be discussing uh, the Internet uh, Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers as an example. Um, ICANN is one of the main pioneers and champions of multi-stakeholderism in internet governance, um, in multi -stakeholder, of multi-stakeholderism, I'm sorry, in internet governance, and uh, moreover, um, uh, ICANN has concerted uh, many initiatives to promote inclusive uh, participation in the governance of global internet infrastructure. Um, so, what is the situation regarding inclusion uh, at ICANN today? How is ICANN addressing inclusiveness uh, and access in its bottom-up multi-stakeholder model? And how successful are those initiatives in practice? All these questions will be guiding uh, us in our discussion today. And um, today we have with us um, uh, Jan Scholte, Professor of uh, Peace and Development at University of Gutenberg and Co-Director uh, of the Center for Global Cor Corporation uh, Research at the University of uh, Duisburg, Essen. Uh, Jan is Principal Investigator in, I in the ICANN Legitimacy Study, which will be the subject of uh, our uh, discussion today. Uh, we also have with us um, Horten Sionen, uh, a researcher at the University of Gutenberg and part of Jan's team uh, working uh, on ICANN study as well. Um, so Jan and his team have uh, randomly selected more than 450 uh, participants uh, across ICANN from board, community and staff for a survey uh, interview. Uh, to get uh, most precise and reliable information on uh, basically three things. How do ICANN participants view the issue of inclusive participation and its uh, relation to ICANN legitimacy? How far do they perceive structural inequalities of influence in relation to geographical, sectoral and social uh, categories? and uh, whether they regard any such inequalities and uh, exclusions to be problematic for internet governance through ICANN. Um, so before handing over the floor to Jan to give us an overview of the report and its findings, allow me also to uh, introduce our speakers and discussants today um, and the format of the session. So we have four distinguished speakers with I'm sorry, three speakers with us. We have um, Nandini Chaimi uh, on my right. And uh, Nandini is Deputy Director of IT for Change, 
uh, Nandini's work largely focuses on uh, research and policy advocacy in the domains of uh, digital rights and development and the political economy of women's rights in the information society. So, welcome Nandini. Um, we also have with us Erika Mann, uh, sitting to my left. She is a senior European policy advisor in uh, Covington's EU uh, public policy practice group and a former member of the European Parliament. She is also a member of ICANN's GNSO Council and a former member of ICANN's Board of Directors. Um, Erika also um, opened the and, and headed the Facebook office in Brussels from 2011 to 2016. Um, and last but definitely not least, we also have uh, Leon Sanchez. Uh, Leon started as an ICANN Fellow and is now um, ICANN Board Director, but also the Vice Chair of the Board. He is a lawyer and head of the Intellectual Property Division and partner at uh, Fulton & Fulton, a law firm in Mexico. He is involved in um, ISOC Mexico and serves on the boards of Trustnet Corporate Group, ISDI Mexico, as well as several other non-profit organizations in, in Mexico. So we will be starting with um, a presentation from Jan on the report and the findings of the report. Um, then we will have two rounds of discussions uh, we will hear from our speakers their remarks on the report and then open the floor for uh, any comments or remarks. And then we'll give back the floor to our distinguished speakers for uh, further comments and any suggestions for uh, future proposals. And then back to the floor again to hear uh, your remarks and if you have further suggestions. So with this, and without further ado, I hand over to you, Jan, please. Okay. Thank you very much, Manal. Uh, thank you, Nandini, Erika, Leon, for participating and speaking. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you also remote participants. Are we okay for the remote participants? I hope they're, 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 they're here as well. Um, and thank you, those of you around the table. I'm not allowed to acknowledge you because the study was anonymous uh, and confidential, but a number of you I recognize as people that, uh, that, that spoke with us. And uh, if you had not helped us, then this study would not have happened. So I'm glad we have a chance to share what came out uh, in this sense. We're talking about the inclusion aspect here. In fact, as you know, the, the study is about legitimacy at ICANN and we looked at inequalities as an aspect of legitimacy at ICANN. But then we saw that the IGF was having a special stream on inclusion, and we thought, ah, actually we have some interesting data that could be shared here. So we're not actually going to be making the connections with legitimacy perceptions today, but we are look, going to look at the perceptions that people have of inequalities of influence at ICANN and multi-stakeholderism, and whether they matter. So these are our two questions. In what ways and to what extents do participants in the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, perceive inequalities of influence in the regime? So we're looking at perceptions. We're not looking at objective indicators. We're seeing what do people see. And uh, how far do participants perceive any such inequalities to be problematic? Because you might perceive inequalities but not actually find them problematic. So we also are asking people whether they find it problematic for the regime. Um, why are these questions interesting? Well, structural inequalities in very, in very general terms are debated much as, uh, uh, in, in contemporary society. Um, and perceptions of problematic inequalities can be major drivers for political debate and regime change. Also, when we look at inequalities in governance, inequalities in governance might actually help or serve to produce rules which generate or sustain inequalities in society more generally. In internet governance, uh, structural inequalities in the internet, so-called digital divides, uh, can deeply affect the life chances of people in a digital society, so inequalities are important in that way. Um, and then in multi-stakeholderism multi and ICANN, I mean, multi-stakeholderism promotes itself 
as being a way to get all affected people involved in decision taking and policy making. Uh, and I can, as a major site of multi-stakeholderism and multi-stakeholder governance has greatly promoted inclusive decision taking. Many, many initiatives over quite a few years to include people from all regions, from all genders, from multiple languages, uh, uh, all generations and so on. So it's interesting to ask now in 2018, 2019, when we did these uh, interviews, uh, how far do participants in the regime perceive inequalities of influence and do they find that they matter? So that's what we're going to show you. Uh, very quickly, we sampled. This is a, we did a random sample. We did a fairly rigorous random sample. Hortense is sitting next to me, this is the one who does all the technical stuff and, and is quite confident that we have a random sample so that what we tell you here is representative. It should be representative quite close within you know, several percentage points of, uh, of, of statistical uh, reliability to what the general situation uh, in the ICANN sphere is. Uh, we interviewed th all 30 members of the ICANN board between 2015 and 2018. Uh, we interviewed 305 members of the ICANN community, spread across different regions, uh, sectors, and so on. Uh, we interviewed 132 members of staff, and we weighted these, uh, the, the results that you see. So there's a disproportionate number. We wanted to have census samples, as they call it, from board, community, and staff. It means that the numbers were slightly uneven, and so we've uh, weighted them in the statistics that you'll see here. Okay, let's start with uh, results. Uh, we asked people in principle, how important do you find it that ICANN gives all stakeholders opportunities to participate? And here you can see, vast majority of people thought it was extremely important. So the principle of inclusive policy making, is, there's a pretty good consensus around it that that is important and should matter. So it's quite important or very important, and in fact, not so many people fall below that. Uh, then about ICANN's performance, in practice, to what extent do you think ICANN gives all stakeholders the opportunity to participate? So in practice, the first one was in principle, this is in practice, again the scores come out quite high. Uh, so to a large extent is the, is the high bars in the, in the middle there, a little bit to the right, uh, completely is the, is the, is the, the, the bunch to the, to, the, to the further right, moderately is the chunk in the middle, and then not so many people saying that, it, that not much happened. So, the record on inclusive participation by different stakeholders in ICANN is regarded as being relatively strong by participants in the ICANN regime. But, if you ask, are there inequalities of influence within that participation, then people also see that there are inequalities of participation. And here this graph shows you from left to right uh, five dimensions of inequality. The middle line four, if the lines had fallen at, at four in the middle, then it would have been a perception of equal influence. But you will see that in each case, the line comes below the four uh, to show perceived inequality of influence on average. So by age, some inequality perceived, um, then one goes further to uh, ethnicity, race, uh, language, uh, north-south, gender. Again, so uh, widely seen inequalities of influence, but then again, do they, are they regarded as problematic? Because you might say, okay, there are inequalities of one thing or another, and then you say, well, actually, it's not that important for the regime. So it's one thing to perceive inequalities of influence, it's another thing to find them problematic. Here are the results for, for perceiving them as problematic, and then you see that age inequalities are seen as relatively less problematic, uh, somewhere just below the moderately, so uh, above a, a bit problematic, but not quite at moderately problematic. The other four inequalities, by race, ethnicity, by uh, uh, language, by region, and by gender, are seen as progressively more problematic, somewhere between moderately problematic and quite problematic. Interesting thing, if you look here, the gender inequalities were perceived to be, the, the, the inequalities of influence by gender were perceived to be the least out of the five, but they are also regarded as being the most problematic. 
that's kind of interesting. Now let's look at what people say about inequalities and their problematicness depending on who they are. So within these different groups, you can, you can ask, do they perceive these inequalities differently? Now, on average, Global South participants and Global North participants perceive the same amount of North-South inequality. It's no different. So that's interesting. And on average, participants with lower English skills and higher English skills perceive broadly the same amount of inequality of influence. So on those two dimensions, not much difference. Doesn't matter who you are, you see the same average degree of inequality of influence. But non-white participants perceive significantly more race ethnic inequality in ICANN than white participants. So on the race ethnicity dimension, there's actually quite a different perception and experience of the situation. And on average, younger generations perceive a greater, significantly greater age inequality than the older generations. So everyone's seeing an inequality, but the younger people are seeing a greater inequality than the older generations. And on average, women perceive significantly more gender inequality at ICANN than men. And this is actually in order, so the biggest gap is actually the gender gap. So, people are seeing the different inequalities. Do they see the situations differently when it comes to whether it's problematic or not? Well, on average, non-white participants perceive race ethnic inequality at ICANN to be somewhat more problematic than white persons, but it's not statistically significant. But we do see that younger participants perceive age inequality at ICANN to be somewhat more problematic, and this one is statistically significant. Again, we're going in order. So the age perception of problematicness is also statistically significant. But then we move on again. On average, Global South participants perceive North-South inequalities at ICANN to be significantly more problematic than Global North participants. So everyone sees, both participants from North and South, see the same amount of inequality of influence on average, but the Global South participants find this inequality to be far more pro problematic than the Global North participants. And likewise, when we look at participants with lower English, skills, they are perceiving that language inequalities are more problematic than those who have the English skills. Again, this might be intuitively what you expect, but it's interesting to, to, to pin it down and to see that actually quite significant different perceptions. So, an English speaker might be in this situation and a non-English speaker, the English speaker thinks, oh yes, there is an inequality of influence there, but they, they underestimate the amount of, of degree to which this is problematic for the non-English speaker. Uh, and then the greatest, the greatest gap in perceptions is the gender one. So women participants perceive gender inequality at ICANN to be significantly more problematic than men. And here we're talking about it's a, it's a, it's a four-point scale and the difference of average perception is, is not 0.7. So that's, that's quite whopping actually. So in summary, participants uh, broadly appreciate ICANN's efforts to, reach, uh, to achieve uh, stakeholder involvement in policy making, but participants do perceive substantial inequalities of influence at ICANN uh, on lines of age, gender, geography, language, race, ethnicity, and sector. Actually, that's some additional evidence that we didn't present here. But, um, but and participants perceive these inequalities of influence to be between moderately and quite problematic for the regime. And as we've shown, in general, those in the more subordinate position of these hierarchies of influence tend to find these inequalities to be more problematic than those in the more dominant positions. Okay, now to anticipate a few qualifications that we might want to make, we are here only looking at perceptions of inequalities. We're only looking at what people see. We're not looking at, the, at sort of hard data about how many people are occupying chairs and that sort of thing. That kind of evidence you would look, want to uh, uh, supplement to this that we've presented here. We've just looked at the perceptions. Um, we have not established here the significance of these perceptions of inequality for the legitimacy of ICANN. So, we don't know yet, because we haven't done that part of the analysis, but you might perceive inequalities, you might perceive them to be problematic. It doesn't necessarily follow that you have less confidence in the regime. It may, but it doesn't necessarily follow. 
Um, and we should also note we have survey participants from the ICANN regime here only. One might presume, again we'd have to test it, but one might presume that people who are not participating on, in ICANN might on average perceive larger inequalities. Indeed, it might even be a reason why they don't participate. So with those qualifications, I hand, hand over to the speakers and thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you for the presentation, but also thank you, uh, you and Hortens for the, for the survey itself and for the study and for the interesting uh, findings. Um, actually, I find it very interesting when both sides see the problem, but one part see it significant, one part not. I mean, when there is agreement, there would be easier solutions. When there is not the same perceptions, um, this may make things a little bit more difficult. But uh, let's see how um, our speakers uh, regard the findings and who would like to start? Nandini, would you? Okay. Thank you, Professor Yan. And I'll structure my comments, you know, according to reflections on the report, as that is what we were asked to do when making the set of interventions. So first of all, I want to say that this report is very important because it reaffirms this understanding that openness is not necessarily equivalent to an environment for inclusive participation. And this is something that even other research into free culture and force communities and tech communities informed by this ethos have shown us, such as uh, Joseph Riegel's very famous work on Wikipedia communities. And it's also interesting to quote from the study that the people who are at the subordinate ends of structural inequalities of influence in ICANN find these hierarchies more problematic. And I think this is a very important consideration that we must take away when we look at like designing environments for meaningful and inclusive participation because a general exhortation for being open and diverse in general, that is actually very alienating for people from certain marginal locations. Because when there is an ethos where it's up to you to participate, and the environment is positioned as a neutral and open, then it's very easy to look at non-participation as a matter of individual choice or preference, but there may be structural dynamics in the interactions which alienate people of color or women or non-English speakers, and this is a very important finding, I think. The other thing I want to call attention to is something that surprised me in this study. So the study's finding said that many respondents did feel that the business sector has a strong influence on ICANN decisions, but at the same time, they also did not find this particularly problematic. I know the studies, uh, the survey was conducted between 2016 and uh, 2018, but in the light of subsequent developments, I'm particularly speaking about the decision to allow the increase of price caps on the .org domain. I found this decision very surprising because in this context, actually there were 3,000 parties who wrote opposing the removal of price caps and there were hardly six comments that supported the change. But in the final decision, when the price caps were uh, allowed to be removed, the summary from ICANN actually said that there was a group that opposed lifting price caps, but it is not true that the community was strongly opposed to lifting them. So there are 3,000 comments on one side and about six to seven comments on the other side. So when when these come together and certain decisions take place, we also have to look at accountability uh, in this decision making and we may need to rethink these processes in open decision making. And my final comment is that when we look at directions for future research, I think we must build from Professor Yan's summary point that perceptions are important, 
particularly in suggesting from where the greatest pressure for change might come, but they are not the only measure of the issue. This is because power operates at multiple levels and we may have to bring different methods to analyze what are the different dimensions of power at work which actually lead to certain decisions. Like for example, take the issue and the whole controversy around jurisdictional immunity, right? It might be good to also inform the study by speaking about why in that a particular controversy, there was a certain majoritarian opinion and who was in the minority and who was dissenting and how you could see geopolitics at operation there. So I think we need to also talk about power in the macro level in the analysis along with looking at micro power in personalized interactions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much Nandini for your uh, valuable remarks on um, different aspects, we'll get back to them uh, later, but allow me to also ask Erika, what would you uh, see regarding the findings and whether you have any anything specific that strikes you in the findings? Thank you so much, Manal. Um, and thank you so much for, the, um, for this great uh, study and uh, report. Um, what I like to do, I like to focus on maybe three more general uh, areas which I believe relate to the topic we are discussing. So I want to broaden the scope a little bit. So the first is the importance of the multi-stakeholder model and re related to the second topic which are the weaknesses. And in, in relation to the topic we are debating of fairness and inclusiveness, I believe there's one item we need to keep in mind and that's the history. So once you create an organization like when ICANN was created, it has a particular mission, a particular goal, it's relatively narrow in scope, and because of the history, of course you have much more uh, technical and business understanding, that's the way it was shaped, and automatically part of the uh, non-inclusiveness comes from the, from the history. Because if you have an organization like this, which was created uh, primarily, um, not only, but the, the beginning, much of the debate, how it was shaped, um, US and, and to some degree EU-centric based, of course it has, the history will never fade away. So it takes an immense long of time to overcome the, 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 these kind of uh, barriers. That's true for gender issues too. Because when you look back in the history, of course there were many women involved, but like it is often the case in, in institutional framing, um, these kind of participants are often in, 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 the, you know, in the future overlooked because men like to glorify themselves and, and women often don't do this. So that's a, a role we have to play actively to, you know, to uh, bring the women which are part of this uh, from the very beginning, you know, put to bring them in center. Um, so that's one issue which we, I believe we have to work on. The second we have to work on is what I call the weaknesses. So because of the model is very narrow, uh, I can, and it should be narrow, because it's only one part of the internet ecosystem. It's not the internet. We sometimes believe it's the internet, but it's not the internet. It's part of it, but that's it. But because of this, um, there are, of course, issues which are more focusing on, on let's say, on the, on the market driver, which are, you know, the, the domain system, which are located, uh, when, you, when you look at it, and, and the data, which are lo primi primarily located in certain locations around the globe. So, some of the, the unfairness or the which we experience, again, relates back to the dominance in certain markets, and we shouldn't forget this. And then because of this, we experience, um, you know, the disfavoring of certain regions, um, but it's a market reality. Um, we, we can't overlook it, it's part of a market reality. And uh, again, it relates to some degree, of course, to the proportion how women participate as well, because in these market segments, you have traditionally more men still than you have women. So you, we have to review this in, if we are debating uh, about this topic. And the last item, I believe, which is, um, is important, 
uh, what we typically tend to ignore, although we have ALAC and we have a, we try to shape the consumer and the user environment, but we have very poor understanding about it. We have super poor understanding about the, the market, we have super poor understanding about the domainer environment, and we have super poor understanding about consumers and users. Why am I saying this? Because in particular, on the, on the users and, and the consumers, they are, of course, across the globe. Um, and um, there you have a much broader uh, fair share between women and men, but we don't surface them because we have a very poor understanding um, in the ICANN environment. So, these are my points. Thank you so much, Manna. Thank you very much, Erika. So, um, over to you, Leon, please, and then we will open the floor for discussion. Thank you very much, Manal. Thank you, uh, uh, Jan, for conducting this study or tents. Thank you very much. Uh, as you said, I, I, I think the results of the study seem uh, very intuitive, right? It it's, it's, uh, seems obvious that those who feel that don't have the uh, influence they wish they had feel like there's this disparity and, 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 and they, they feel uh, aggravated about uh, 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 the lack of maybe inclusiveness or the meaningfulness in their participation. Uh, however, I think it's good that we have these results materialized so that they can be applied for us to actually set the bar and, 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 and identify the room that we have for improvement. So uh, I think that despite the efforts, there is actually room for improvement. But we can also not deny reality, right? I mean, not everyone is able to devote the time needed for meaningfully participating in ICANN. Uh, not everyone speaks English, not everyone has the resources of the connectivity to join uh, remotely a meeting, et cetera, et cetera. So, so yes, these are things that affect participation within ICANN, and not only within ICANN, but in other fora. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and this also draws a line between what I believe is the difference between inclusive and meaningful participation, right? As, as, as you were saying, uh, uh, we've seen this in the uh, open software, free software community, the open culture community, so, so the fact that it is open doesn't actually entail or comprise that your participation is either guaranteed or that it's meaningful. Uh, within these uh, groups, you also find uh, a notion which I think those who have been in ICANN are familiar with, which are the silos, right? So people get to, to gather around common interests and they, they, turn, they tend to form uh, groups. And these groups sometimes are uh, resistant to change and they are also resistant to new actors. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to find your way within, within a community that has been around for quite some time and they know each other very well and you are the new guys somehow and come in and people will have expectations about what is your agenda, what is your purpose of being there, do you actually come here to contribute meaningfully, are you constructively or willing to, to, uh, to contribute in a constructive way or are you just someone that is there to see how you make uh, people's life impossible, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there, there are a number of aspects that can uh, uh, influence or, or actually define how you find your way within, within ICANN. Uh, there's been some comments about business sector dominance. I've also heard a number of uh, comments about governmental dominance. Uh, it feels like maybe the end users could be the sandwich in this. Uh, I also have heard some comments about uh, the technical community being outliers because they might not be engaged anymore. They, they uh, might feel that uh, they have other things to do. So, so I, I, again, it, it depends on uh, uh, the lens through which you are looking at this, right? So businesses sometimes think that governments dominate. Governments say, oh no, it's the business sector that dominates. So this is what multi-stakeholderism is, right? We're not gonna have everyone agree and we're not gonna have everyone happy 
in this environment. Some define uh, multi-stakeholderism as uh, the art of uh, keeping everyone equally, uh, e equally uh, uh, unhappy. unhappy, yes, right? I, 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 I don't think that's the, uh, the way I see it. I think that uh, it's, it's a way of finding compromise. And yes, you have to, it's, it's a give and take, a constantly uh, given and taken and, 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 and being flexible and trying to find common grounds and trying to actually set yourself in, in the, in, you know, in, in, in the, in the, in the shoes of, of your counterpart and trying to understand and trying to say, okay, why, why is my counterpart seeing this the way he or she sees it? So the, the, the study says that ICANN is a big experiment in terms of multi-stakeholderism and I, and I do believe it is. And I think it's uh, set, uh, a lot of uh, examples and standards that can be followed not only within ICANN on how things could be done, but also on how things shouldn't be done. So it's, it's, it's a two-way avenue. And I, 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 I would like to reiterate that uh, I think that the system works. It, of course, needs improvement, but this is not something we're gonna perceive in the short term. So. This is something that's, that needs to be taken care of jointly with all stakeholders across regions, across groups of interests, uh, across uh, people of uh, the different social backgrounds that come into ICANN or that are, are interested in, in, in joining ICANN. Uh, and, and I see it as an educational as, as an, uh, and as a resource availability issue that is not solely to ICANN to resolve. Right, so this is why all the stakeholders that participate within ICANN should be doing actions within their reach and within their uh, groups of interest and influence to pull in new people and to try to level up, uh, to, to try to level the ground for everyone to meaningfully and inclusively uh, participate. So uh, with that, I would go back to Manal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leon, and um, thanks to all three speakers for um, some excellent points. So, uh, Nandini, you highlighted uh, that um, openness is not necessarily inclusiveness, um, and also um, the what came out as a business sector being more influential, um, and that perceptions are important, but not the only measure. Um, and, and Erica, you talked about the importance of multi-stakeholder model, the weaknesses um, of the model, and poor understanding of user and consumer uh, environment. And, and finally, uh, Lyon, on the, uh, the, the, the results seem to be right, things affecting participation uh, at ICANN and other fora as well, uh, silos within the multi-stakeholder model, and, and the perception of domination of, of uh, certain stakeholder groups. Um, so um, I'll stop here and open the floor for any other um, remarks uh, on the findings from uh, the audience, whether out of experience within ICANN or even other uh, multi-stakeholder fora. So, uh, the discussion is open. We're taking ICANN as an example, but please feel free if you have uh, experience uh, elsewhere. And I, I seem to know everyone, but it will be good to introduce yourself. So I have Sebastian and, and then Jorge. Yeah. Sebastian, please. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian Bachelet. Um, currently, uh, within ICANN, uh, newly elected chair of uh, Euralo, the part of end users within ICANN uh, in the European region. Uh, thank you, Jan, for this uh, study. I think it's a very important piece of work because uh, um, after the work done for IANA transition, stewardship IANA transition, um, you, you were participating to this and I guess it's uh, coming from the discussion we have in those groups that uh, this study is, uh, is coming from. And uh, I think it's a, a good image. I, I would like to urge us to uh, uh, do some uh, data analysis on, uh, and on historical data analysis of this, uh, uh, some of those uh, uh, 
uh, elements because uh, the composition of the leadership team in different parts of uh, ICANN could be a good uh, uh, subject to study how it has evolved and uh, how it could be evolved. The second point is that what we can do, and uh, that's good to have an uh, element of uh, information, but uh, what we can do and who could be in charge of changing that. Uh, when uh, in Workstream 2 we suggest to have a, a diversity um, a board or a diversity uh, 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 function to take care of that, uh, it was dismissed. And, um, and my last point is that sometimes the one who could uh, be the more strongest voice for something as the one who uh, struggle against. And, um, and today, I guess, gender balance could be achieved within ICANN, but the one more vocal not to do anything are some women. And I am sorry to say that, but I heard that because they, the answer is, oh, skill is more important. And my motto is, Skill you, st you can learn, the rest it's the diversity you can bring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Jorge, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, Jorge Cancio from the Swiss government. I happen also to <laughs> represent Switzerland in, within the GAC, the Governmental Advisory Committee. Um, first of all, uh, thanks very much for this study. I think it gives us uh, uh, useful data. And uh, as always with studies and data, uh, it will depend very much on the perspective uh, on how you read it or what you want to read in, uh, in that study. But I think uh, at least it's, it's a good basis. It's a common uh, ground on uh, where we can base more more fact-based uh, discussions. Uh, I think that uh, in the discussion it was pointed to the issue of uh, open working groups. Really in ICANN we, di we do policy in uh, the so-called uh, policy development, uh, development processes with open working groups, uh, open to anyone. Uh, but uh, as was pointed out, uh, open does not mean that uh, meaningful participation, that, <laughs> oh, that meaningful participation is possible. So there's open as a precondition, but it's far from being enough to make it possible that we have uh, participation from uh, all the stakeholder groups uh, in a balanced fashion. There are some, some discussions ongoing, the so-called PDP 3.0, this is a GNSO effort, so the, from that sub-organization of ICANN, which uh, prepares the policy on uh, generic top-level dom domains. But uh, I think that we are still very much in, uh, in the mindset of those uh, original and historically uh, uh, determined uh, open working group where uh, technicians uh, used to be uh, the peers who, uh, who participated there and everyone uh, in that community recognized themselves as equals. Normally it was Western white men with a technical background. But today ICANN is a completely different uh, animal. And the policies we do are um, mostly not really technical. There's a lot of policy, politics also in, in that. So uh, really communities, individual users, governments have a stake there. And uh, as one of the government representatives who has participated in, uh, I think, a lot of PDPs and of uh, cross-community working groups, which is a similar thing uh, in the ICANN world. Um, when you look around in the call or in the, at the table and you look at who is speaking and who is there, there are very few governments. There is uh, almost uh, 
In no case you have really people from the global south, or very few of them, and when it comes to speaking, they don't speak. There are uh, some exceptions, but those are individuals who, who by some uh, constellation have that possibility. So I think we really have to address this, uh, not hide from it, because it's important to, to go really into uh, the direction of meaningful participation and uh, the open working group uh, model of doing policy is a problem. So we really have to tackle that and uh, make sure that uh, there are additional layers of participation which are not only shambles, which are not only for the show, but which are really uh, there to make inputs happen. And uh, this goes beyond also ICANN. The, uh, I had a discussion with uh, another policy network a couple of days ago, and we have the same problems there because we are trying to uh, develop some multi-stakeholder policy in that forum. But in the end, you end up with many Western, uh, very well-educated colleagues, mostly men, uh, although the gender gap is diminishing, but uh, you miss all the people from the global south because this model of having thousands of emails and teleconferences where you take decisions with discussions in English is not inclusive. It, it doesn't work. It is uh, possibly a precondition, it's one element, but we have to build on that, but really uh, addressing uh, the, the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge. I have the gentleman here, and then Lucebis and Martin, okay. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Paul Rowney. I'm from the Global South. <laughs> um, my, my, my comments on this is, and I'm, I'm on the MAG with the IGF, so I'm with a different multi-stakeholder group. And, you know, the, the, these issues flow through most of these, these sort of groups. Inclusion is an issue. Multi-stakeholder is an issue. It's, it's complex to get that balance. Uh, we do need to avoid token participation to achieve uh, inclusion. We need to ensure that the environment is conducive to encourage equitable participation. And we, we need environments that understand and respect diverse cultures because we, we engage differently. People from the global north, you know, can be quite more aggressive in the way that they engage to the global south. Uh, we, we also have issues in, in the big organizations where the so-called experts, you know, the ones that have benefited by being there from time, they've learnt, they entrench themselves in these organizations. And for newcomers, they can be quite intimidating. And they, they tend to build networks that can exclude people internally, which doesn't help when you've got new entrants that are not so confident. You know, we need to build the confidence and that knowledge. And I'm happy to see our colleague here, you know, started as a fellow and has moved up. And, and we need to encourage a lot more of that from the global south. Uh, we should not force inclusion. Uh, we, need to, we do need to understand its root cause and we need to fix those root cause because inclusion should be natural. It shouldn't be forced. It shouldn't be artificial. So if it's not natural, you know, why, why is it not natural? You know, what are the causes? What is preventing people coming in? And my colleague here, you know, making the comment that people from the Global South, they're often present but don't voice themselves. And that, that's because it is intimidating <laughs> to come in a room and often that room is either gender unbalanced or it's, it's uh, ethnically unbalanced. And then you've got this group of claimed experts and you need to talk. <laughs> it's not easy for everybody to, to, to have that confidence. Uh, within within ICANN, I, I think ICANN needs to understand what full inclusivity will mean for it. Uh, I would see it affecting change within the organization and I would hope to see a positive change in its culture and a change and an effective change in its interventions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I have uh, Lucevis and then Martin. Lucevis, please. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Luzwies van der Laan. Um, a former ICANN board member and, like Erica, former MEP, so I'm uh, very interested in how we can make policy decisions, especially that affect something of interest to citizens around the world, and how to do that in an inclusive and legitimate way. So I think this is a very good session, very timely session, and uh, I really want to compliment Jan and Hortense on the work they're doing, and I think it's a really important step in trying to figure out not only what legitimacy means that I can, but whether it can be a model for others. Because I think at the end of the day, we also need to compare this system and the IGF system with normal systems of making uh, uh, decisions at global level. If I look at decision making in the United Nations, which is exclusively the reserve of governments, and a lot of these governments don't have inclusive um, uh, uh, systems inside their own country. They don't have serious parliaments. They don't have uh, free media holding them to account. And I'm like, well, okay, maybe ICANN and IGF are not great, but uh, the alternatives can uh, actually be worse. So I think uh, that's not an excuse to, to not make sure we're very, very good. But I'd like to turn it around and say, let's see if we can make this work even better and then uh, be a serious competition for the intergovernmental uh, system of, of doing business. Um, then I, I remember, Jan, uh, I think it was in Panama on a roof somewhere that we were talking about where legitimacy comes from. And, uh, uh, and you said there's different ways of going about it. Namely, some people say that if the process was open and inclusive, then that grants legitimacy. And others say, but no, if the outcome uh, is uh, works like the internet works, so therefore, by definition, the system that runs it is. So I, I was wondering if, if at some point you're going to come back to that uh, in this study, uh, and whether because I don't remember the questions exactly, uh, where how that could be reflected because I think that's an interesting one, and, and that makes me wonder because you raised the issue uh, of dot dot org. Um, whether if you would have the question now, <laughs> whether there would be other, you know, whether this would be a point of concern that would come out. Um, I, I, I very much want to echo what Jorge said about some things being necessary but not sufficient conditions. I came to Aachen from the outside, but I had the privilege of immediately joining the board, so you get this incredible uh, support system around you, which is different, I think, than if you come from the outside and you have to really work your way, uh, way in. I don't think it's impossible for outsiders to, um, uh, to become part of, um, uh, of the whole system, but the biggest constraint that I see is simply time. Because if you're not being paid, or if your organization doesn't want you to be here, then uh, who has the time, and if you're not being funded, uh, and thus the money, so the resource constraint, to actually do all of this? I mean, one of the great pleasures of not being on the ICANN board anymore is not being drowning in this email uh, waterfall every single day. And, uh, and I think the, that, that is something that needs to be looked at, whether uh, it can't be done. Also, with all due respect, I think emails are very 1998. So I'm wondering if there's not a better way to, to do this that, that is going to be more efficient and, and more inclusive. Um, and then uh, I have one more question for Jan and Hortense, which is that I, I saw on one of the bar thingies uh, that, that sometimes the perception were different depending on which group what, which was asked. And I'd be interested to know whether the board on a regular basis saw things differently than the community. Because I think the, the board has, I saw that in one or two of the, of, the, of the charts, because it would be interesting to see if the board sees less problems than the community does, because that could also indicate uh, a, a level of disconnect between, in the perception between what the board sees and, uh, and what the community sees. So that was my question. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Lusavis, for the remarks, but also the question. I, I think we'll, we'll be hearing a response later. So I, I have Martin. I, I'll then get back to the speakers, and then we'll have another OK. I have two more interventions, then the speakers, and then back to the floor again. So Martin, please. Thank you, Manal. And uh, I'm sorry, there's a sheer dominance of uh, former and current board members uh, sp taking the microphone. I'm a current one. Um, a focus is uh, for me on, on uh, so how do we get this multi-stakeholder system to work in a, in a way that we recognize as legitimate, but also effective. Um, I think that uh, there have been some examples of where things are not working as good as they should or, or, or whatever. 
I think over the years what we've seen is that uh, there's been a lot of search for how do we improve this and a lot of effort in making it better. And uh, coming from a tradition where you need me to face to face to get things done, that's also a tradition that we need to leave behind at some moment, I guess, uh, because we cannot uh, fly everybody who may want to say anything into every place in the world to have every, uh, participate to every conversation. That would kill the world because CO2 would go through the roof uh, and it would be unaffordable. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to enable participation and uh, in different multi-stakeholder networks we do it in different ways. Uh, in ICANN we try to actively uh, stimulate new people. We are having workshops around the world. Um, um, and for these workshops, uh, uh, these conferences, uh, we put a lot of emphasis on also creating a safe, supporting, welcoming environment so people that do come uh, can count on uh, it being a, an environment where they feel safe to express, to ask questions, uh, where they can even be informed if you, as a newcomer, how do I participate to this specific multi-stakeholder network. Um, and more and more I see, not only in ICOM, but also in other multi-stakeholder networks, the importance and the growth of online uh, meetings as, uh, as an addition to uh, the way to uh, participate. Uh, I think one of the best things I saw is with IGF, basically, where uh, the regional events have become as important or even more important than the global annual event itself. And uh, maybe that distributed way of talking where things are discussed in regions where people are and brought back to central uh, is, is one of the ways forward. Uh, inclusive processes are a good start. Um, uh, as uh, Jorge said, we have a lot of good procedure, processes, etc. But in the end, it's all about what people do with it. And I think that's something that will change over time. Learning, seeking, actively being committed to finding better ways and to people being uh, open to other ways of participating. So uh, suggestions for improvement are so welcome and they are triggered by uh, this study as well. So I uh, want to thank Jan for that as well. Thank you, Martin, and we'll be discussing suggestions for improvement, but after the last intervention, so please go ahead. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Susan Payne. I participate in, in ICAM within the GNSO. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the, the perceptions on gender, and I'm, I'm not trying to discount them in any way, but, but you know, within a number of, of groups within ICANN, there are um, women in, in very senior positions, so we have you know, the chair of the IPC is a woman, the chair of the BC is a woman, the chair of the NCSG is a woman, the chair of the GAC is a woman. We don't have parity on the board, but we have a number of strong female voices on the board. Um, uh, the chair of the registry stakeholder group is a woman. Um, and, and as I say, I'm not discounting the perception, but I think it would be really interesting to drill down further on why that perception exists. Um, you know, is it that people are perceiving those particular roles as being merely tokenism? Um, I don't think that's the case. I know most of those people quite well, and I don't believe that's the case. I think they're, you know, they're very strong and, and they hold those posts in their own right. So, so what is it that's driving that perception that, that, that there is gender inequality? I think it would be interesting to also drill down in, into whether it's within specific groups that you're getting a much stronger feeling of that. So, you know, if it's within a group where where there are, you know, most of the participants are men, um, you know, is that what, you know, is there a stronger perception that women are excluded? Um, I, I, as I say, I'm not, I'm not discounting it. I, I totally agree that the perception exists. It's just, it would be interesting to try and understand why, when there are so many strong female role models, people are still perceiving that. Um, and perhaps then we could help try, you know, work out a, a better way to address it. But I have a, my own view, which is, perhaps that, that, that many people answering that survey have the encounter that, that all women have in all walks of life, not just in ICANN, which is that, that female voices are quite often drowned out in a group um, and that when, you know, when women become impassioned about something, it, it's viewed as emotional and, and you know, we, we are frequently discounted, but that's not an ICANN thing. Thank you very much, Susan. 
So, um, we have two concrete questions regarding the survey came from the floor. So, Susan is asking about the basis for this perception of uh, gender inequality and, and Lucebis was asking whether um, findings from the board survey turned to be um, same views shared by everyone or uh, if there are discrepancy. Um, uh, Jan, would you like to comment on this now, or shall we go to the speakers and, and start our second round first? Maybe I could give brief responses to several specific questions and then some of the general things save, uh, to save to the end. But uh, uh, the perceptions of the board, Lucevis, that you, you mentioned, that was well spotted, indeed, on the, on the graphs. Uh, the perceptions of the board of the problematic nature of the different inequalities, inequalities is significantly lower on four of the five dimensions. So there's a, the board is on par with other constituencies when it comes to gender inequalities, but it's significant, perceiving significantly lower problem, problems in relation to age, language, uh, race and uh, region. So that might be something for the board to reflect upon. Um, the gender inequality, why it's perceived, of course this is probably beyond my pay grade, uh, but, the, but this, uh, but I think you're right to say, and it touches on what Lucevis also asked about, what drives these perceptions? We've presented you with descriptive statistical patterns. We haven't explained them. So the explanations of people's perceptions may lie in institutional procedures and institutional outcomes. But as you yourself also mentioned, people bring in all kinds of baggage from their wider societal experiences, and then that influences what they see in the institutional setting. And at that point, it can be the wider societal experience rather than the institutional setting per se. We would have to look at that in more detail. I'm not saying that it is the reason, but it's a, it's a possibility for sure. Uh, I think that's the two main points that came up. Yeah, I now. think, yeah, that's it. So, uh, back to our speakers and if there are any um, specific proposals you see to advance uh, the issue of um, inclusiveness. Um, so, shall we start by you again? Okay. And Dini, please, go ahead. I think that uh, after hearing the conversations in the floor and the remarks on multi-stakeholderism and multi-stakeholder governance model in general, I would like to call attention to the fact that though we may be discussing ICANN broadly in the study and the issues of uh, technical and operational matters of the internet, internet governance today has expanded to much more issues as the internet becomes increasingly socialized and there are more and more public policy matters that are implicated in this. And as was shared by someone from the floor, and as has also been pointed out by the UN High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation, there's also a need to think about what we can do to make the Internet Governance Forum like better or more effective, right? And because there is a lot of frustration among many people and for understanding reasons that there is a danger that the IGF gets reduced to a talk shop which does not lead to any binding outcomes and where do we go from here? So I just want to put on the table the fact that we can never like completely solve this question or address it in any meaningful way if we are not willing to revisit the whole idea of enhanced cooperation in the Tunis agenda and look at the fact that states at their respective have respective roles and responsibilities to play in terms of internet related public policy matters and there may be areas where the technical and operational matters intersect with these public policy matters for example the whole de debate on jurisdiction of uh, I can. So we need to think about that. And uh, my last point is this that though, you know, uh, there's the, like this whole fear of having a multilateral process around internet governance, in parallel we are seeing that certain portions of this agenda, like cross-border data flows governance, for example, are getting pushed through various trade agreements. OECD has a committee on digital economy policy. Now, when you see that happening, then why is it that we have this fear that is only like around the multilateral process around internet governance? So shouldn't we be reflecting on that? 
Thank you very much, Nandini. Um, Erika, any uh, thoughts about how we can enhance inclusiveness? Yeah, I don't think so. It's actually very complicated. Um, I mean, we will have to accept to some de degree some limitations. So we can't ignore the market players because, uh, but we have, to, so we have to accept limitations and we have to f accept facts and reality and the mission of ICANN. And we have to focus on the mission. <coughs> we can't get ourselves confused with everything what is happening in the internet ecosystem. I think it's extremely important to understand this. The second, but I believe uh, what we can do, we can introduce more facts. And, and I believe facts typically do help in shaping whatever one wants to do. Give me, give you one example. Um, if you, uh, if you, for example, let's take an example, the new round, if you want to do a new round. So we then will look at the advantages and disadvantages of the past uh, round. We will understand what worked globally, so where are market players which are well situated. We will understand uh, where are the disadvantages of the various TL, uh, TDL, uh, TLD models. And then we, we compare this to the new round. So what we then can do, we can say, okay, it's clear and there was no take up on, on uh, GTLD in, uh, in Africa. There was none in, in particular other regions in uh, maybe India. There's nothing in Pakistan or very few. There's a lot on China. So, and then we can do, try to understand why is this the case. And then we can see, is there a possibility and is it reasonable to do so to create markets in these particular regions. Maybe we come to the conclusion once this analysis is done, maybe it's not helpful, it, you know, it depends. But we don't have facts about this. We talk about it, about inclusiveness in, in you know, with regard to certain regions which are disadvantages. But what are we doing and what do we want to do actually? Um, you know, is it helpful to balance it? Is it helpful to artificially create a market? Or maybe it isn't, but we have to talk about it. And the same is true for gender. Once we have facts with regard to maybe a particular stakeholder group, where we see there's a clear, um, there's no, you know, no kind of fair balance or regional fair balance, then we have to talk about it. Do we want to change the situation? Can we change the situation? Because if they're not sufficient players from these regions, we can't even change this. Um, the same is true for language. Can we change it? Probably not. So we have to be fair to each other too, to un actually understand what we can really change and what we can't. A lot we can do through translation, but of course not in, in working group, much harder. Um, thank you very much, Erika. So, um, Leon, any thoughts on how to enhance inclusiveness? I mean, whether at ICANN or elsewhere, I'm, the discussion is open. Thank you very much, Manal. So, as I said, I think that this is a, a, an educational effort that we all must uh, undertake, right? Uh, one of the strategic objectives of uh, the uh, strategic plan for uh, ICANN that was adopted by the, by the board and the community is exactly to improve the effectiveness of ICANN's multi-stakeholder model of governance. Uh, one, of way, uh, one of the ways that we see this can be achieved is by increasing uh, needs of inclusivity, accountability and transparency, et cetera, et cetera. So we are working on this and we know that uh, we are far from having the perfect system, but we do actually we, we actually do great efforts to do that. I mean, Lucifer was saying that she was uh, uh, someone that came from the outside and that she came right into the board, et cetera, et cetera. I can tell you the same story. I, I, I came in as an outsider, but the difference is that I didn't came to the board. I came through the fellowship program. So I started at the very bottom of the pyramid uh, within the ICANN structure. And now I'm proud to say that I'm a board member and I'm the vice chair of the board. So. The system works, yeah. right? But you have to work as well. It's not going to work for you, right? So you you need to 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 pay attention, to make the effort, to uh, you know join 2 a.m. calls, 3 a.m. calls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and if you do it, 
you will actually achieve this meaningful and inclusive participation that you are looking for. So the tools are there. You need to take advantage of those tools. There are also some situations that fall outside ICANN's uh, uh, ability to level the ground for everyone. We are also aware of that. And, and yes, there are other fora that can uh, actually try to solve those problems. But the people coming to the different foras tend to be the same, right? We see each other at different fora and we, uh, we, we discuss the same issues on different perspectives, et cetera, et cetera. And that is, that is good because there is continuity to, to trying to solve the problems. But that is what I mean when I say that we also need to do outreach within our communities to pull in new people, to try to level the ground for those who are also interested in joining the different efforts that are carried out in different fora to join us and to say, okay, let's sit at the table, let's look at common uh, solutions and let's see how we can better implement those solutions so that, so that the multi-stakeholder model is actually enhanced, it is improved and it, is, it, it continues to evolve in a way that actually serves the purpose for which it was thought of uh, to begin with. So, Thank you, Manal. Thank you very much, Leon. Um, so, again, back to our audience, and if there are any reactions to reflections made by uh, the panel, or if you have your own suggestions as well, again, whether for ICANN or uh, elsewhere. So, Michaeli, please. Uh, thanks, Manal. Um, Michaeli from Black Knight, long time um, ICANN addict. I think I need a new hobby. Um, I, think, I think this discussion is very interesting and important, but I think also people need to have a little bit of a reality check. I mean, ICANN's mission is quite narrow in scope. So that means that by, by the very nature of the scope of ICANN, not every single human being on the planet needs to turn up. Now, that doesn't mean that, they, that, their, that their views their perspective cannot be brought to the table, and that's why you have the various stakeholder groups, constituencies, trade associations, and others who do turn up. But I think we have to be careful about how we frame this inclusion, because if you have, I mean, we have expressions in English like, you know, many, many cooks spoil the broth. I mean, if you have 500 people in a working group, you're never, ever going to get anything done and you'll still be, you'll be circling the drain on the same topic forever. It'll just drive you crazy. And one of the criticisms of how ICANN works at times is how slow decision-making processes can be. That in many times, I mean, I ICANN is not an agile organization. I mean, if you're coming at things from a, from a business perspective, engaging within an ICANN process is a surefire way of Running, running your budget up to, the, up to the limit and never actually getting that product out the door. So I think you have to be careful there. So we, one of the things I think somebody touched on, I think it might have been Jorge, was the PDP 3.0 uh, thing that's going on within the GNSO. So it's a GNSO council-driven um, project. I sit on the GNSO council at the moment where I represent uh, the registrars. And the idea behind that is to rejig how the working groups are, function, how they're made up, so they could be more effective. If that does not mean that we are excluding, it just means that we're trying to make them that little bit more functional, agile, and actually get to a result. Because I think if we fail to do that, it doesn't matter how inclusive you are, if you're, because we're actually failing everybody. Um, and I think Martin was also touched on something which I think is very important, which is around how that participation can work. I mean, if you look at IETF, you look at RIPE, you look at other areas where there are discussions and there are policy development processes, most of it's done electronically. It's done via email. Uh, some, some organizations are using other technologies that might make Lucifees happier, such as um, Slack or a variety of other technologies. And that works really, really well. Whereas within the ICANN space, a lot of the time, people feel that they have to turn up physically at meetings and sit across tables and yell at each other, which I don't think is particularly helpful. I think there needs to be a better kind of way of doing a lot of that because 
it doesn't make any sense. I mean, whether it's the carbon footprint or just the logistical issues that you're facing. I mean, you look at the ICANN budget, what is money being spent on? Organizing meetings. I mean, I, it's not actually product or improving anything for anybody. It's just organizing meetings in different parts of the world, which probably isn't a particularly good use of money. There's probably better things that could be, that, that could be spent on. I mean, you could look at, you know, improving capacity of the root server network in certain parts of the world. That will cost money, but no, the money has to go to having these bloody meetings. So I think this, I think this is a worthwhile um, conversation. I think some, there's some very good points and that study is very helpful. Uh, the issues around language, it's not just a global south versus global north. Uh, within Europe, I see it with um, the non-English speakers. They are not comfortable a lot of the time speaking. I mean, if you come into ICANN, you're dealing with a lot of well-educated, very articulate, and qu quite often aggressive lawyers and others. So coming into that, if, you, if English is not your first language, can be quite intimidating. Um, and thank you. Thank you very much, Michaeli, and very good points. Um, any other comments or remarks? Yes, Jorge, please, I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you, Mana. So if nobody else takes the floor, I'll take it a, a second time. Um, I think this is an ongoing uh, discussion. Um, I think that there are many things that are being done. Uh, I'm the, the last one to, to deny that. But uh, my point is we have to do more. And uh, I think one precondition to participate in discussions is, for instance, to have accessible, neutral, objective information of what is going on. And uh, sometimes it's so difficult, not that uh, anybody is biasing the information, but the information, the, the quality is not enough, it's not understandable, it's not user-friendly. And uh, for instance, in my country, in Switzerland, we have every, every three months, we have referenda, at the local, at the regional, and at the federal level on issues which are much more important and much more complicated than ICANN discussions. And they manage the people who prep, uh, prepare the booklets of information for those uh, referenda, which is uh, one of the cornerstones of the direct de uh, democracy in Switzerland. They manage to prepare those objective, neutral, informative uh, pieces of, uh, of information on what is the issue, what are the positions, what are the drawbacks, and so on and so forth. Why cannot we do that at the same level in, in ICANN? Then, uh, as Michele said, uh, we have to find the way of, uh, sorry, of combining the openness of uh, working groups, which is uh, good in itself because it uh, strengthens uh, transparency and it avoids monopolization by the few, uh, with uh, a balanced composition of those working groups. And we can have different layers of participants, members of working groups and participants, as we had in some experiences, and that would also allow us to to have a balanced participation between the different stakeholder groups. And when we go to decision making, it would allow us to, to look, okay, what are the members saying from the different uh, stakeholder groups? What is the level of consensus? Because otherwise, in an open group with uh, 200 people, and that happens, maybe 180 agree with a certain position, but they all come from a certain region, a certain stakeholder group, a certain background. And that's not uh, what we should going for. Uh, also, uh, this comes from my discussion on this other policy network. Uh, let's try to be creative and create ex additional layers of uh, interactive and accessible participation, perhaps with translation or with uh, better information 
so that people are really able to have a say, have a fair say before decisions are taken. Because uh, now, uh, normally, this information, you get it when it's too late, when uh, decisions were already taken, or at the beginning, not at the right moment of time. And I, I think we, we can be creative on that. And of course, we have to self-organize. I think uh, Leon is right. Uh, you as a person can do, and you can try, and you can succeed. It depends on many things. But uh, also those who represent, and I include myself, diffuse interests, general interests. And uh, for those who know Mankur Olson, this should ring, uh, ring a bell. It's much more difficult to organize diffuse and general interests than direct interests. For those who represent such general interests, we have to self-organize. And uh, this is an ongoing discussion within the GAC. We are trying to break our heads and uh, uh, get uh, something out of our brains to, to see how we can make the GAC more efficient in being able in participating in these uh, policy development processes. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Jorge. Paul, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Just very quickly, uh, I, I, I like the conversation. And I, I think everyone agrees that inclusion and multi-stakeholders is important. And I think we understand it's not easy. And I think ICANN does need to identify what form of multi-stakeholderism or inclusion works for it because there's not a one fit all. And, you know, I'm, I'm genuinely, I'm just encouraged that this conversation is actually happening. And I believe multi stakeholderism is good. But I think ICANN just has to identify what will work for it to, to help it achieve its mission, basically. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. So, last call for comments or remarks. Yes, Susan, please go ahead. Susan Anthony, uh, very active participant both within ICANN and IGF. But I want to go back to something McKaylee had said moments ago uh, about uh, should we have all these meetings uh, and is there a better form? So my question is one for certainly another day. Um, over the years, I've, I've suffered the, the uh, overload of emails and uh, I also appreciate that coming to meetings is a luxury for many, many people in the world. Um, so I'm wondering if there are some other modalities that should be used in addition to or instead of face-to-face -face meetings that can also meet all of these goals that we've talked about over the past couple of hours. Um, I happen to like the face-to-face. -face. Um, I work with um, people who feel that face-to-face -face is essential, uh, certain cultures in, in my country, the United States, that face-to-face -face is essential. Uh, you must see the person, you must see them in the eye. I don't know whether um, uh, webcams, et cetera, are good substitutes. I tend to think not, but this is an issue that I hope we will look at going forward. Thank you very much, Susan. And yeah, emails seem to be <laughs> haunting everyone. I was just saying that I started to appreciate spam <laughs> because <laughs> I just get to delete those without even worrying. But <laughs> jokes aside, uh, Jan, you want to say anything before we wrap up? Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Well, first of all, to say thank you, everyone panel participants, everyone for the, for, the, for the comments. I'm really glad to see a discussion going that can keep going from here. Um, selfishly, I'm very grateful for the feedback because you've put it on, you've probably seen me scribbling along and uh, taking down many notes that uh, we can take in on our analysis further. Just underline again, we looked at ICANN as a case study, uh, not because ICANN was seen as particularly problematic, but because it's a very open and receptive uh, uh, arena where people are very concerned about a number of issues and very ready and willing to share their views. So we've been able to get some remarkable data, I think, as you've, as you've seen in terms of people's perceptions of the situation. And that's really uh, helpful. One thing that we played around with, Hortense and I, just to underline some of these issues, we looked through the 467 people who responded to the, to the, to the questionnaire. And as I said before, they are a representative sample. We're statistically quite, quite 
almost 100% convinced of that. And we, we put into the, uh, into the formula, we said, okay, pick us out all of the older male white English North people. And in the sample of 467, 120 fit that matrix. And then we asked, tell us how many younger female, less English fluent South of color, and it yielded four. Anyway, so that's just, that's, a, that's an interesting, we've mainly been talking about perceptions, but this, was, this is an objective indicator, if you like. So that, that's something to think about. Um, that said, inclusivity is not the only principle for judging, as I think Michael pointed out. And we asked people about a number of other issues and said, what are, what are your important principles for judging how your, your confidence in ICANN? And uh, inclusivity was one of the 12 that we looked at, and it tended to be towards the, the upper end, but things like rep, you know, efficient decision making and transparency and so on were also regarded as very important. So you have to trade these things off uh, with, with one another. Um, Manal, I really liked your opening remark that said about different perceptions can make resolutions of a problem more difficult. Um, I hope that with this data, we've shown you that there are some different perceptions around. Um, and if that helps to make people more aware of how they're seeing the, the problem more differently, maybe that can help in a small way to get more mutual understanding. So if we get that from this, uh, this, uh, this study and work, then I'll be very, very happy. Um, if you want to have a, a copy of the study, send it to me. If you drop me one of your cards on the way out, then I'll make sure that you get the hard copy of, or the, the actual full text. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, any final remarks from our panelists? You're no. good. Yep. Okay, then um, it's, yeah, this is definitely the start of the discussion and uh, it's again an open question, how inclusive can we be or when exactly do we say now we are inclusive? I mean, this is an open question. So with this, I would like to thank our uh, panelists here, Nandini, uh, Erika, and, and Leon. Thank you very much, Jan, as well, and Hortness, for uh, this excellent uh, and thorough report and interesting findings. And thanks each and every one of you for the interactive discussion. Thank you. Thank you, too.
Good morning, everybody. This is our session, uh, workshop number 401 on uh, inclusion online, diverse knowledge, new rules. Thanks for joining us. Um, we've had many registrations. I'm glad some of you also showed up. Thanks for, for being here, for taking the time. Um, my name is Jan Gerlach. I'm a senior public policy manager at the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the nonprofit that hosts and supports Wikipedia and uh, several other projects of free knowledge uh, that people around the world can uh, freely participate in and share. Um, I am very happy today to be uh, joined uh, by wonderful colleagues over here, um, which I will um, introduce in a minute. Um, maybe for a brief um, agenda of today, um, we will then have a uh, discussion of roughly 50 minutes, followed by a open Q&A, for which we will take um, questions from, from the room, but also um, from remote participants, hopefully. If you are participating remotely, please feel free to type in your questions um, into the um, Zoom app. Um, we will park them for later uh, for the, for the Q&A, but um, you can go ahead and, and type in your questions that you have for the speakers. Um, and finally, we will um, find some conclusions and wrap up the session um, shortly before 1 p.m. So we have roughly um, 90 minutes actually for this session, which is great um, and should allow us for some in-depth conversation here. Um, to, to briefly um, frame w what we were envisioning um, is the concept or, or a proposal for this session is to really explore uh, potential governance responses to the diverse interests of new groups um, and new roles and responsibilities of different sectors for the people who are coming online. Uh, we can call them newcomers, we can call them people who um, are the, the, the real digital natives. Um, it's a, this is about basically finding um, ways to allow people to meaningfully participate even if they're, they haven't been part of um, rulemaking and policy making until now. So um, topics that we can explore here are maybe a need for flexibility of such norms so newcomers can contribute and shape them also in ways that are accommodating of their diverse needs. Um, a, ten a possible topic is also the tension between freedom of expression and inclusion, if there is something like that. Self-governance, citizenship and participation. I'd like to touch upon diversity and youth as a special topic, gender as well. And possibly, if we find the time, the role of languages and also scripts um, and how those influence governance and policy making for people around the world that may come from different backgrounds. Um, from a Wikimedia perspective, and allow me as a moderator to briefly speak on this, um, unfortunately one of our panelists um, from Wikimedia um, can't be here, so I, I will briefly share our perspective, even though I don't really like to do that as a moderator, to intervene too much. Um, so bear with me. Um, from, from a Wikimedia perspective, we believe that everybody around the world should be able to uh, freely participate in, in knowledge and um, be able to contribute not only knowledge but also to the rules that govern knowledge and how it can be shared and read and um, expressed online. So we believe that just connecting the unconnected, um, as we hear very often at conferences like the IGF, isn't enough. Um, our goal is really to make sure that people have meaningful access, can meaningfully participate in democratic, distributed ways that they can feel safe um, and share their knowledge because we benefit from them, all of us do. So I'm really happy that um, with, the, with this background, um, I'm really happy that um, the following four speakers that, you, uh, that are sitting to my left here um, are joining us today. On I'll just go um, through my, I think, um, actually alphabetic list here. <laughs> um, on one hand, I have um, Deborah Albu from ITS Rio in Brazil. Um, she's a program coordinator um, for democracy and technology um, at the Institute for Technology and Society in Brazil. She holds a, a Master in Science in Gender and Development. 
Next is Santiago Amador, who is um, an innovation advisor to the mayor of Bogota. He holds a master's degree in public administration from Harvard and a master's degree in social science um, of the internet from the University of Oxford. He was the national director of internet policy at the Ministry of ICT of Colombia and currently is coordinator of the innovation lab for public services at the Bogota's mayor, mayor's office and professor of public innovation in the National School for Public Servants. Um, Joining also is Chennai Chair, um, who is a research manager focused on gender and digital rights at the Web Foundation. Chennai has extens extensively focused on understanding demand side issues with regards to the digital policy from a gender and youth perspective. She's currently also a member of the IGF MAG in her second term. Finally, we have Amos Toh, who is um, the senior researcher on AI and human rights at Human Rights Watch. He was previously legal advisor to the UN Special Rapporteur of Freedom of Expression, David Kay. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, um, for this conversation, I um, hope to take a relatively light approach to moderation, and um, Amos, I think, called it an anarchic um, approach, but um, I, I just hope for a lively conversation. Please feel free to also ask each other questions here. Um, and if you in the room have questions, please um, make a mental note and ask uh, during the Q&A, unless it's super pressing. <laughs> um, so I'm interested um, in, in exploring the questions that um, I outlined earlier. And maybe we need to first take stock of, of the rules that, that really govern participation online. Um, just for 10 seconds here, we have, of course, international treaties, we have laws, we have regulations, but then we also have terms of services, uh, terms of service, terms of um, uh, use of platforms, and of, of course, also uh, internet service providers and also um, app stores. But we also have community standards within platforms, and maybe within those platforms, different fora may have their own moderation rules. So there's a whole sort of network and it gets more granular um, in, of rules and norms that govern um, how people can participate online. Um, and, and it's important to keep in mind that, that we're not just talking about laws here. Not at all, actually. Um, so my first question, maybe, maybe to you, Jenai, is um, who is actually coming online? Um, are there, what are we seeing? Who are the regions and groups that are coming online today and that are newly connected or maybe have connections but are now just finding the ways to, to be part of the online world? Um, thank you so much for starting off with me. It's always fun to set the scene for everybody else. So when you think about who's coming online, uh, the International Telecommunications U Union recently released its results to show the state of levels of access. And what you find from a European perspective, almost everyone is connected, almost everyone has some form of access to the internet, whereas least developing countries and developing countries are the ones that are still coming up when it, when it comes to levels of connection. Africa has the lowest percentage of internet users according to the ITU, standing at 28.2%, um, compared to Europe with 82.5% um, in terms of internet users. If you, but, take it down a lower level into the African countries, you actually find that South Africa is probably one of the leading countries when it comes to internet access, with almost over half the population having, making use to the internet. And then in terms of really answering your question from who's actually coming online, you would find that it's, um, to some extent, it's people with some form of access to economic income, which are probably in the range, age ranges of 17 to 35, because now they have access to work opportunities and are able to afford buying a device and are being also able to afford buying um, the necessary data to allow for you to come online. And then what we do understand and what is agreed upon is that we do have a gendered digital divide. So what we find is that there are more men coming online in comparison to women. 
And then when we do really break it down at that, because these are not homo homogeneous groups, you find is that urban men, men who are in urban spaces and uh, have access to high levels of income, are the ones that are leading the charge. And then you find, then you take it to a rural and urban, you find that it's more likely to be urban women in comparison to rural women who are actually coming in online from um, the areas that we're coming into. So then, I haven't done as much uh, age disaggregated work, but then you find that it's, it's that range that I was talking about of the 17 to um, 34, 35, that are the ones that are coming online. And then as you move up in the older range, you have fewer, fewer older people that are actually coming in online. So those are the demographics that we need to take into account. And the age thing is also really because um, least developing countries also have the youngest populations. So that is likely the context in which we're seeing that younger people are coming online, but it's more mainly men who are leading the charge. Thank you. Thanks, Chennai. Um, and maybe um, since we touched upon youth um, at the very uh, end of Chennai's um, framing here, Deborah, can you maybe talk to us a little bit about uh, what do you see in, in your research around youth coming online, um, obviously as a subset of the newcomers, um, if I may use that clumsy framing. Um, what do you see? What are their needs and, and how, um, how can they participate? Um, thank you, Ian, for the presentation. Thank you also for organizing this session. Um, just, I think it's interesting um, the way that uh, Shanai was putting it as um, she was moving along all these uh, different demographic categories. What we see is maybe uh, an important concept to, to highlight, which is the one of intersectionality here. So um, the more we have layers of oppression that might exclude and exclude and exclude these populations from coming online, we can actually understand that it is not the same thing to be a young woman in Brazil as it is to being a young woman in countries of Europe, to put it in a more general way. Um, so this is maybe a, a first idea or concept to, to take into consideration when we're, when we're talking about young people. Um, in well, uh, recent research from ITU, from uh, UNICEF, etc. Um, young people are coming online, but there are many barriers to how they are coming online. Um, maybe one of the first ones is to talk even about the possibility for them to have devices to access the internet. Um, how can young people access the internet and buy devices if they're not affordable? So affordability here might be one of these first barriers. And once even they have uh, these devices, how can then they move forward to uh, actually purchasing uh, data packages and um, accessing good internet quality? Uh, so that's maybe a second layer um, that even makes it harder for young people to access the internet. And maybe um, a third, and here just to, to put it um, a little bit as we move um, along the conversation, is the idea of parental medi mediation as well. Um, many young people don't have access to their own devices, but do use their parents' devices to access the internet. So how um, is their access to uh, internet information knowledge online mediated by their parents? Um, so I think maybe just to start, these are a few barriers that we can um, underlie um, in terms of talking about young people online, but I'm sure we'll move on and talk about other barriers as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe uh, looking at you, Santiago, um, we, we've had a conversation recently about uh, rural areas in Colombia coming on coming online and calling you, apparently. Um, um, is against the background or the, the, um, what we just heard from Chennai and also f from Deborah, um, maybe, maybe moving away from the youth chapter uh, topic just a tiny bit, um, who, are the, who are the people who are coming online in, in, in rural areas? Um, is, is there anything that we can learn from Colombia here? Yes, um, could you? 
Could you switch to the presentation, please, just for a bit? Um, I, I just want to use one slide. I think it's, it's enough. Uh, this is the typical discourse that we politicians uh, give in a rural area when, you, when we are deploying computers and internet. So we say exactly this. I was the, the director of internet policy there, and I remember to say something very similar like this. Uh, thanks to the internet, every citizen can access from any place to all the information they need, and they use it to improve their lives and participate freely in a global discussion. So this is a very like a common discourse of a politician. But if you see, I mean, in detail, not every citizen is accessing, not from any place, not to all information, uh, not necessarily they're using the, imp the information to improve their lives, uh, and they, don't, they are not participating uh, freely, and they're not, they are not part of the global discussions. So uh, I, 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 I like to do this exercise um, just to point, to point out that uh, there are a lot of barriers for rural people to access the, uh, the internet. Language is one of them. Uh, in, in, in a country uh, as Colombia, it is very difficult that people from rural areas are, uh, I mean, they, know, they don't know how to speak in English, and most of the content is produced uh, in English, for instance. Uh, connectivity there is, uh, I mean, the speed of connectivity is very low, so they cannot access to, for instance, to, to videos or to uh, higher education. Uh, it, it is very difficult for them. Um, uh, and also, uh, I mean, we are studying gaps uh, or digital divides, and there is not just one digital divide. We we found seven different digital divides, and the one is the I mean, the worst uh, of them is a gap of intention. It is very different the intention to use the internet when you are in a city and you are well educated and you are uh, maybe young. That, that they, the same intention when you are in rural areas. So basically, they don't have, sometimes they don't have the interest or the intention to use uh, the network or to, to use the internet to actually participate. Maybe because, because they are not a, a literate in some, I mean, they, they are not writing and reading properly or in the way that, that the discussions require. Um, they are not bilingual. They don't. They don't uh, have uh, access to credit cards, so they cannot pay anything in, in the internet. They cannot access to those documents that are uh, are uh, behind the paywall, for instance. Um, yeah, I mean, all of the social divides amplifies within the internet. Thank you, Santiago. I really, I really like that that notion of the intention gap. Let's maybe come to that later. I'll come back to that later. Amos, turning to you, um, I think you, you probably saw this coming. What, what are the rights of all these groups that we are talking about now? Um, what are their human rights um, to participate and how does that look before we go into um, maybe a more detailed conversation about the challenges and how we can de redesign maybe norms? So, um, so I'm going to respond to that question, but first I just want to add a bit to um, some of the really interesting discussion on barriers to access online um, in the sense that some of our research, um, particularly in, on uh, digital welfare systems, show that this, people who are experiencing barriers um, to coming online are nevertheless forced online uh, to access essential public services, and, and that's really increasingly a, a problem. We see that um, particularly in the United Kingdom, uh, where the flagship welfare program known as Universal Credit is effectively forcing some of the poorest and most vulnerable people in society to access their benefits online, even though they don't have the resources, as people have explained here, to do so, or necessarily the requisite literacy um, to, to, to kind of participate in that way online. Right, um, so so that's kind of another dimension to this debate, and and so then that brings me to your question of of the range of human rights, right? So, quite. Obviously, it, you know, I think um, a freedom of expression is affected and particularly uh, access to information. But in a component of freedom of expression that's not really talked about is freedom of opinion, right? Um, to the extent that not just the way we speak, but the way we think 
right, is affected by issues of access or being forced online um, or what we see online. Um, that's also kind of an unexplored issue. But I, I do think that there is also kind of social economic rights here that are impacted, the right to social security, but also uh, many other related rights. Thanks, Amos. Um, so we, we briefly already touched upon challenges and barriers. Um, when, we, when we look at, um, I'd say, new regions um, where, where the next billion, the unconnected currently are coming online, maybe they are already connected, but they don't really have the means to fully participate. What, what are the, the, the barriers that, that you see to, for uh, participation in discourse? So say somebody actually has a device, they have access to the device. Um, they um, may have also the economic means to spend time. Given we, assuming we have overcome all those barriers, do, do um, the, the newly connected uh, actually find a, an environment? Do the norms that we have currently on platforms, such as probably Facebook, maybe Twitter, others, um, afford them to, to meaningfully participate, Chennai? Um. Thank you so much for that question. So I have two examples which I found fascinating. The first one is, um, so uh, to quote um, Alison Gould from Research ICT Africa, she's de defined it as the digital paradox online where while we're talking about people who are coming online, there's actually a difference between those who have certain levels of um, access to education and income and how they engage online versus those who now do have the resources to engage online but lack that kind of nuance in terms of the critical thinking involved with participating online. So that's one framing to it. Um, the two examples I'm, I'm, are my favorite, which I've picked up when we were talking about women's safety online, is how from South Africa, men are trash is a very important political call to action in terms of violence against women. However, women found themselves using this term on Facebook and then being kicked off the platform or being reported for misbehavior on the platform. So already what you then find is that there are community guidelines that have been set up, but who exactly are they protecting? So in engaging with Facebook, they have pointed out that, listen, we are trying to create one of the lines against discrimination is that all genders will be respected and everyone may have access to the platform. But if it, this is my rallying call to action for something that is of context relevant, then that means that as a new person coming in online, I'm likely to find myself on Facebook jail for a very long time because my favorite call is men are trash. So then, um, so that's one example. And then I, I think in terms of setting up community guidelines and the barriers that then affect people, is what um, was rightly mentioned around the freedom of opinion. Whilst we are championing some of these rights for people to engage online, to what extent do we actually extend that freedom of opinion in these offline spaces? Because I think in an offline space, it's quite easy to walk away from a conversation, but in an online space, um, you're going to get a screenshot is going to be done, and then the point is going to constantly come back to you, especially if you're someone who occupies a position of power, or especially if generally a woman, whatever you say, someone's always going to come back to it. So I think some of the barriers are perceptions around what is um, a relevant freedom, like what is the right guideline, who does it benefit at the end of the day, and who designs that to actually say, listen, this is the community guideline that needs to be set up to protect people on these platforms, and then how is it communicated back to the citizens who actually come on these platforms? I'm not sure if Facebook has an orientation for when you've signed up for an account, this is how we expect you to behave. But most of the times, it's only when you have access to spaces like these, or if these communities actually then do have a session where we come and hear what the guidelines are, it becomes my responsibility to go back to my community to actually say, if you want to publish something on Wikipedia, this is what you need to follow. So I think those are the barriers in terms of um, skills, capacity, and engagement around what is the right um, behavior online. Thank you. So, so maybe if I understand correctly, you're, there should be almost somewhat a mentorship uh, for those people coming online. I mean, here are the rules, right? Take people by the hand. I mean, in a, in a hopefully not so paternalistic way, like this is what you're expected to do. Um, but do those rules that would be communicated right now actually help everybody around the world? And it's probably already um, 
almost blasphemic or blasphemy for this uh, conference um, that runs under the motto One World, One Net, One Vision. But I want to ask the question, do we actually really get to a place of participation for everybody with one set of rules for everybody around the world. And if I can sort of toot Wikipedia's horn here a little bit, uh, the Wikipedia language versions around the world, um, there's 300 language versions and they all have um, sort of common sets of rules, but they do differ because people um, negotiate those rules uh, for conduct and content uh, within their language communities. And um, they follow sort of a common set of principles, but they are different for different language communities. Um, is there room for that at all um, for, for, um, for other platforms? Amos, if I can ask you that. Um, so, I, I mean, I think this kind of leads into discussion about like some of the incentive structures that are um, set up by um, platforms that are you know not run by, by volunteers and, and I, I do think that um, some of the instruct incentive structures are just simply not aligned with the kind of ground up um, development of rules that you know may be. Um, may have come of like thrived in, in the Wikimedia, Wikipedia context, right? Um, so one set of rules that I think that we don't necessarily talk about enough, right, in addition to community standards and guidelines is um, advertising friendly content guidelines, which really determines what kind of content is monetized and demonetized. And if financial incentives is a huge incentive for what content is being um, uploaded and in some ways even recommended um, and prioritized on these platforms, then, you know, like I think we won't necessarily get the ground up kind of um, rules ecosystem that, you know, has thrived on Wikimedia and in fact is very much controlled by uh, advertising interests, right? And I can go a bit more into that. Um, if I, but, but let me just kind of, and I was doing some research today and I just looked at some of the rules on advertising uh, advertiser-friendly content guidelines, and you can imagine the kind of content that is prioritized, right? So on YouTube, for example, what may be um, subject to limited mon monetization or demonetization uh, are controversial issues and sensitive events such as war, death and tragedies, political conflicts, and co content that is made to appear appropriate for a general audience but contains adult themes, including sex, violence, and vulgarity. And then on Facebook, um, under a tiered monetization system, debated social issues um, are subject to limited monetization if um, they focus on a debated social issue uh, that has little on, um, that has, um, that, that, that uses language or gestures that could be considered confrontational or controversial. So, so you can imagine a kind of, incentive structures that are set up on these platforms that I don't think you would get on a volunteer-run platform like Wikipedia. I'm intrigued by this. Um, so ad rules essentially govern the spaces where our public online discourses are happening. Yes, they, I think they shape it to some extent. So I think there's the issue of whether content is left up on the platform or left down, right? And that's the community standards kind of review pipeline and you know the legal restrictions that may also apply. But I think then there's the issue of what, uh, what content is incentivized, right? And that kind of leads to kind of um, issues around monetization and demonetization. And also it's unclear how much impact um, these standards on advertising friendly, uh, advertising friendly content such as like <laughs> a lot of words for some reason. Um, that those standards, you know, it's unclear whether there's a link between those standards and a recommendation systems on these platforms that determine what content is prioritized on newsfeed, for example. Thank you, super interesting. Um, maybe coming back to you, Santiago, um, from a public sector perspective, um, the, our political discourses, our public discourse, obviously shoot, um, moves to the internet. Um, as Amos has told us, people are forced onto the internet to actually benefit from public services often, mm -hmm. um, whether they want it or not. 
how 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 does a government uh, maybe like yours uh, think of of um, these public discourses happening in a platform that may be opaque and where rules such as ad rules may actually shape the discourse is there maybe a need for for um, for for a for a different kind of platform maybe um, I'm not sure can one ask that is there does there need have to be a government platform even like what how can democratic discourse happen elsewhere um, just I, I want to say something uh, else at the beginning and it, it is that um, I think one trend is is damaging uh, participation in in the public sphere in, on the internet and is the zero rated apps I mean mainly uh, people from uh, low socioeconomic strata and rural areas are accessing the internet, but uh, they cannot afford a, f a full uh, internet plan. So they ended up, uh, uh, I mean, having uh, just WhatsApp plan, you know, or maybe just Facebook plan. So a lot of Colombians in socioeconomic strata one and two are just accessing private conversations. They, they are on internet and they answer that they, they are in, uh, using internet, on in the internet, but they, uh, they are not actually participating on, on, on conversations. Um, it used to be different uh, when net neutrality was the, the trend and the principle, but not anymore. So I, I think this is one of the things that we have to do something about it. Uh, but I don't think that a government, uh, I mean, for, for two reasons. I don't think that a, that a government can actually uh, promote uh, and compete with a private platform. I think it sounds absurd in, in, in current times. And also because people just don't want to be in the government platform. I mean, it happens a lot that, that, that uh, a public agency creates an app and nobody wants to have this app. And you, ha you have just a limited amount of, of capacity in, in your cell phone and you always prefer to, uh, to erase the, the public app and, and keep Facebook and keep Instagram or may yeah, maybe and keep, uh, of course, WhatsApp. So I think uh, there is nothing that a government could do uh, different uh, from, from being better in closing uh, social gaps. I mean, the best internet policy for me uh, at this point is to close the social gaps, the gender gaps, the income gaps, the age gaps in the using of the internet. So we are so focused uh, on regulating the internet, but I think the problem is more systemic th th than regulate the internet. Thank you, um, super interesting. Um, so maybe if the public app, a public platform isn't the solution, and I was kind of expecting that answer. Um, so how do we actually make sure that, that the people who, who should, who we want to engage in, in public discourse and democratic discourse, how do we make sure they are able to shape the rules um, under which they have to um, basically uh, live on platforms? Deborah, in your research, how can we make, maybe you have ideas for us, how can we make sure those people are heard um, in, in ways that, that enable them to, to meaningfully participate? Um, thank you. Um, maybe a good start is to say how many young people I see in this room, uh, which is great, actually, uh, and to see that these people are coming into the conversation, literally. <coughs> Uh, in maybe one of the most privileged spaces as well. Um, so I think in that sense, this could be a good way to start on how to include uh, these marginalized groups is to give them a seat at the table. Um, and maybe just to uh, touch on some points as we went uh, into the conversation. Um, zero rating is also something that is happening in Brazil. So. Um, People only have access to WhatsApp in many uh, of the cheaper uh, data packages, and this is a problem, right? Because sometimes this is the internet. This is what people know um, as the internet. And this is, first, not um, the 
should it shouldn't be the the main resource of information right uh, on whatsapp or facebook or whatever people should have access to everything that is online so um net neutrality is also an issue i just wanted to echo that um and talking specifically about our region and talking specifically about our country um and i think there is again on 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 that sense in that sense Another issue which is regarding what type of content is available online. So we already discussed language, for example. Um, but I think we haven't come at uh, disinformation and misinformation yet. And this is also an issue when we're talking about um, young people or marginalized peoples in general. Um, how are these people accessing good information, good quality information, and if they are, how can they make uh, a good use of that, a meaningful use of that? Um, so maybe um, to, to, to answer your question on how can we <coughs> guarantee that, to some extent is yes, giving these people uh, a seat at the table so that they are the ones discussing the policies, they are the ones discussing the rules. Um, and yeah, um, I'll again uh, stop here and then we continue. So regarding language and, and community standards, but also maybe intentions, um, Jenai has brought up that um, example of, of women posting men are trash on, on Facebook. At scale, I think we all agree that these community standards that may or may not prevent um, that kind of language or content can only be policed through automated means. Um, and I know you, Amos, have done quite some research around that automation of processes on, on platforms. Does that even work for, for the problem that we are actually trying to, to explore today? Can automatic means um, or automatic um, content detection systems judge context? Can they uh, make sure that people can find the content, the legal content that they want to see online and, and that they are able to, to participate, not just find, but also share, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are several kinds of automated systems, um, as far as we know, that are operating on the big kind of commercial social media platforms. Um, I, I think obviously we see um, automated flagging systems, right, that flag either content that's legally restricted or that may um, lead to violations of community standards. And to the com to companies' credit, they have like really emphasized that you know they use it as flagging um, rather than uh, automatic takedown mechanisms. Um, and then you know there is aut the automation where I think there might be. Um, some level of automated takedowns happening is in um, the automation of um, enforcement of advertising friendly content guidelines. Um, and this is where we see um, some issues about some of these criteria, such as criteria for sexually explicit content potentially becoming a proxy uh, for disproportionate demonetization of LGBT uh, content, for example. And that actually kind of has culminated in a lawsuit against YouTube in the United States by LGBTQ uh, content creators, right? And then the third area of automation that we see that is potentially also problematic from a human rights perspective is in um, recommendation algorithms, right? Recommendation systems um, that automate um, what the prioritization of particular kinds of content over others. I want to say that, you know, sometimes we think about automated systems as kind of standalone systems, but the ways in which these are deployed and the purposes for which these are deployed are dictated by these companies, right? And actually, I'd be curious to hear if I can turn the question back over to you because I've heard this before about how Wikimedia uses automated systems and it's a very, very different use from commercial platforms, right, as I understand. Thanks, always happy to speak about that, of course. Um, so just quickly, yeah, we, at Wikipedia, um, there are no ads, so there are also um, no rules that would govern monetization or demonetization of, of content around ads or recommendations like that. Um, there are um, There is one system that is currently being developed and also already deployed for some areas of Wikipedia 
um, that is called the Objective uh, Revision Evaluation System, uh, which is a system, ORIS, short, um, that basically um, evaluates edits, um, new changes to Wikipedia articles and whole articles, um, and basically um, sort of helps editors judge whether um, an edit is bad, is vandalism, is disruptive to the encyclopedia or not. Um, however, it does not make automatic um, decisions about removal. It basically flags editors. We call that sort of a system of AI plus human review. AI just being sort of the umbrella term here, of course, um, for machine learning systems. Um, and we believe that essentially it should be editors, so humans making the call whether um, this is context dependent, good, and a, a good edit or a bad edit. Um, and that is, um, that really helps editors to basically evaluate uh, things more quickly because there are people, pat so-called patrollers, who just look at all the new edits coming in um, and they save a lot of time if they're just flagged for bad edits rather than going through every edit by themselves, right? So they just look at the possibly bad edits. And so that's sort of, uh, like the first example that we have are working on, um, the first such system, and that really also, I would say, exemplifies how we think about um, AI, that it should really aid people to improve discourse rather than shape discourse. Yeah, and just so to follow up on that, I think that's a really um, good contrast for illustrating that it's not necessarily automation per se that's the issue, but the social... Uh, at technical structures in which it's embedded, right? So, in the you know in the context of community standards review, right, what automated detection systems are being used on the big commercial platforms is really to enable, um, you know, um, em employees or independent contractors contracted but working for the company to enforce top-down community standards, right? But then you know a similar kind of automated detection system. Um, may be used in the Wikimedia context quite differently to help kind of community appointed editors kind of evaluate um, edits, right? And so it's a more kind of democratic structure in which automation is serving. Thanks, Amos. Um, always good to, to hear that, that perspective on the work that we do. Um, Chennai, going, going back to this um, example that you that you noted about um, the women posting men are trash um, how how can you push back as, as a group that is possibly pushing certain boundaries certainly pushing community standards as they exist now what are what can people do to actually to actually make sure they are heard if, if um, it doesn't have to be that example. Youth are often pushing boundaries. Arts is, right? So if you are basically removed, if your content is current, constantly removed from a platform and apparently the norms need to somehow change, how can you engage with a platform to, to get that done? How do you do this? Or how does, is this currently being done? Um, thank you so much. So, um, I mean, I think one of the big strategies has been people voting with their feet, literally leaving the platform and going elsewhere. But I mean, with Facebook, you think you've left the platform, but you know, you're still somewhere, still tied to it. So you find that, um, for, I know for a lot of young people, they're actually, well not for a lot, for those young people with access to the internet and good phones, they're moving away from Facebook and going to platforms like TikTok. But now there's a whole um, issue going around with TikTok and online bullying and what it means and like racial content. So, I'm not gonna to touch on TikTok for now. But coming from um, like feminist communities and trying to understand women's participation online and um, that gender diverse approach to it is that we've then gone on to create strategies where the engagement is that if this platform does not allow for us to have this particular conversation and if it results in some of our community members being cut off from the platform, then the question is then you create alternative platforms. And you find that, I think someone, uh, met someone at an event yesterday who created a um, Twitter for sex workers. I mean, like, it resembled Twitter, but it allowed for them to engage without being flagged and without being taken off and then 
for to engage with their own rights, on, online rights. So you find that there's a need to create alternative spaces. And I think there's also a need for, um, the reason why Facebook, WhatsApp, and those concentrated platforms are popular is because you're able to curate your own content as according to who it's coming to, and you can actually get it in the language that you understand. And in most of our cases, it's cheaper. It's cheaper to access it than to go beyond those platforms. So the question becomes, how do we then create, I mean, is we're talking about using arts, how then do we create communication and speak to our communities that, for example, if you're a, a young woman who's an entrepreneur and now there is an online shop on Instagram, that should not be your stopping point. You should actually move to other platforms so that when your page gets taken down because you violated community guidelines, you have your content elsewhere. So I think that now is work that comes from the educational training we need to invest beyond these online platforms. Yes, we can have an internet governance forum that's focusing on how do we make the platforms work, but I think one of the mandates for me personally I would like to see is that if we're looking at education, as people who work within the internet governance space, we now need to deal with educators who are not necessarily in this room. They are the ones that are developing the curriculums, they are the ones that are teaching students, and they are the ones we then say, here's a computer program that you can run with. So I think um, alternative spaces, educating people who are on these platforms, and looking into building more the um, social gaps that were identified that's where the investment really is in trying to make sure that as people come online, they actually know that they have alternatives as well. Just um, maybe to give an example of what this um, going away can mean or creating alternative platforms, um, there are feminist servers nowadays. So the idea is that you know if you can't have your uh, your content uh, hosted in a certain specific way, um, then and this is uh, becoming commoner and commoner. And it's, again, then we, we touch on another issue, which is, okay, who is actually creating technology? Who is designing technology? Do we have an, enough of these diverse groups uh, designing and creating technology? Um, women, young people, black people, um, just to chime in. For everybody, maybe, do we then risk fragmentation of the discourse? If, if everybody goes to their own silo, I, I know there's, we probably all are aware of these different pushes, like delete Facebook, delete whatever, and then we are left with what exactly? Uh, where, where do we go? Where do people go to talk to each other? Is there, is there a risk of that ver versus the current risk of siloing? So, so, sorry. so I think at the end of the day, the risk of siloing has emerged because of the idea that there was this one powerful entity that defined how to engage. And so therefore you've got that option of, if I play by the rules of what has been defined on these platforms, I also then risk self-censoring myself. And so then are my opinions going to, that freedom of opinion that was highlighted, which I, I'm going to carry everywhere with me from now on. But um, if then we want to, uh, one net, one vision, I was part of the approving panel for this slogan, but at the end of the day, one net, one vision, there's, the power issues mean that someone else has power to define that this is the kind of net we want. Not everyone who, say, the, um, say, Sir Tim Benesley is my biggest boss, but it's always good to engage with him to actually point out that was this the vision that of what the web is right now? Is it what he had at that time? And if he had thought about it going beyond what it is, how do we ensure that even in that fragmentation, there's still conversation? So I think we need to recognize those differences that all of these spaces have rules that will leave other people out. What, what is the, the public sector, the government perspective on, on, on this? Unfortunately, no, no opinion to local government. It happens, I mean, this is not a topic that, that the governments are discussing uh, right now. Uh, the only thing I, I can say is, is the, the internet is already fragmented. We are not using the internet. We are using this specific app to do very specific things. And actually, most of my conversations, and I will say most of, of people in Colombian conversations, and maybe in other countries, are through WhatsApp. I mean, we are building uh, WhatsApp groups with 200 people. And then if, if I have one from, for this interest, and one for this interest, and one for this interest. So uh, as advertising is fragmented as well, uh, our interests are fragmented as well. So I, I know that I can 
talk uh, about a very specific topic with with what uh, um, what kind of what I mean, and a specific type of people. And then if I, if I do, I want to do yoga, so I want to go to the yoga group. And then I talk about yoga with, the, with those people. But this general, uh, general conversation, maybe it happens sometimes when someone posts something and then in the, in the discussion part of the, of the post, uh, I mean the answers to the post, people are discussing uh, briefly and the, in the, if they disagree, the, they prefer to go and just leave the conversation. It's not about the, the tool, it's, it's about what are we are confronting the public discussions. So this, um, I mean, we have biases, for instance, uh, we, uh, that prevent us to, to engage in a public conversations because we want to be reinforced in, an, in our arguments. So I, I prefer to discuss with someone that is going to say that, that the things I'm, I'm saying are, are clever or, or are right. But then I fight a little bit, but I'm tired of fighting, and we are tired of fighting. There are a lot of polarization uh, on the public discourse, uh, politically, for religion. So maybe we're tired to being in this public internet, so we are relating with people that are think uh, as ourselves. Thank you. And um, before we go to a Q&A with, with the room, but also remote participants, hopefully, I wanted to ask each one of you for a quick sort of blue sky scenario. What, what, what should this online discourse, this participation for everybody look like? Just in maybe two sentences, starting with you, Amos. I, I, th I, I think that in order to kind of um, create an online discourse um, that we want, I cannot emphasize enough the need for looking at, um, you know, and, and, and remedying some of the structural gaps we see in incentives, but also in resources of bringing people online. Um, and some of the structural barriers are really important Right to resolve before we even have a conversation about what kind of online discourse, you know, uh, people who aren't yet online would want. Um, one million dollar question. Um, I'll go with the take on a healthier public sphere. Um, if we do have a healthier public sphere outline in the sense of polarization, in the sense of prejudice, in the sense of harm, in the sense of attacks to human rights, then we can also have a healthier public sphere online. Um, so are we collecting the million dollars after this? <laughs> I, don't have I don't have them with me right now, but <laughs> it depends uh, on the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, a blue sky is, um, a dis public discourse that allows for power to be critiqued and places people at the center taking into account context, body, and interests. So centering people and not just looking at them as producers of, of data fumes or something like that. In terms of the what a government could do, uh, maybe be better are uh, giving or employing education I mean, better in education systems, so people can build their voices. This is one. Critical thinking as well. Um, fake news are, are damaging this public sphere so much, so uh, the fact that you can, you can distinguish between good information and bad information make a lot of, of sense. And as I mentioned, reducing all, I mean, Try to reduce all the social gaps and gender gaps in in offline world. That, that because the internet is not changing those gaps, are just incrementing those gaps. The internet is not an equalizer. The, the internet is, is not capable to equalize. The, the internet just amplifies what is happening in in society. So I think we should work more offline to bridge those gaps, and then people are going to be better in public discourse when they are online. 
Thank you to all of you um, we, for, for this conversation. We now have uh, 20 to 25 minutes for questions from all of you. Um, to, to these four wonderful speakers, please take the opportunity of them being basically captive over here and they can't walk away and they need to respond to your questions. Um, I also want to um, encourage the, my co-organizers in the room to ask questions, should they have some. Um, and, and Christian, maybe you can let us know whether um, there are questions online as well. Um, maybe we'll start with, are there any questions in, in, in queue um, in the app, Christian? No, not so far, okay. Um, so maybe we, we can um, start over here. Um, please raise your hand. We don't have um, name tags to raise, so uh, just raise your hand and I'll try to keep track of you over here. Please say your name and... Okay, and uh, my name is Parsa Sajid and I'm a writer researcher uh, based in Dhaka, Bangladesh right now. Um, thank you, first of all, for a very engaging discussion. Uh, c coming from Bangladesh, uh, where actually, I mean, there, I mean, the internet use is very high um, compared to many Asian countries in Bangladesh. Um, if we do look at the data, there is a certain urban-rural gap we see. Um, there is a gender gap, but I would actually like to come in hearing the this discussion and kind of from my experience is um, for us to think about the pitfalls and cost of inclusion, for example. Um, in Bangladesh, for example, now, I mean, getting a, a phone and SIM is quite affordable. People actually have multiple SIM cards. But now, for in the last three, four years, because of a government regulation, to get a SIM card, you need to input your, like, you need to share your biometric information. And you get a SIM card against your national ID, which actually seriously, you know, affects kind of democratic space and participation. So people are, I mean, there is, you know, a lot of benefits to be on the internet. It, it is a necessity, it is a convenience, but at the same time it seriously hurts actually the kind of configuration of public space. Um, in terms of kind of language and inclusion, an example I can give kind of um, from Facebook users from my research I've seen. I mean, on Facebook you can actually quite easily kind of communicate in Bangla, right? But women, people who identify as queers, uh, for example, uh, have faced and systematically face kind of, you know, insults, slurs, threats of violence, harassment, uh, and these things are, if they are kind of, you know, said in Bangla, for example, Facebook has no intention, right, to kind of, you know, address, like, because if we talk to them, they'll say they have no capacity to kind of, you know, try to understand, like, what kind of, you know, uh, uh, in Bangla, for example, what is a slur and what is not? What is a threat and insult? They would say they have no capacity. I would say that they actually don't have the intention uh, to address this issue. So it's kind of just more than a language barrier because people can participate in Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever in Bangla, but the kinds of um, hostile situation they face, right? Uh, these platforms have, again, no intention of addressing that and they kind of fall back on this like oh it's you know we don't have the capacity to do it thank you does anybody want to respond to this no yeah um, so just a quick response. Um, that exact, it's a point that I had wanted to raise in terms of like the con the politics of moderators. Um, even though the AI is assisted to, I mean, it's flagged and someone assists with it. I think the the biggest challenge for me that I face is the context to which these moderators are coming from and missing those nuances. And even though. Um, I don't know how Wikipedia, how many Wikipedia has, but I, I, I am full, in terms of like uh, moderators that support when the AI is flagged, but I am fully aware that there is a need to unpack the politics of those moderators because we can't assume that just because you're given this job to prefect the internet that you are going to leave your politics and whatever biases you have. So I think those are some of the areas of research that we should really work on and thank you so much for reminding me to raise that point. Thank you, everybody, for, for your interventions. My name is John Weizmann from Wikimedia Germany. So sorry, again, uh, the, the Wikimedia space asking a question, um, or two questions, actually. One, one would be, uh, Amos highlighted that um, a lot of the rulemaking is, 
is basically rulemaking by the advertising world because advertising is dominating in, in so many parts of the internet and the reason for that is um, obviously because it's, it's financing large parts of the internet. So that's what's paying for, uh, for that. So wouldn't it be also necessary to get to a new baseline of, of running the internet instead of on advertising money on something else? And what would that be? So that would be the first question. And, and the second question maybe to all of you, and especially for, for example, Chenna, you, you um, and, and also the others, uh, you sounded like it's, it's, a, it's a discussion about lack of capacity of those people coming online. But isn't it also a, a, a chance that, that some of those communities have not taken part in, uh, in, in the discussions of 10 years ago and are not biased in ways that we, for example, are biased when talking about rulemaking? So I think that is precisely the question that needs research and, and at some point in time advocacy, right? Because I don't think that we see discussions about what, well, I do think that we see discussions about what alternatives to um, advertising-based models um, of social media platforms or other kinds of internet platforms. Um, but I don't think we see enough of those discussions. I, I do think that, you know, there is at least in certain contexts, and not to fall back on the Wikipedia example again, but um, there are, you know, um, kind of ideas about kind of community-led networks, right, that um, are volunteer-run. And even in um, contexts where there are financial incentives, such as in the case of Reddit, for example, um, it's a kind of radically, it, it's a, a, a much different way of kind of approaching um, how content is shared and accessed, right? In Reddit, for example, you have different subreddits where there is some level of community control over um, different streams of content rather than a top-down structure. So I think even within an ad-based model, there is, there is kind of still room for innovation on how we think about um, content can be um, accessed and moderated and um, um, accessed and moderated and um, distributed, yeah. Just maybe touching on your other question regarding lack of capacity. Um, I think it's, it's a problem talking specifically about young people. Um, it's a problem when we have very adult-centric approaches to what media literacy is, to what critical thinking is, to uh, how uh, we distinguish between good or bad quality information. Um, so maybe it's, I think, very important that we kind of, you know, take our glasses off and put young people's glasses um, to actually see what they are seeing in terms of what is good or bad content for them. Um, so just uh, an example in that sense, it's a, it's a research that we have been doing at um, at the Institute, but together with Conectados al Sur, which is um, a network of um, other researchers based in Latin America and also the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. Um, and through this research, what we want is to understand from their perspective um, what uh, digital skills mean, what uh, good quality content, uh, content means, what are the lack of uh, content or, or, or content gaps that they see. Um, and in order to do so, we are using uh, workshops and uh, design thinking methodologies to actually, you know, we, we take, literally take our shoes off and, and say, okay, what, what are your takes on this? Um, and sometimes what, um, I, I don't know, I think, Basically, every research that is done uh, of young people or about young people is not necessarily inclusive of young people in their very design. So we want to change uh, this, this notion, this very idea, so that we see from their perspective. And this is about young people, but it could be about any other uh, marginalized groups as the ones uh, we have been discussing here. So I think lack of capacity not necessarily means uh, what we think lack of capacity is. I mean, uh, just to add on to that as well, that I think sometimes, um, so I've 
done also done research on young people in African countries and how they engage online. It was four countries, um, Tanzania, Rwanda, Nigeria, and Kenya. And what I found interesting, I was actually learning in terms of their rules of engagement to actually circumvent when they've been kicked off a platform, this is how then they go and create a new persona or a new identity to be able to engage on the platform and some of the ways that they were using the internet to address these issues. So for me to hold back the mirror to myself is like lack of capacity is what would fly in the policy context because this is what the language says. Therefore, if they're not adhering by these rules, they have a lack of capacity. But I do think it's a great opportunity because then you find that people are being innovative to actually, you know, as what Deborah was saying, that they're being innovative to actually participate in these spaces and to figure out how to engage and to take the best bits. So for example, um, a colleague of mine and myself, we set up a feminist in world African platform on WhatsApp because we knew that if we were to have it on Facebook, we would be kicked off, but we like know how to engage on Twitter. And we had even had our account Lock, like kicked off because we were from different places. But what we realized is that we were able to take best practices from different platforms that would work for us. And because it's a smaller group, we were able to say to people, add on the rules that work for you. And the rules that people were coming with were not from online spaces. Rules around self-care, rules around um, acknowledging the stigma of leaving WhatsApp groups. Like I come from a society where if you leave a WhatsApp group, you're gonna be flagged for the rest of the, for the year. So then, it, taking that context into account and that is an opportunity that I think these platforms and Wikimedia is open to it as well and I know you guys support whose knowledge. So I think these are opportunities that those with power are able to actually take their rules and say, what does it really mean as new people are coming in online? So I think that is also an opportunity for everyone. Further questions in the room? So hello, this is Fabrice Tiber from ITS, the same institutions as Deborah. Um, I have a weird question, but it might be relevant. So it's about the agenda setting. Every time we put an agenda first, something rolls back. So I'll give one, one example. Yesterday we were discussing about 5G. So 5G should be a priority and so on. And at ITS we're discussing for five years connecting public schools to the internet. Half of the schools in Brazil were disconnected, the other half just have two megabytes per second, which is administrative internet, not kids' internet. So thinking about this IGF, what do you think is the, um, one topic that you think, this is relevant to inclusion and other topics, but it should not be a priority. What kind of hype we might be seeing that it might lose the focus of something that is more important for inclusion? So the, framing the question is, if you could say something that you see everyone is talking about, but you think we should go back to basics and say there is something before, what would be this hype topic that you see in IGF uh, growing? And then maybe a minor alert saying, this is relevant, but let's not put this on top of agenda because something else should be in the agenda. So, huh. I mean, I, I, that's a really, Important question. I think there are certain issues that are completely left. Certainly, I think it's been left off this year's IGF agenda, as far as I know. Um, that kind of relate to the intersection between social economic rights and, and the internet, right? When we talk about, you know, access to knowledge, it also really depends on what kind of knowledge we are talking about, for example, um, in the context of the provision of essential public services, right? Um, you know, we are not necessarily talking, well, we are talking about privately run systems that are unaccountable in um, the delivery of public services, such as benefits, but, but I think there's a greater room to kind of also talk about about you know, what public run platforms um, for accessing benefits applications and welfare services should look like and how it should involve the very people that um, you know, are effect directly affected by these platforms. Um, and I think those kinds of discussions just need to happen, right? But then in the context of what we are talking about, right, and um, kind of some of the issues around access to knowledge in the social media context, 
I think it's the framing that's very important. So we often think of YouTube as a social media platform, for example. But you know, I think there are certainly important questions about whether YouTube is also a labor platform, a digital labor platform, right? Because you're talking about people who are supplying content and making livelihood of content they are creating for YouTube as a result of the financial incentive structure that is put in place. And I think that goes for several other platforms as well, not just YouTube. Um, but so if we kind of shift the conversation, right, from, um, you know, some of the information related rights, but to also kind of include kind of conversations about labor rights, about what are the rights of YouTube creators, right, um, content creators, then I think that, that in, in effect broadens our conversation about um, access to knowledge. Okay, so uh, being part of the planning committee for, <laughs> for this whole conference. Um, so I think for me, the, 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 in looking at inclusion and every other, because the, the three th thematic checks were data governance, inclusion, and uh, I think safety and security. So I think a lack of intersectional understanding of these issues. Because at the end of the day, if you're looking at data governance, to what extent is the, are the current models around uh, data inclusive and who exactly are they representing? And yesterday there was an example from a colleague from uh, Point of View Mumbai, um, and, she, and, and they pointed out that the level of inclusion at IGF starts from the sign-up form where, the, where it's uh, tick he or she, and they did not identify with that, and then the, the the ID, the document that they're supposed to present is that ID doc, is that ID document. Yet we're having discussions around um, digital IDs and the validity and who they leave out. So I think the, for me, what takes it up a step, not of what's not left behind, is we're not having the conversation around the intersectionality of all of these issues and what it really means for people to be able to participate um, in these spaces. I uh, just want to add something very short. Um, we are talking here a, a, a lot of uh, artificial intelligence, for instance. Uh, but but I, I tend to think that in Colombia we are so, so, so behind. And we have to figure out what to do tomorrow. Not in 100 years, just tomorrow. Because we don't have artificial intelligence in our government that are working uh, today. But if we want to have this in 20 years, what should we do tomorrow? I mean, teach algorithms in schools for, for children? I mean, very basic, or train teachers, or uh, do more data analytics, or, so those things that are, are before artificial intelligence, I mean, we have to do something else before to talk uh, of artificial intelligence. So those capacities, those skills that we have to form, the talent, the, the, the needed talent um, to build artificial intelligence in our, in our, in our own country, uh, yeah, but we have to do many things before. Actually, we are now using other people algorithms. I mean, Euro European algorithms, Asian algorithms, Amer uh, North American algorithms, but you, you, we are not producing our own, our, uh, our own algorithms because we don't have the proper talent uh, to do it. So maybe we are like a 20 years behind. Any other questions in the room? Um, otherwise, looking at, the, at um, the clock here, we, we may go into a short summary or wrap up of, of the session uh, before we can leave you all out for lunch. Any further questions? Maybe also online? Nope. Okay, so inclusion of remote participants isn't, isn't great, apparently. Um, we'll try to do better next time. Uh, my name is Juliet. Sorry, the voice is going. Um, just one question. Earlier you mentioned um, the trend of parental mediation. It takes me back to the age when dial-up phones and the parent would sit right by the phone as you call, and you're like, hello, friend. Um, how is that playing out in the online arena? Parents um, a very strong gatekeep of information. Um, is this damaging for children who have to have that, excuse me, a level of, who have some kind of parental mediation in how they engage with the internet? Thanks. Um, if, 
my other colleagues wants to um, contribute as well. I think when we talk about parental medi mediation, it's also important not to say that it's something good or bad. Um, it means that um, it is important to have an idea of a shared responsibility between the child or that young person and their parents and the platforms and the government. So there are multiple layers of who is taking responsibility for what that uh, kid or young person is doing online. But she or he or they must uh, be included in, in, in that sense as well. So, um, and maybe a, a, another uh, <coughs> problematic to that is the fact that um, sometimes, many times, these parents are not the ones who uh, have enough digital literacy to understand what those kids are doing. Um, many cases, um, anecdotal here, my mom comes to me and say, how do I do this? And I have to, at the same time, teach her um, and imagine what happens to kids in that sense. So they are the ones who need to, at the same time, be teaching their parents of what that is, but be educating themselves about uh, what content or th skills they are going to develop online. Um, so that's another uh, problematic here. And I think it's very important because we talk a lot about digital literacy and media literacy to young people, but we're not talking it, about it you know, to other generations who are not digital natives, who don't um, know how to access and to actually uh, um, profit from what, what's good out there online. When I was in, go in government, we had to deal with this uh, online child protection. And then we, do, we did a little bit of research and focus group, and, and we realized that parents uh, think that there, there are two different worlds, the online and, of, uh, and the offline. And the online is, of course, real. And it's here, and it's, it's even more dangerous. But they, they just think that there are two worlds, and in the internet, it's not, nothing's going to happen. And actually, uh, when they are busy, they just give a kid a tablet, so they are quiet for a, for a, for a bit, and, and they don't think that there is an actual world uh, inside. Uh, we would have a question from an online participant, and that would be to the panel. Um, what do you guys think on digital inclusion and those with special needs, and how it should, and how it, uh, should fit into the core values of the internet? After all, it is meant for all. Thank you. Who wants to take that one? Can maybe just give an example. Um, so uh, at the um, Institute for Technology and Society, one of the things that we do is to uh, literally develop technology. Um, so we have mobile apps or platforms or um, chatbots. And this is something that concerns uh, us from the design of those technologies. Um, so it's important for the team to not only uh, seek knowledge in terms of how to uh, integrate uh, disabled people, but also to um, look for people who can actually tell us, again, it's, it's about these people's needs. Uh, it's about how they want to be included. Um, so just going back to uh, the other point I made about um, not having an adult-centric uh, perspective, it's about not having enabled uh, perspective as well. I, yeah, I think, I, I think that's a critical question that illuminate some of the tensions in current kind of digital rights discourse. Um, you know, when, you know, I spoke to disability rights groups in the UK about some research on universal credit, which is the UK welfare system, the objection wasn't that the government was moving uh, welfare benefits applications online, right? The objection was how it was being done because, you know, um, offline alternatives um, aren't really very beneficial for people generally and certainly not for people with disabilities, right? And moving um, and the, the migration online actually may help people with disabilities um, better access their benefits and manage their benefits. But the problem is that without adequate input, or input at all from people with disabilities, we end up with a very ableist um, um, kind of uh, system that you know overlooks uh, their needs or that are at 
actively hostile to the needs of people with disabilities. And um, then I had another point which I completely forgot. So. Um, so, I mean, that's always a very good question and um, that always comes up. And I think one of the biggest challenges, speaking from a research perspective, is, is that we do often overlook um, people with disabilities. And even when we do say we're collecting data to inform um, evidence-based policy, it seems as if it's, it's the tools that we make use of are very difficult to get to. Um, we design tools that make it difficult to get to these communities where there's a need for intentionality to actually be able to say, if we want to have um, evidence-based policies that address for everybody, then we need to actually make, take into account the kind of tools that we have to ensure that we can reach these communities where if we're using surveys that are meant to be nationally representative, we might not always have access to the person who's differently abled. So I think, um, Probably I'm calling myself out, but I do think that there is need for more intentional research that actually does try to look at the intersectionalities. I mean, I champion gender, but to actually look at gender and disability. And I do know that, um, I've forgotten uh, the name of the article, but I do know my colleagues in India actually did start a specific um, article that looks around, that looks at how the people who are disabled are actually finding pleasure online, how they connect with communities and to move away from trying to just perceive them as not having some form of agency. So I do believe that there is need to invest in research to understand those issues. Um, regarding people with disabilities, um, I just want to bring, uh, I think, a successful case that we did in Colombia, and maybe it could be helpful for the rest. Um, we changed the approach from the demand to the supply. When you ask in the demand, you have to, I mean, people with disabilities have to ask government to do something and from supply, uh, the government just uh, uh, guarantee that all, all can access. So we buy a country license of a software uh, uh, for people with visual impairments, the, the famous JAWS, I don't know if you, if you know it. It's a very powerful software uh, that enable uh, blind people to access the internet. So instead of people having to ask for every single, I mean, for, for a license, which is very, very costly, we install uh, this license in every single computer uh, in the schools so people can go and, and study. Because people in school say, no, we don't have blind people. And of course you don't have blind people because you, you don't have the tools for people to study. So we decided to change the approach to the supply approach, and then we install the software in every single computer so people can, can access, and also, um, I mean, uh, creating a model with an uh, economy of scale, so we don't pay, li uh, pay license by license, but we get a, a, a good price for a country license. Uh, we, uh, the cost was like a $1,500 per license per year, and then we get like just, just uh, $1 per license per year uh, doing this kind of economy of scale. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm glad we, we did get a question online and, and um, a, a good one, actually. Um, thanks for sharing this. Um, we, we have about five minutes left um, till, um, I guess, we lose the room. Um, I want to turn over to uh, Christian Fiesler, um, who's a co-organizer and leads the Nordic Center for Internet and Society in Oslo uh, for a quick summary and wrap-up um, of our conversation. Yeah, I would like to wrap up the session a little bit with the summary of my impressions. Um, I think uh, we all had a very interesting discussion starting out on the matter of access, which I felt very much concerned about the idea first about urbanity um, as a divider in terms of where people have access to the internet and what type of internet. You raised the question of intersectionality as a lens to understand participation. And you raised a very important or interesting point about different levels of digital divide. I didn't know myself actually that we by now have seven levels, very interesting, where you essentially also pointed to the idea of intentionality. You continued um, with the idea of freedom of opinion, in particular also the um, question of who is protected and how do we essentially differentiate between the rights to have a civil discussion and to have legit or legitimate 
counter speech to certain uh, developments. And I think the discussion then went into the direction of incentive structures, the idea of what type of speech can be monetized, should be monetized, and whether that in any way, shape, or form has an incentive of what speech is actually allowed, which is um, given. Um, you had a very interesting discussion then leading into the overall opening up of the room of um, what type of platforms we want to have, especially when it comes to the capability of pushing boundaries. You mentioned the idea of exit alternative platforms, but also the um, question of whether that leads to any fragmentation, right? I think the consensus of the panel was very much we already have some type of fragmentation of the internet. However, these fragmented platforms are essentially the global players, right? Uh, WhatsApp was a commonly cited um, idea. I think going forward, or I think kind of like one of the big questions which then also came up in the overall discussion, I think might not only be one of access, but of speech and what type of speech can actually be monetized, right? Kind of like the connection of um, expression of opinion and um, finding remuneration in terms of uh, engagement on the internet. I think those were the, to me, very interesting points you raised. Thank you, Christian. And um, right on time, please join me in thanking our panelists, Amos, Deborah, Chennai, and Santiago for this interesting conversation, for taking the time. And also thank you for uh, joining us today. Hope you have a good rest of the day and of IGF. Thank you very much for coming to this session.
Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. If I could get everyone to take their seats, please. Great. So welcome, everybody. We have a lot of people here, and that's great to see. Really happy to welcome you here. My name is Maya Romano. I'm the coordinator of GizWatch this year. GizWatch is Global Information Society Watch. It's a publication that the Association for Progressive Communications has been publishing for 13 years now. We decided 13 years. And this year we have a really great subject, artificial intelligence and how it intersects with human rights, social justice and development. I know it's been a hot topic here at IGF, and uh, what we have been trying to do with this year's edition is to really weave in a Global South perspective and to try to give representation to some voices that are often left out of key decision-making processes when it comes to AI. So uh, it's been an absolute privilege jumping into the many worlds and many visions of all of our authors, many of who are present here today, which is really, really great as we celebrate the culmination of these past months of hard work. So we're going to keep our introductions here very brief uh, because we're looking forward to hearing from all the authors. So first of all, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Valeria Betancourt, who's the manager of the Communications and Information Policy Program here at APC. Uh, and uh, she is the manager of the team that is responsible for putting together this report every year. I would also like to introduce Chat Garcia Ramilo, the director of APC, who's going to share with us a few words on uh, APC's work on Watch when we wrap up. I would also like to welcome and thank Article 19 who supported this year's edition of GizWatch, and they were instrumental um, in the direction and actually the theme of this year's edition. Uh, we have with us Mallory Knodel from Article 19. Um, and uh, following at the end of this, the presentations, we're also going to have Vidushi Marta, who will join us, who also contributed a chapter to this report. Um, I also, I'm not sure if we have the technical setup working, but uh, yes, yes, wonderful. So uh, all of our team here and our authors uh, have had the pleasure of working with GizWatch longtime editor, Alan Finley. So we have him uh, connected, I think, via link to say a few words. Alan? Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't be there. I'm speaking from a place called Pergamino in Argentina, which is um, in the center of Argentina, about three and a half hours from Buenos Aires. Um, I just wanted to say it was a privilege to work with Gizwatch authors again this year. Many of them I know and have worked with before, and there are many new authors, and that's always um, exciting for me to read uh, the thinking and writing of new authors. Um, Gizwatch is a learning experience. It's an initiation for me. So. Um, I really feel I go through these um, uh, uh, quite profound learning experiences working with the authors, authors. So I'm hoping people read the book, they have the same kind of experience. Um, what struck me most about this year's reports on artificial intelligence is that there was a, an emerging, it seemed to me, undercurrent of resistance. And I mean, I've edited many um, issues of Gizwatch, um, and it seemed different this year. It felt like some authors were taking quite radical positions uh, about saying no to artificial intelligence um, and that compromise is not always possible and it seems to me this is a healthy resistance to what seems to be a new wave of technological determinism and control that is becoming so widely evident and it feels that this could be something that needs to be thought through more and expanded on. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there for the discussions with you and, and from my side I'd like to thank Article 19, Valeria, Maya, and Laurie, um, who have all formed the core editorial and production team of this edition. So it was um, a great experience, and uh, I hope you have a great launch. 
That's wonderful. Thank you, Alan. I'm really glad that worked and that we could hear from you. So um, just to give you a bit of background, in this year's edition of GizWatch, we have 40 country reports, three regional reports, and eight thematic reports. And what's really great is that we have a lot of the authors here present with us. We don't have a huge amount of time, but I would like everybody to speak briefly. So um, we're going to give everybody two minutes, if you could introduce yourself, uh, let us know where you're coming from, and maybe one key takeaway from your report. That would be really, really wonderful. And if we stick to our time limit, and I'm sorry in advance for any strictness, if we stick to the time limit, then we can have a nice discussion afterwards, which would be really great. Um, so what I will do is go through my list, and um, when you need to speak, just hit the button on the microphone, grab one wherever there's one near you, and, uh, and let us know about your research. So we're going to start with the thematic reports, and first up we have Philip Dawson from Element AI. If Phil is here. Thank you, Maya. Great. Um, Thanks, everybody. Um, this, it, was a, it was a great honor to, to uh, work on this uh, short submission for this year's Gizwatch. Uh, I'd like to also just add that I was the second to last to submit. Um, so almost, almost, almost didn't make it in. I think I made some people nervous. Thanks very much, Alan, Maya. Um, I'll keep it brief. I think there's some very, uh, some takeaways from this section of this chapter on data governance with a focus on fiduciary mo models of data governance, in particular data trusts rooted in trust law, is that there's a need to be innovative in looking at how we can transform current ex um, existing approaches to data governance with new models. This chapter looks at some of the legal and governance um, issues related to, to doing that in the context of data trusts in particular. And, and highlights data trust as a possible way to increase uh, agency for people, giving them more control over uh, how their data is used, for what purposes, even giving them um, choice of how their data might be used to champion different social or economic causes. Um, and also d highlights data trusts as, um, as doing something that existing comprehensive data protection legislation does not do currently, which is a, 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 to, to provide a collective act action mechanism uh, for, for people to exercise their rights jointly and to exert more leverage against large uh, data controllers uh, and, or collectors. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. It's a short chapter. I encourage you uh, all to take a look. Um, and be happy to, to chat with you going forward uh, today or in the future about, uh, about the topic. Thank you. Great, thanks, Phil. Next up, we have Luis Fernando Garcia Munoz from Derechos Digitales. I'm sorry, from what? R3D. Yes, it, we, we have in our name Derechos Digitales as well, but it's longer. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to write this article and, and uh, to contribute to this edition of Guess Watch. Um, I'm Luis Fernando Garcia from an NGO called R3D, Digital Rights Defense Network from Mexico. And I, was, uh, I wrote about a very helicopter view of the ways in which AI has been, it's been used um, around the world. Sometimes AI is pictured as a technology that is going to be in the future be applied uh, but the reality is that this is already being applied in many places um, and having direct effects in the enjoyment of human rights. In the chapter, um, I, as I mentioned, do a very helicopter view, very rapid um, summary of some of the main issues, for example, predictive policing, uh, facial recognition, uh, surveillance, uh, massive surveillance, um, but also other types of implementations of AI that directly uh, are used to police people. The, 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 the title is Policing People, Streets, or, and Speech. It focuses a little bit uh, also on the intersection between these systems and the right to protest, uh, but also the right to freedom of expression as um, AI systems are increasingly being utilized to police speech online. So there's also an exploration about, about that. But if you want to learn more, just read it. And I think that gives you a brief summary of what you will find in that article. 
Thank you. Thank you, Luis, that's great. So next we have uh, Joana Varon from Coding Rights, as well as Paz Peña, who together wrote a chapter. Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Joana Varon from Coding Rights. Paz, I think, is not here. Yeah, no. Um, so our chapter was called Decolonizing AI, a transfeminist approach to data and social justice. Um, it's uh, an outcome of uh, research that we are doing, a bigger one, uh, in which we are mapping AI projects uh, from the public sector in Latin America and try, try to um, see which ones are likely to have gender implications. For that chapter specifically, we analyzed uh, the case of uh, AI being used for predicting pregnancy in, uh, in teenagers in, in the city of Salta. The project is being exported to other countries as well, from Argentina to Brazil to Colombia. So our goal in the chapter was to go beyond human rights uh, approaches to analyze AI, uh, have, uh, having also feminist lenses to analyze an AI project. And by that, I mean, um, having a more uh, a view that includes also considering power relations and not just the liberal vision of human rights that uh, focus only in the individual uh, is capable to protect its, its uh, rights. This is also a continuation of a work that Paz and I started on discussing consent, bringing the the feminist theories around consent to discuss consent to our data and to our data bodies. And, and the idea is to uh, have other values, other transfeminist values, map what are those, and think, can we also have a, trans, a transfeminist framework to analyze AI systems? Um, for doing that, in parallel, we are doing this game at Coding Rights, but in partnership with uh, my colleague Sasha Constanza from the MIT, in we, that we call an oracle for transfeminist futures, in which we departure from transfeminist values such as intersectionality, intuition, queerness, autonomy, decentralization, non-binary, and try to envision what are the transfeminist technologies that we want? So all this work goes uh, hand by hand and is a bit explained in the chapter. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next we have Nandini Chami from IT for Change. Thank you, Maya. It's like wonderful to be with all of you here today. So uh, our chapter from IT for Change is a thematic report and, the and, and it's called Radicalizing the AI Governance Agenda. So what the chapter does is to take stock of the broad trends in three strands of AI governance debates we see today, which are AI and human rights, AI and the future of work, and AI, democracy, and the automated public sphere. And our one main critical finding is that most of the governance debates tend to circle around very liberalist solutions which means that the whole focus is on correcting wrongs of misrecognition, and there's hardly any attention to linking the AI debate with the political economy of data ownership and control, and the injustice of data extractivism and what it means for development for economies of the global south. So I encourage you to read the chapter, and also, if possible, you could check out the booth of the JustNet Coalition, where we could have a conversation around that as well. Great, thank you. And uh, wrapping up the thematic reports, we have Alex Komninos from Research ICT Africa. Hi, um, I wrote the report with a colleague, Grace Mutungu, and uh, a associate that we met at the Deep Learning in Daba in Nairobi. Um, Grace is a lawyer, and, and Emily uh, Muller is a mathematician at Imperial College London. Um, so it was a convergence of perspectives, and there's three things I want to briefly talk about in the article. Uh, the first is I, I, th I think that I, I was less critical than I, I usually am about tech. I'm, I'm not a solutionist, but my 
mind has been opened a bit as to what's possible. And there's a lot of interesting ha stuff happening in Africa by Africans and yeah, uh, anyone can, well not anyone, but you, AI is, is, is democratized in many ways. There's, there's open science behind it. The algorithms that we all talk about existing behind the black box before they're compiled, they're, they're open source and I was pleasantly surprised by the community which I think can be good for development. So um, to, I gave the publication, at, we gave the publication team at, at um, APC a bit of a headache because we did a table here with all of the examples of AI 4D uh, and then some, some challenges. Um, what I would like you all to do is to, to read this in a year's time, maybe with a pen and s cross some stuff out and say that was hype, that was bullshit. Um, because yeah, uh, AI is subject to a hype cycle and, and solutionism that we must be aware of. It's easy to say, oh, we've got this great project. Uh, second thing is there's immense potential for AI for development and human development. I, I think the first and obvious one is health, and I'm not gonna go into it, look at the table. But, um, and then this is an argument by Lynette Taylor and Dennis Bruders and, and others. Um, there's, there's, there's two things happening. The first is datafication. So increasing aspects of our lives are being datafied, uh, especially the poor. And then the second is a lot of AI happens around public and private partnerships. So there's power shifts in development that are happening at this moment, and, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's augmenting the power of the private sector, and it's, it's changing discourses. It's something we must be very careful about. Uh, I think it's something that may have happened at earlier stages in development with the statistical revolution, so there might be some historical learnings there. And yeah, I think, uh, lastly, so um, I, my perspective is I'm distrustful of technology, I like my privacy, etc. but AI can, or big data, it, it can make the poor visible and it can make the poor vulnerable. So um, there's a dystopian, we took digital ID, ID as an example and there's dystopian fears around digital ID, but ID makes you visible and read by the state. So if you want to get access to social services, um, if you want to do a whole factor of things, like your ID is very important. So while we must be very critical of that, it's, it's a human right that someone should have an ID and it should be enabling. Um, and then secondly, yeah, uh, there's the power structures in international development and um, why we get you know, companies like Palantir working with the World Food Program. And I think this is to do with the needs that are existing around development as well as the power structures around AI. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Alex. So we're gonna move now into the country and regional reports. So we'll get those started off with Florencia Roveri from Argentina. Hello everybody. Thank you, uh, Maya. Um, we focused our report on unions perception, perceptions of artificial intelligence. Um, not only about uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, uh, artificial intelligence changes processes of work, but also um, it insights in, in statistics. So we, we consult several unions in Argentina, uh, in our city in Rosario, um, about uh, how they are perceiving artificial intelligence. Um, we also include in the, in the chapter uh, the experience of um, a union created for workers in platforms, uh, also related to how they deal with aspects of artificial intelligence, and um, also uh, mentioned uh, a, a section uh, uh, that we call from uh, gaps to bias to, uh, to uh, develop uh, an aspect related to gender, how is it that the gap gender uh, is um, mentioned as a bias uh, when we thought about uh, the application of uh, resources related to artificial intelligence in the works um, uh, places? Uh, what we found is that uh, unions uh, are worried about these aspects, but uh, they assumed that they are not uh, 
assuming it as a central problem because they are in our context of developed countries are uh, mostly worried about other aspects of labor conditions. But they thought they are, they, there is a, ch a challenging aspect in uh, deepening in the consideration of these technological aspects uh, in the workplaces of all the fields we, we work with. We, we interviewed people from unions related to bank workers with public workers and also from, from the commerce field. So thank you. Great, thank you. Next, do we have Mariana Canto from Brazil? Hi, uh, I'd like to thank you for the space, firstly. Uh, I'm Mariana Canto from Brazil, from the EPHEC, which is an institute for research on law and technology in Brazil. We are based in Recife, which is a city on the northeast. And currently, we are developing studies on, on the investigation of surveillance systems that are being used by the state, but also with the use of facial recognition in public schools. And my, my report was more into those kind of approach and the public schools approach, because it's not really well spotted by the media nowadays there. And during my report, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the system works and what kind of data is collecting from minors in schools such as biometric and health data and about the risks and how this is being known, regulated by the, state, by the state, even though we have a data protection regulation at the moment. Um, I'm also going to talk about a little bit of how our principle of data minimization is not being followed and how we are not thinking and the state is not thinking of less intrusive ways to reach social problems and social uh, insecurities in the country. Uh, it's important to mention that after the report was uh, sent, uh, a really important and really similar case happened in the Sweden and it was the first fine, um, um, it was the first time the Data Protection Authority of Sweden fined the, a public school in Sweden and for the same system because they were using facial recognition in the place of uh, the role for attendance call and it was a 20,000 euro fine, and it, this is important also to mention. And all the facial recognition systems in Brazil, uh, such as to public surveillance, to mass surveillance, to public transportation and other public spaces, are not ha they don't have any kind of human rights uh, impact assessment or anything doing uh, prior to its use. It's only implemented with uh, poor disclosure of how the system works and which kind of data is collecting or any of those informations are not public. So I hope uh, you enjoy the reading. Great, thank you. Next we're going to uh, have Raymond Onuoha who wrote the Africa Regional Report. Thank you for having me and thank you for the opportunity to contribute uh, to that thoughtful project. Uh, for my own research, I focused on the Africa region with regards to harmonizing data protection and privacy policies. I think it's on page 59, if you can go through the report. And considering the continuous shift in connectivities and the multilateral requirements for the cross-border nature of data at this moment, uh, acting in silos with regards to dealing with the issues or the threats of data protection and privacy uh, is beginning to shift away from the traditional uh, siloed national country perspectives to a more transnational and multilateral approach. And therefore, there is a need for a harmonized data protection framework for the continent. Issues that you are raised, why this has not gained traction, include uh, the engagement process, the top-down engagement processes within the African Union that has uh, necessitated a low adoption of the 2014 African Union Convention on Data Protection and Cyber, uh, cyber Security, and that has led to a lack of uh, ratified members at the moment. Only about uh, 15 countries out of the 55 member countries of the AU have signed up to that instrument with only five having ratified it, and the document the instrument for it to go 
to uh, full enforcement and compliance requires at least 15 ratifications, so there's still a whole long way to go. Without these instruments at the regional level, the region lacks the capacity to hold uh, data, uh, the big data companies accountable as Europe is doing at the moment, and that becomes very significant considering even uh, the economic perspectives with regards to a shift towards the African continental trade agreement era and regime, and that becomes very important for member countries, not just to reassess uh, the traditional instruments, considering the new perspectives that, and risk that AI brings with this increased deplo uh, increasing deployments across the region, but also to ratify that instrument and, also, and, and again enforce and make sure there is a compliance, especially for these data firms that at the last count, none of them are registered as a business within the continent. And therefore, there must be some enforcement mechanisms that should be put in place, regardless of whether they are registered or not. They have to sign up to those instruments so that we can not just maximize the benefits of data with increasing connectivity that AI brings, but also minimize the threats uh, across the region. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next, we have Irene Potranto from Canada. Uh, thank you, Maya. Uh, my name is Irene Potranto with the Citizen Lab. I'm a co-author of the report on Canada together with Petra Molnar and Victoria Heath, also at the University of Toronto. It was our pleasure to contribute to this edition of the GIS Watch and to be here today with all of you. Thank you again to Maya and Alan for all of your hard work. Uh, our chapter our chapter is entitled Feminist or Not, Canada's Challenges as it Raises to Become a Leader in AI. So Canada under the Trudeau government declared itself as a feminist government in 2015, while also committed to being a key player in artificial intelligence. In our chapter, we call on the Canadian government as well as other governments who are keen on using automated decision-making systems to ensure diversity and proper impact assessments, to ensure that the benefits of new technologies like AI will accrue equally. So I'll end there. Thank you very much, and I hope you'll enjoy reading it. Thanks, Irene. That's great. Next, we have Juan Diego Castaneda Gomez from Colombia. Though it appears he might not be here. Oh, there you are. Okay, let's get him a microphone. Um, thank you all, and we um, thank you for the opportunity for what uh, for writing in this uh, version of the report. Uh, <clears throat> we talked about a specific project uh, developed by the Constitutional Court in Colombia, and our point was uh, the kind of discourse that went around AI, because we have to face the situation in which we don't have like actual deployment of AI. So uh, the point we're uh, basically talking about how uh, the discourse and the charisma of the technologies make a great way into the development of these technologies and they um, foreshadow and they uh, put in the background some discussion, some political discussion, specifically our case in Colombia was an AI system deployed that they want to deploy to um, help the Constitutional Court decide which kind of cases are going to get selected. So uh, our point uh, with, the, with our participation or contribution in the report is to talk about how um, during the development and the design of the system, it is not taken into account many of the design problems and it is not placed this technology and AI system into the bigger picture of the role and the work of the Constitutional Court uh, and the work of the judges from the very local places to the Constitutional Court. So this kind of design and this um, broader consideration of how it's uh, supposed to work, uh, it's not taken uh, into consideration in the design. So um, there, uh, it, it closes the opportunity for the political discussion of how to employ AI. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Next we have Maria Jose Calderon from Ecuador. Hi, my name is Maria Jose. I'm ha very happy to be part of this, of this edition. Our research um, dealt with the use of social media and artificial intelligence with da data mining and how it is dangerously used to undermine democracy. We take into account um, the, our, legal, our country's legal framework and basically when voting is mandatory, 
This reduces a lot any options of, of guessing or, or you know, deliberately manipulating political discourse and, and, how it's, and the outcome of an election. This happened in this 2019 election. And we just, you know, it's like a, mostly it's like a cautionary tale of what will happen if we don't take into account um, legal inst and institutional frameworks in other countries with the use of AI. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Up next we have Anule Kanandi from India. Hi, um, so I'm Anule Kanandi. I work with the Digital Empowerment Foundation in India. And for our report, we um, focused on the application of AI in India's pub in public education sector, particularly focusing on the case of uh, state in South India, Andhra Pradesh. And um, what we realized when AI is mainstreamed in um, social sectors, it is done through public-private partnerships. And uh, what was necessary in the case of public-private partnerships was the lack of transparency in the agreements about which kind of data sets were used, how they were stored, um, and um, how they were handled, especially since it, led, uh, since, uh, it was data pertaining to underserved and marginalized communities. And one of the probably call to actions would be that there is greater transparency in public-private partnership agreements. Um, uh, so thank you, that's all for me, thanks. Thank you. Uh, next we have Kemli Camacho from Costa Rica. Would you like to say a few words? <clears throat> thank you, I'm um, uh, one of the co-author of this uh, His Watch uh, report from Costa Rica. We work it around the uh, intelligent artificial and uh, the right to health. And we specifically analyze the universal health data record that we have in Costa Rica where all the data around health and uh, history of the families and health history of the families is integrated in one, one uh, only one uh, database. Then uh, we discuss with the health system in Costa Rica about the, the pros and cons uh, to use intelligent artificial with these uh, national data is uh, maybe one of the most uh, tr important treasure of information in our country. And um, uh, of course, uh, for the right to health, uh, using uh, intelligence artificial, for instance, to define in the future uh, the, the future infrastructure. This is this is some of the uses that they are they are doing at the moment. Uh, define the future infrastructure. How the infrastructure, the health infrastructure, have to be built uh, to prevent uh, the the future illness like mental health. But on the other side. For instance, the health uh, workers are very worried about how they are going to work uh, with int intelligent artificial conclusions or how they are going to work with robots at the same time than, than uh, human uh, services. And also, um, uh, we discuss a lot with the, we, we had the opportunity uh, writing this uh, chapter uh, to discuss a lot with the, with the health workers also, and especially with the informatic departments of health system about uh, the, the data, and because at this moment there are no policy, no processes to protect these databases. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kemli. Next we have Giacomo Mazzone from Italy. Thank you very much. Um, this was a collective work because I used um, collective wisdom with other colleagues that um, helped me in the work, so I want to thank them. Um, I think that the contribution from Italy is mainly focusing on uh, media because this is the, the sector where we are active, um, but also on policy because on both, I think, I think that there are, we have interesting examples to study. The most interesting for me is the femicide uh, um, storytelling that is um, a combination of database um, of news 
with database of criminal records about all the crimes that have been committed against women in Italy in the last years. Um, this uh, data bank has been made by uni the, possible by the cooperation with university and media and um, is aimed to try to predict the cases where this could happen again and try to uh, help the, assist, uh, the Center for Assistance against um, uh, crimes and violence against women. Um, the second interesting example that um, I cherry-picked is about the use of artificial intelligence for um, creating support for accessibility. Uh, there is, mm, it's very interesting and very promising. I, I suggest you to have a look at it if you can, because using artificial intelligence is possible to create tools to make accessible media at very low cost. For instance, it has been created a, a, a tool that make automatic translation of programs into sign languages, of course in Italian, because this was aimed to the Italian um, public, but can be easily adapted to any other part of the world. And this make possible to access for impaired people to programs that usually are TV, radio, or even written text accessible in, in, in a very easy way. Uh, the last point on policies. Uh, there, is, mm, there has been uh, one of the first laboratories in Europe uh, trying to uh, convince the platform to test the mm, self-regulation of the platforms on wh when it comes to hate speech and uh, fake news, etc., etc. And mm, the regulatory authority of Italy for media that is called AGICOM create a table where all these platforms are presented with traditional media, trying to set up some uh, minimum thresholds of involvement. And this has been tested recently during the, Italian, the European election in Italy and um, worked quite well in trying to limit the phenomenon. Of course, our only path, we don't know where it will go, but uh, our interesting path to be studied for others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, could we have Miru from Republic of Korea, please? Hello, um, this is Miru, and I'm from Republic of Korea. And we, our report is focusing on the personal data protections. Um, because in order to make successful machine learning, especially for the new products and service, public or private, needs to lots of information to training the AI systems. So personal data in that case is wonderful resource for that. Therefore, there are a huge stream to change the personal data protection law in Korea to be more companies friendly. They want to sell de-identified customer information, personal data, and credit information such as record where you're using your credit card, how much you spend, when you stop buying the supermarket, and all those things. And they try to combine that information with your uh, cell phone information. In that case, especially in Korea, the cell phone directly linked your name and Registration numbers in Koreans. So that is the huge problem. But in that case, they didn't get the consent from the data, data subject at all. In, in order to fight for that, to protect people's privacy, Jimbonet is working hard even for now. And we are writing about that in our report. Uh, in this report, I wrote about current law system in Korea and new law system, how governments and company want to change it, just briefly. So if you have any question about that, please contact me anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have Arzak Khan from Pakistan here? Looks like he didn't make it. Okay, uh, next we have Casey James from Panama. Hola a todos, espero que estén bien. I just wanted to say hi in Spanish because I'm representing Panama. Well, my name is Casey James and I'm really happy to be representing Ipanda Tech. We are a nonprofit organization and we regulate digital rights. So we're also very happy because it's the fourth time we are being represented on the Guest Watch. 
And this year's report, we have presented it with the title, Artificial Intelligence in Panama, the Prototype Phase. Why prototype phase? Because that's how we are right now in artificial intelligence in Panama. So we divided this report in four stages to get to know if we are ready or not for these changes in artificial intelligence. Also, we spoke about how artificial intelligence is entering into finance, into health, into education, and then we present which is the prototype phase in which we are working right now in Panama. Today is the 28th of November, and it's a very special day in my country because we are celebrating our independence from Spain. But also, it's a very important day for us because we have been placed on the map with this report that Gizwash gave us the opportunity to present. So we are really happy and we are really proud and we thank Maya and Alan for all their support and all their help and all their patience with us and also thank all of the others, our authors, who send us messages with interesting topics that made us learn a little bit more about this um, topic. and. On behalf of my country and my organization and the four million people I'm representing here today, thank you so much. And well, you can find us in page 188 and you can read our report. Thank you so much. Thank you, Casey. That was great. Do we have Rachel Adams from South Africa here? Hi, um, good afternoon everyone. It's so lovely to be here and I'm just so excited to read so many of these fascinating reports that also encompass so many critical dimensions to, um, to AI. So our chapter um, that was written <coughs> together with two colleagues of mine at the Human Sciences Research Council, Sahir Parker and Paul Platinga, it looks at the use of AI in local government in South Africa to promote responsive local governance. As, uh, as I think Alex said earlier, there's, there's a huge kind of discourse and hype around uh, AI. And at the moment, this is just an online platform where registers, uh, use, users can register to pose queries to government representatives about public services and they will respond. But the idea is that this will become all automated and it will become a chatbot that will be able to respond to you about government issues in an automated way. But the whole sort of idea around it was that instantaneously 16 million people living in South Africa will have instantaneous access to government services, which is huge for a country where so many of the populations um, are in rural areas that are quite far removed from government resources um, and, and the cities where so many of these services um, lie. So the idea was to promote access to government services, particularly for these people, but of course it relies on this sort of fundamental idea that everyone has access to the internet, which is, you know, one of the first things that, that we critiqued. There's quite a um, relatively low internet penetration in South Africa of just over 60%. And those people that don't have the internet are those in the rural communities that this very service is, ta is targeted to. There's also questions around a growing gender digital divide that's quite worrying. And then the other thing is that this um, service, which is called GovChat, is being promoted only in the English language, which with 11 official languages in South Africa, this really limits access for a wide range of people. So. Yeah, you can read more, I don't know what page it's on, <laughs> but towards the end of, um, of the report on South Africa's experience with this. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Next we have Gurkan Osturan from Turkey. So, hi. Happy to be here in Berlin again. And uh, today I'm representing Hun Consultancy. But uh, I'm also the executive manager of uh, Dokuzet News that is operating in Turkey. And the report is about, uh, partly about the new media organization that I am leading as, as well. So the original idea uh, was to 
write a report actually on a much different topic, not quite different than the one th that ended up to be, but uh, on the road of uh, writing this report, we have come across an obstacle, and that was that we have been shut down by Twitter uh, ahead of the elections. And uh, this report is now focusing on the takedown notices uh, ordered by Twitter ahead of the elections targeting independent media in Turkey. As uh, most of you might know, the media in Turkey has been suffocating for over a decade now and has been experiencing terrible developments. And digital media has become the basis for uh, any critical opinion. And uh, the 50% that does not uh, support the current uh, governing alliance in Turkey is uh, heavily relying on digital atmosphere. So originally, the plan was to write a report on how uh, AI is being used to manipulate the content flow on uh, digital platforms and how uh, news consumers, news readers are being presented with uh, subverted facts and information. And in the end, uh, it ended up to be focusing on a much more, uh, a much harsher method that was used to manipulate the content flow online. And uh, as a result, uh, we have come up with uh, several action steps uh, addressing the global uh, uh, media associations and free expression uh, collectives to promote uh, further transnational uh, network alliances among media, uh, media organizations and also to uh, sit down and talk with uh, social media giants like Twitter and Facebook and then to promote uh, this digital media platforms uh, as valid sources of information. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have Daniel Moisinga from Uganda. Thank you very much. I'm Daniel Moisinga from CIPESA, an ICT policy research organization based in Kampala, Uganda. So in, 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 in this sh very short article that I had very many words for, I basically looked at um, the core aspects of surveillance application in the public, private, and the humanitarian sectors. In Uganda, um, the deployment and expected uh, the deployment of AI has been shrouded in a secrecy and mostly opaque agreements between actors. So in this uh, very brief report, I look at the recent deployment of facial recognition uh, that actually started recently um, by Huawei and the government of Uganda. I look, up, I look at um, the deployment of um, uh, deep learning by MTN, which is the largest telco in Africa, in conjunction with IBM uh, through credit, alternative credit scoring models, and also look at a radio content analysis tool deployed by the UNDP, uh, Pulse Lab in Kampala. So the major argument here is to uh, provoke the author, uh, provoke the reader to think about the alternative ways or the biases and, um, and the potential abuses of data that could emerge out of these three uh, overarching themes. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Maria Korolkova from Ukraine. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you, Maya and Alan, for your wonderful and careful editing. Um, in my report on Ukraine, I focus on uh, quite recent uh, developments in, in Ukraine um, in the sphere of AI and in social sphere as well. On the recent um, election of 2019, April, when the newly elected government uh, decided to put AI at the forefront of um, its innovations and um, and I even quote its new president, Volodymyr Zelensky, that artificial intelligence should replace uh, the mentality of officials, but by which he probably meant the corrupted mentality. So um, in that case, I sort of wonder how uh, Ukrainian government is using AI as a metaphor and as a political sort of a campaigning tool. And I outlined several, while, while sort of welcoming this development from a, the progressive point of view, I outlined several um, cautious and recommendations how to make it um, properly. Thank you. Thank you. And now I just want to ask and make sure that we didn't miss anybody. Do we have any other authors here or anybody who would like to speak on behalf of their organization? It may not be on my list. Just stick your hand up. I just want to make sure everybody's included. Go ahead. 
Okay, great. Thank you, everybody, for uh, all of your comments. Um, I also want to thank Alay, who uh, did a wonderful translation into Spanish of a number of the Latin American articles, which uh, we also have available here. Um, and uh, Sally, would you like to make a comment? Um, yes, Alay is the Latin American Information Agency based in Ecuador, and we have a periodical publication called America Latina in Movimiento. This is the second, we have a long relationship with APC, and this is the second co-edition we've brought out of an abbreviated version um, of the Gizwatch, which is, which is here, and I think there's some copies available here. Um, just very briefly, um, uh, well, it's a publication that already has a wide audience in Latin America. Uh, we have a print and a uh, freely available online digital version. Um, so as we have space restrictions, we took, um, we made abbreviated versions, translations of three of the uh, framing articles and three of the Latin American uh, reports on Argentina, Colombia, and Costa Rica. Um, I think we hope it will be a contribution to the debate in the region on these issues, which are as yet not very visible. Um, people uh, are often not aware of what's happening. Even the people who are, who are being helped or who are victims of uh, these artificial intelligence programs aren't always aware of what the issues are and what's, what's going on behind them. So we hope it's a contribution to that. And uh, thanks for ABC for the for the opportunity. Uh, you can find it online at our website, alinet.org, and I imagine there's a link on the APC site as well. Yes, yeah. Great, thank you, Sally, we appreciate it. Uh, and last, I think we have some representatives from Hemli that wanted to make a statement. If we could maybe make room at a microphone. Hi, I, I hope this is the appropriate time because I wasn't sure as we Sorry. weren't authors. Oh. Oh. Oh, okay. Is it working? Yeah, okay. Um, so I wasn't sure because we weren't authors if this was the appropriate time. So is it? Yes? To contribute? Sure, go ahead. We're going to go into questions soon, so uh, feel free to add your commentary. For sure. Okay, so um, so in regards to artificial intelligence, okay, so we're Hamla, we're the Arab Center for the Advancement of Social Media. Uh, we work on Palestinian digital rights. Um, and particularly for us, uh, facial recognition technology uh, <coughs> and artificial intelligence and how it's being used on po uh, products are being developed using Palestinian uh, private information and sold to companies around the world as well as exported to governments known to violate human rights. Uh, we see this as a critical thing and are really happy to see the full room here. Um, so, I don't know how much time I'm allocated. Two minutes, preferably. Two yeah. minutes, okay. So, yes, yeah, so you can see, you know, um, okay, so some key thing to talk about in two minutes. <laughs> I think I summed it up. You can read a lot about it in the Any Vision. Okay, the most recent thing for, I will just give an example of a successful strategy recently to approach this issue. Um, uh, there's an Israeli company called AnyVision, which has been using, uh, ha whose technology and their relationship with the IDF enabled them to create facial recognition technology uh, throughout the West Bank. Um, and Microsoft has recently invested in them, uh, $78 million. And even though we, as civil society, advocated and told them about these rights violations, and they seemed to be very clear to us, it was only through work with activists and investigative journalists at NBC we were able to get any response from the company itself. And now they have launched an investigation and hired Eric Holder to do the uh, review of the Israeli company. So you can see that the length of work and the way you have to do it to get things done is not necessarily happening at IGF in some ways, but beyond that, um, yeah, and we look to see how forums like this and engagement on many different levels beyond IGF can create impact in the way I think many people here want to see it. Thank you.
Thanks, Alison. That's really great. Thank you, everybody. And also, I just want to point out a big thanks to the authors who couldn't be here today, but who also contributed excellent, excellent chapters to this report. Uh, before we jump into the questions, I would like to turn it over to my colleague Valeria to uh, give a few comments on Giz. Oopsie. <laughs> on Giz Watch. We're having technical difficulties <laughs> online in a moment. Did I know this table is too short. Okay, so thank you so much, Maya. Uh, I just want to share a couple of uh, details about, about Gizwatch Giz because it might not be uh, familiar for all of you how Gizwatch was conceived. And the Global Information Society Watch uh, has been since 2007 a tool and a process for collective reflection um, of the implementation of the um, WSIS commitments, particularly the commitments ba base, uh, made by governments in relation to how we are creating um, inclusive democratic information societies. So it has been conceived as a platform that really provides uh, critical civil society perspectives uh, around specific issues that are relevant uh, in different contexts, but also proposes very specific action steps and this is part of the value that Gizwatch brings. Uh, so some action steps towards deepening democracy, towards uh, putting and bringing human rights to the forefront, and uh, uh, towards working uh, towards social justice. So that is, we believe, the value uh, of, of Gizwatch, part of the value of Gizwatch. And also, um, uh, we are convinced that there is no other publication that has been addressing uh, from the Global South, with voices from the Global South, in such consistent way, with uh, such a breadth of you know, the spectrum of issues, uh, uh, the evolution of issues that are relevant for the information society, but, uh, but particularly bringing an advocacy perspective. So this is also uh, uh, another important aspect of, of Kiss Watch. And this year we have we have had the fortune to work in collaboration with Article 19 on an issue that is of common interest, and it has enriched the process very much. It, it has been a pleasure to work with the, uh, the Article 19 team, and um, we are convinced that this joint effort has resulted not only in a, a quite interesting and valuable learning exercise about what is uh, the, the contextual impact of artificial intelligence, but also we feel that it will result, uh, result in providing some significant input for um, doing some um, research-based advocacy, but also for providing some specific and alternative responses, technical responses, policy responses, um, to um, artificial intelligence issues. So thank you for that collaboration, Mallory, and we hope that we, you enjoy reading the book, that you find it useful and relevant for your context, and please be mindful of the action steps. I, I cannot emphasize this enough, that we really expect this to, to inform um, um, advocacy actions in your particular context. So just to thank uh, uh, the authors and Article 19 and, the, and Maya and Alan and all the APC team, um, we really uh, feel this is a, a good contribution in a very timely way in which um, human rights obviously are being pushed back in different ways. So we hope that this also strengthens uh, the possibilities to come up with the viable responses to um, strengthen the exercise of human rights. So thank you. Thank you, Valeria, that's great. So we're actually doing really well for time. I'm really happy about that. So I would like to open it up to all of you to talk with each other, to ask your questions, and I will moderate as best as I can. Does anybody out there have any questions? We're all feeling pretty good about AI in here, apparently. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was uh, uh, hearing that, uh, yes, this is the report, and now read it, and let's come together in a year's time. Um, I was wondering um, why there is no effort, or maybe I ignore it, 
uh, to create a dynamic coalition which deals with artificial intelligence and its challenges. I was involved at the time in creating the dynamic coalition on internet rights and principles, and I think over the years a lot of good work has been done in that context. Here I can see that there is a lot of capable people who maybe would like to continue their work uh, during the sessions. And therefore my question is, is there such an initiative already? And if not, uh, should it be? I think it's a great idea, obviously. I think there has been some attempts to address these and other issues, but I think that's the, also the, the beauty of a process that is open, such as the IGF, to be able to propose um, the creation of and using the structures that the IGF is providing to actually address one issue. But maybe Andrea can help us to <laughs> address. There isn't. Yes. And there was a best practice forum on artificial intelligence and Internet of Things, but that's different. I think Wolfgang is um, correct to point to that being a gap, and if there's an interest in that, then form a dynamic coalition <laughs> and make it work really, really well. Does anybody else have another question, comment? And, and, and to all the authors, but when you were looking at, 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 at policy interventions and, and the, the required policy and regulatory interventions, where do you think they need to come from? Do they need to be nationally driven? Is there a need for global standards? Um, where, where does one start this process of creating a, 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 a policy and regulatory environment that, that, that can ensure that, that, that the concerns that have been identified are addressed? Is, so just, just, or is it an industry? Is it, is it working, you know, do you focus on, on regulating industry? So I just want to get a sense of where you think the leverage is. Where do we start with our interventions? Thanks, Henriette. I think we have, uh, Alex, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just one sentence. I would say it's quite frustrating for people who've been involved in ICT policy, ICT development for like decades. Suddenly AI comes, it's hypey now. There's a thing called the AI effect in like a year or two. We're just going to call it computing or ICTs. So let's actually look at national legislations and see where, what's there, see where we can build capacity and also look at international law. And yeah, it definitely has to be regulated as AI in certain contexts, but let's not reinvent the wheel and let's not lose what we've built. Did you want to speak here? Thank you. And we had uh, somebody else wanted to, yes, go ahead. I just want to share with you an, an experience at the European level. Um, there has been uh, regulation uh, that has been decided at the EU level on copyright, that is very controversial, as you know, but it's been decided. And one country decided to immediately apply it, and one platform decided not to obey to the law. Simply they said, okay, we don't agree with that. If you want us to apply this law, then we will disconnect all the media that will ask to apply the law. So at least you need a regional level to be enough big to reply to the kind of retaliation that you, can, you are exposed when you do regulation. Thanks, Giacomo. I think we've got Joanna, Kurkan, and Daniel that I see. Sure. Henriette, hello. Uh, difficult question, but uh, I, the answer, I think, is multi-layered, but just to think about some cases, like for, for the case that we analyzed, it's a project that was uh, done uh, with Microsoft, and that's exactly why it's being exported to the region. So um, going directly to the companies or even to who is funding those projects, like the 
Inter-American Bank of Development is now uh, discussing, like I'm part of a working group in there, where we are discussing like what do you need to consider for not funding a particular project on AI. Um, and for me now in Brazil, it's gonna be very hard to push against some projects on AI because our government it's far right, so anything on facial recognition doesn't matter our argument, our rationale, uh, they're gonna be pro-imprisonment, pro-discrimination, so sometimes like the national level of course is important and we need to have our regulations, but uh, putting pressure in the companies that are bringing those technologies and um, through the international scenario, I think it's important. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. So in terms of uh, legislating the, or regulating the AI field, coming from Turkey, for me, it is a huge threat to see any national government in charge of its own uh, AI implementation and seeing that uh, our government in Turkey is preparing to nationalize the digital space uh, with inside Turkey, this is bringing up a lot of uh, risk points and red alerts uh, for me personally. So in that aspect, no government, uh, including the best governments, uh, should be trusted with uh, any such legislation alone. And then uh, for several years, uh, for over a decade, it has been argued that multi-stakeholder policy is uh, working for its way. So bringing in government officials, uh, private sector, and then civil society, etc., all these uh, different groups. But even then, the governments can create their cronies. They can create pro-government associations and NGOs. So they can claim to be multi-stakeholder, but will this be pluralistic enough? So uh, I do not have a solution. But I see a lot of red flags uh, popping up everywhere. That's great. Uh, we have Daniel, and then I think there's a question on the side. Uh, thanks, Andrea, for the question and, uh, and the comment earlier. So speaking from a Global South, in particular, uh, Ugandan perspective, I think it's also much layered and even more complex. Uh, because first, we must assume that we are not uh, operating under mature kind of democratic systems, and also not uh, operating under guaranteed human rights frameworks. A quick point of reference. So the deployment of facial recognition uh, in Kampala, which is the capital city of Uganda, coincided the passage of the data protection and privacy law. So how do you enable facial recognition then also pass something that's there to guarantee the rights? And yet, effectively, we're seeing uh, the movement of, of the government to nationalize and centralize the internet but then also clamping hard on dissent. So uh, my, my proposal would be in this case, again, not entirely leaving this to government because they found the loopholes anyway, but to maybe bind them into a bit of regional or even you know, continent specific kind of laws that, are, that, that, that not only offer the, 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 the benchmarks, but also ca uh, kind of can be applied in the specific context. Thank you. Thank you. And we had a question. Yes, go ahead. If you wouldn't mind just stepping up to a microphone. There we go. Oh. Thanks. No, it's, just, it's not a question, just a response to Henriette. Uh, from my own observation and from the research that I carried out even in this project, what I found out is that uh, the national contest remain the basic sovereign entities if we are talking about actual implementation of these laws. So why regional or global frameworks are critical in terms of having a harmonized system that can engender uh, the implementation of these frameworks, the national still remains the basic units because if there are no national laws or regulatory principles in place already, there won't be that capacity and there won't be any instrument that you can even use to say, okay, this is what we have and so how can we harmonize together uh, to, to have a more robust uh, implementation capacity across the transnational boundaries. So it remains basic that we should start at the national level and then we can progress 
to harmonize at regional or global levels. But without that, uh, it will lack the foundational structures for actual implementation. And then for a, uh, an institutional framework that looks promising based on the research I've carried out is the co-regulatory model. Uh, by that, you are, you are not just leaving the burden of developing standards and technical principles to the government or the policy echelon that lack that capacity. But you can rely on the civil society, integrated with the technical community, integrated with the private sector, to form that technical basis for making standard, standards and principles with regards to these technical developments. But this must be based on the legislations and the policy frameworks that are driven by the governments. And so in such a way, you have that co-regulatory framework that can work. It makes it easier for implementation if these standards are developed by those who are regulated, but also does not leave them to the whims and, capri and caprices of self-regulation self if the government laws and policies are used to bear them up in a proper foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other comments? Uh, I see one at the back and one at the side here. Go ahead. Uh, Anupam Guha, Center for Policy Studies, IIT Bombay, India. I'm an AI policy person. So uh, a bit of a, a bit of a contradiction we are hearing about uh, national sovereignty versus rights, but like one kind of rights that often get uh, sort of erased in these conversations is the right of equity. So what we are seeing with transnational AI systems and value chains is that there has been a steady change in how labor and work operates especially in countries of Global South. And what we are seeing are new forms of precariat work which are uh, now emerging in uh, certain economies and there is not a lot of conversation around capital, wealth flows, etc. There is another aspect to this, this kind of extractivism, which is that um, AI systems and AI paraphernalia are often, uh, they require metals and materials which are often extracted in the literal sense from the global south as well and that is a conversation also we have not had in this room and uh, so i mean my concern is capital and ultimately uh, we have to uh, like if you want any kind of equity for the global south you have to challenge capital and you can't do that um, purely on standards you have to develop regulations which operate in and across nations thank you thank you we had a question here I was going to highlight almost the same thing. Um, uh, I think it's really important that we start discussing how these technologies are going to continue to generate concentration of wealth and power in certain places, extracting it from others, and how it's creating and going to continue to create challenges for different countries that need money to tackle them and that money normally it's gathered through taxes and there's also all these problems of the global tax evasion. So all these things are really interrelated and require both. I mean, I, I don't think, I think the discussion shouldn't be national, international, regional. All of them are needed. Uh, uh, but I think this is a problem that we need to become aware and participate more in, in a multi-stakeholder approach because decisions are being made about how this wealth is, uh, not shared uh, and that impacts in a very strong way how rights are impacted and the ability of governments to tackle the problems uh, ar uh, that will arise and con are arising from this inequality and this uh, concentration of wealth and power. We've got one over here and then one on the side here. Go ahead. I just uh, want, on, want to add on to the points about, you know, how do we guarantee human rights in the context of AI. I understand that very understandably there is a distrust of state overreach when it comes to state using new AI systems. But unfortunately, we haven't found a way around or outside of the nation state to guarantee rights, right? Like who will be a guarantor of rights? And there I also want to point 
right now to a process that's happening in the United Nations, which is the negotiations on the binding treaty on transnational corporations. And I think it would be very important for digital rights advocates to also be part of that process and feed into specific uh, uh, recommendations about what are the areas where we need to hold the big tech companies and the new platform companies to account and what are some very specific provisions in this regard that we should be asking for. So we also need to connect to that, I think. Very nice, thank you. Uh, Florencia, you had something? I, I also want to mention that uh, the issue uh, also has a, a capillary level uh, uh, when talking about, for example, uh, the, the right of labor, that uh, is the right with which we are working in the report. We are talking about uh, the, the, the apply of uh, this reflection in every private sector. So uh, there is every private uh, actor in every field of work that um, also is related with this discussion. So there we, uh, can also issue this this uh, uh, this aspect. Thank you. Were there any other hands in the room that I'm missing? Great. So at this point, oh, am I missing someone? Do we have a remote question? We have a remote question and answer. <laughs> so, uh, the question was about gender bias at design level of artificial intelligence, and the editor, Alan, who is also online, answered that there are several examples on the book, uh, all at design level, at uh, the data used to train artificial intelligence as well, and he pointed us to the Poland example. Thanks, Rox, that's great. So, uh, at this time, I would like to invite Vidushi Marda to make a few uh, comments. So, as I said, Vidushi is with Article 19. She also wrote the introductory chapter to the thematic reports, as well as co-writing a chapter on India. Vidushi, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think we have been working on artificial intelligence at Article 19 for about three years now, very sustained and specific engagement. And one of the biggest problems or shortcomings that we found in the field was that, firstly, all the governance was top down. So there were very high level frameworks that spoke about ethics and that spoke about regulation and human rights. So it was completely top down. And also that the people in the room were almost always from the US or from Europe Europe, and uh, we have been asked at many points what the Asian perspective is and what the African perspective on a certain question is. Um, and while there are great case studies from, you know, from the US and UK and Europe um, about the uses and dangers of these technologies, it was always assumed that this learning can be extrapolated onto entire continents. And this assumption that the global south is one thing or it's a monolithic thing or that you know, we can apply lessons from one part of the world um, in a blanket fashion to the other or that we should look at economies of scale with new technologies and make the business case for these things stronger was a huge problem for us. Um, and I think what Gizwatch does perfectly is sort of demonstrate that firstly, we needed to be bottom up. We need to ground our understanding of what these systems are in social contexts and realities within which they function. Um, and I think having, having a book like this is not just about we found this research, it's also like a toolkit, right? So the next time any of us go to a meeting where we're talking about ethical frameworks, or we're talking about regulation, or we're talking about the actual impact of a certain type of technology, we have a number of reports that are grounded in reality from experts in that region. And I think that is what um, this, this area of work desperately needs, and this is what um, this edition does. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's been fantastic working with APC, and at this point, I'd also like to thank uh, the team at APC for bringing together this kind of really rich experience and expertise into one room, because it's incredibly rare. Um, and it's incredibly difficult to do, because there's so much to say and there's not enough deliberate attempts to understand realities on the ground. Um, and yeah, thank you, thank you so much. It's been fantastic. Thanks, Vidushi.
That's fantastic. So on that note, I'd like to turn it over to chat for some closing remarks from APC. So I think the first people to thank are the authors. We've had, over the years, many, many authors. And over the years also, we, some, some of you have written several times in, um, for Gizwatch, and we want to continue that. Um, so these, the authors are a community as well. So it's not only writing once, it's also creating that community that can in fact reflect together collectively on the very critical issues that we face. Now the, well, the, secondly, I wanna thank also, I don't know if there, I see the partners are still here, but I'd like to thank them for their support, um, for continuously supporting the, this publication. And the million dollar question is that, will we, what's the topic for next year? <laughs> we, we don't know that, but we are, <laughs> we don't know that yet, but you're welcome, please. If you have an idea, if there is any, you know, uh, really pressing critical issue that you feel that the community needs, then please come to us. We will have discussions about it. Um, the other, I, I, that's one, but before that also, I, I just also want to say to uh, um, second what people have said, that this is not, it doesn't finish here, the publication, yeah? I hope that we will bring it back, we will use it, and we want to hear from you about how it's used, because it's also for us a learning, you know, this is also how we learn, so that we can make it a more effective advocacy tool. And of course, I'd like to thank, this is like a love fest here, going on here, but thank you for Article 19, and thank you to also to the APC team and to everyone who contributed to this, uh, to this edition. And lastly, we, we are having a party tonight. <laughs> if, if you haven't been to an APC party before, then come tonight. Yeah, and it's, you will find it at that out. Does anybody know where it is happening? And what time? At our booth, that's right. This is a way to get you to our booth. Come to our booth, you'll find out where to party tonight. No work, we promise, just fun.
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a vast room. Hi, down there. How are you doing? Um, <laughs> if you want to come up the front, that's absolutely fine, um, because we can sort of huddle together a little bit. Uh, if you're more comfortable being an outlier, that's also fine, too. Um, you are in the uh, Dynamic Coalition on Public Access in Libraries session. Uh, my name is Stuart Hamilton, and I'm from um, the Irish Local Government Management Agency, where I head the library's development team. Um, this afternoon, we've got uh, a session for you which is going to look at policy. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to explain a little bit more, but we're going to trace the line between policy and practice when it comes to public access and the role that libraries can play, particularly in connecting people and getting more people online but uh, also in, in upskilling and, uh, and letting them have access to new services. Um, this is the, I think I worked it out, this is the eighth time that the Dynamic Coalition has, has met. We formed in uh, Nairobi in 2011, and I was reflecting that a lot's actually happened since 2011. Um, a lot of good, a lot of bad on the internet, lots more people online, obviously, uh, but uh, uh, maybe a, a little bit more concern about the sort of online environment that people are coming into. And then, of course, in the middle of that, we have the Sustainable Development Goals, and we've got a brand new development framework for the world, and that's something we'll be touching on today. But I did think, when I was looking at that time frame, that actually in the last eight years, public access has, has never stopped being vital. All through that time, the need for people to be able to access the internet um, in remote rural areas or for people that don't have the economic means to have a, a really highly charged cell phone Places like libraries and other public access points are absolutely crucial. So as I said, today we'll talk about policy and the impact of using public access as a policy tool. The intention is to have a discussion on how public access, particularly through libraries, is included in national connectivity strategies, the sorts of things that support digital inclusion, um, and then as part of that to showcase a few different examples of what's happening around the world when government support turns policy into successful projects. Um, so the aim here would be to sort of inform those of you who are interested in this uh, and our broader community um, about where we're at in this sort of stage um, and then maybe have a, a bit of a discussion, a bit of a reflection on what more governments and other stakeholders can do to use some of these strategies to get closer to the SDGs. I'm going to facilitate the session. Um, we've got four speakers um, who I'm very pleased to have with us, and I'll introduce them when it's, when it's time. They're each going to make a short intervention on, on our topic. Um, we're going to hear about things about national development policies, broadband plans, the state of affordable access to the internet, and how investment in public access can support that. And then we'll hear about the impact of policy implementation on the ground in Uganda and Kenya, uh, and what happens when you make these investments and, and how they play out. Um, as I say, our speakers are great experts with great knowledge. And uh, those of you here, I really would like to encourage to, to, to get involved when the time comes. Um, the IGF is about dialogue. Uh, and uh, I hope that you'll have a, a few questions to test them on uh, so that I don't end up having to ask all the difficult ones I've kept in reserve for them at the end. Um, it does fall to me to make the first sort of intervention aside from that introduction, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why we think public access in libraries is actually a strategic issue for the IGF to consider even eight years after we started. We formed the Dynamic Coalition with a simple premise, that public libraries can offer innovative services based on free public access to the internet, and by doing that, make a positive change in their communities with regards to areas like health, agriculture, employment, education, and marginalized groups. And within the IGF, we've actually been quite productive. And if you weren't aware, we've produced uh, principles on public access. And in fact, in front of you on the tables, we've got a little handout that has a few things that give a bit of background on our, on our framing of public access. We've contributed to the intercessional work on the policy options for connecting and enabling the next billions. Uh, we've presented case studies of libraries providing internet connectivity to achieve the SDGs. And we've developed something called the Public Access Toolkit, which outlines the key policy elements and steps that you could use to create this sort of policy environment for increasing access. And we've used that with our own community to help library associations, who are key stakeholders for us, engage in advocacy at national levels. 
We've also participated and have participants from the Partnership for Public Access, or P4PA, where we formed partnerships with organisations and institutions from different sectors, so across the private sector, other parts of civil society. And some of the P4PA activities include a project in Tunisia focused on digital literacy and coding, uh, and then also contributions to the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation. So that's just to give you some background that if you do go to where we live on the IGF web pages, if you, if you have a look there, you'll find product from us. And we're always asking ourselves within this environment a very simple question. Um, are the stakeholders at the IGF utilising public libraries to the best of their ability? Why do we ask that? Because we have over 400,000 public libraries worldwide. And I don't think there's another stakeholder within the UN conversations, maybe with the exception of the post offices, mm -hmm. that actually have f over 400,000 physical space points all over the world that can be utilised to increase access. So if you think about that, a lot of our discussions concern online services, but here we're talking about physical locations staffed by over 600,000 library workers. So a combination of space and expertise makes us a pretty unique stakeholder within the, uh, the uh, IGF environment. So are we actually utilising this? Um, and we're asking this question because we believe that the policies that are often discussed within the UN, the IGF, need to actually reach down and impact at a local level or else basically they're just words on a piece of paper. And with libraries, you're going to get a package that will bring you right into the community. We're community hubs, we're on the ground. We're sustainable institutions, we're publicly funded. We can deliver policy objectives in that we're policy partners, and in fact we're quite promiscuous in that we generally tend to partner with anybody that can actually make a project happen for the good of the people in the community. And we can reach the parts of the community that other actors can't. We have a specific focus on marginalised groups. Um, we can we can work with young people, children, adults, we can look at gender imbalances, we can actually really target where we want to work. And we can deliver on all of these fronts, which is why I think we can deliver to nearly all of the sustainable development goals. And much in the same way as if you go into a library, I can probably pull you out a book on any subject that you desire, I can probably show you a program somewhere in the world right now that's working on some part of the SDGs. So for all of these reasons, we see a very strong rationale for including libraries in national development strategies and for public access to the internet to be considered a strategic issue. And then that's why we're looking here at a key element of that, and that's broadband. That's the role that broadband can take, or can play rather, in taking our actions to the next level. Basically because all the cool things we do are amplified by better connectivity. And I know this through my work in Ireland, where the government has invested heavily in the public library sector in recent years. All of the libraries are connected to the internet. And the programs that the government wants to achieve, there's three main ones that we work with. One is around reading and literacy, called Right to Read. One is about business and employment, it's called Work Matters. And the other one is around health and well-being, it's called Healthy Island at Your Library. All of these are delivered by the libraries as part of a bigger plan that the government has. So we're sitting within a government policy framework and we're supported to do that and we're supported to upskill our staff with government resources. So we are benefiting through that government connection but also the way that the government is now going to invest in high-speed broadband rollout across the country. It's not the case in every country that the library is lucky enough to be connected to these conversations but when they are, you can make the magic happen and we're going to hear some examples of that as we move through. It's not just Ireland that has this. We've got real live people who are working on this, but throughout our network, we can see real impact when you get going properly here. Um, since 2014, we have something called a Public Library Innovation Program, which is run by an organization who's part of the Dynamic Coalition, a founding member called Electronic Information for Libraries. They trained 1,000 librarians in Ghana, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Zambia, and Namibia, and off the back of that, They've trained half a million library users in how to use the internet, how to understand emerging digital skills, and how to develop community services. We've seen libraries in the Philippines connect to government educational programs, uh, an inclusion initiative called Tech4Ed 
saw the Philippine Employment Administration work with the library community there to help more than 10,000 people who work in the diaspora abroad um, renew online applications to send money back to their families. And then in Guatemala, there's a library that serves 14,000 people from indigenous communities that's helped them set up businesses around basket weaving and local arts and crafts. So basically, the outcome of projects that connect government policy and funding and resourcing with public libraries are basically individuals and communities who are more ready to deal with digital challenges and ultimately, in many cases, end up with better education or, in fact, more money in their pocket through the opportunities that come out. So with all this in mind, I thought today's session, we thought that we would have a look at who else around the world is implementing some of these options around policies in national broadband and working towards digital inclusion through libraries. And we're going to do this by starting with a review of a new piece of research which has been carried out by the teams at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, or IFLA, and IFL, who I've already mentioned, which compares how national broadband plans engage and use libraries and then highlight the different roles that policymakers see for us. Um, once we've done that, our three invited speakers will bring their perspectives to the table and, as I said, share experience of some of the government programs which have looked to realise the potential that I've mentioned. After each intervention, I, we can go straight into some questions about what you've just heard or we can save our questions for the end. Um, I don't know if we have any remote participants, but if people are with us online, then I welcome them and we'll be taking questions if the, the, the people at the back just give me a wave, then I'll, I'll basically bring in our remote participants. So our first panelist is Valencia Trezvenikova, which is the best I can do at this stage. Um, Valencia is the Policy and Research Officer at the International Federation of Library Associations Institutions. She has a background in public administration, so she's been thrown out of that straight into the library world at IFLA in The Hague. And right now she's working on internet governance and digital matters from the library sector's perspective. And today she's going to introduce us to the research which underpins this session, which we're going to be able to share with you very soon, which is the recent analysis of libraries in national broadband plans. Valencia, over to you. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you for everyone to, for joining us here today. So. Uh, let me start with the following. Uh, a recently released State of Broadband 2019 report includes the following recommendation. Include public access in places such as libraries, international broadband plans, and universal access strategies. This recommendation is largely intended to facilitate affordability, so to overcome cost barriers of either internet services or access devices, but as Stuart has pointed out, there are other benefits to public access, particularly public access in libraries. And in fact, in light of this potential, there are already over 30 countries that reference libraries in their national broadband plans and policies. And as we move forward, it is useful to see how libraries have already been included in broadband plans and strategies to this day. Such an overview can reveal the scope and the range of roles that libraries can play in connectivity strategies, as well as the type of support they may need to do so. This has been the focus of the DCPAL project this year, comparing how different national broadband policies implicate and engage libraries. We took the broadbandpolicy.org tool as a starting point. It allows for a keyword search of broadband policy documents in over 92 countries, and this allowed us to get an, an initial list of countries, just over 30. Combining that with the list of broadband policies from the State of Broadband 2019 report, uh, we ended up with a list of policy documents to analyze and go through. So across all of these policy documents, where do libraries come in? The first thing we have noticed is that when it comes to broadband strategies, libraries frequently come into play in several distinct contexts. The first one is obviously public access. Examples of policies that frame libraries in light of public access include, for example, Nigeria or Botswana. Uh, this is mentioned as a remedy for digital divides, whether on an individual level in terms of affordability or supporting broader vulnerable groups, the unemployed people, low-income families, and so on and so forth. Uh, as an additional function, uh, public access in places such as libraries have been pointed out to facilitate access to e-government services, online public services, or facilitate participation in online digital economy. Uh, 
The second context is digital literacy and ICT skills. Policy documents in Hungary or Turkey, for example, mention libraries in this context. Uh, there are different models here, either training the trainers and helping librarians later help their uh, users uh, make use of computers, or even simply using libraries as venues for other actors to carry out literacy initiatives. The third context is supporting educational institutions. Several broadband plans refer to libraries with an emphasis on broader educational goals. This ranges from e-learning opportunities or digitizing educational materials or even establishing electronic libraries in existing academic institutions. Examples of broadband policies that bring forward the educational angle include, for instance, Mauritius or Cameroon. And finally, the last context is heritage digitization and consequent local content creation. There are broadband strategies that highlight the role of libraries in creating local content through digitization, uh, for example, Mali or Switzerland. And this can be particularly important for non-English speaking countries. We have broadband plans in both Portugal or Turkey highlight the need to create content in local languages. Point two is the focus of the policy intervention. What does the policy aim to do to allow libraries to fulfill those roles? In many cases, uh, the aim is to improve library connectivity, and this can entail different elements, whether it is connecting libraries to broadband infrastructure, uh, which is spelled out, for instance, in Jamaica, Egypt, or Mauritius. And this can also include electricity supply, by the way. Uh, plants in both Kenya and Botswana point out that for library connectivity, electricity is crucial. Uh, alongside connectivity infrastructure, several broadband plans seek to address the ongoing costs of internet subscriptions. Uh, for example, in the United States or, again, Mauritius. Um, some broadband plans focus on providing computers or connectivity hardware or communication technologies to libraries, such as those in Nigeria, Jamaica, or Bangladesh. And finally, in rare cases, uh, the need to equip library staff with necessary ICT skills is also mentioned, Bulgaria being one example that we have come across. And for the policy's focus on digitization, the focus has often been broadly defined in terms of either digitization targets, organizing or coordinating digitization activities, or creating digital platforms or e-libraries. So that is the what. And then there is the how. How do we achieve those things and how do we help library connectivity? Well, some policies envision interventions that target libraries at large. Uh, along such broad interventions are those spelled out in the plans in Bahamas or Bangladesh. Uh, they often include financial mechanisms such as connectivity subsidies or technology procurement for libraries. These are not uncommon. Uh, in other cases, uh, there is the public access point model. So as a starting point, we take not the need to connect a separate type of institutions at large, but rather the need for a given community to be connected. And then in those areas, they select certain anchor institutions that will be connected and provided an entire package, software, uh, hardware, connectivity, infrastructure. And libraries often feature in those uh, projects, select libraries are often chosen as fitting well for these purposes. Uh, frequently, or well, not frequently, but in some cases, a universal service access fund has been mentioned as a way to implement those activities. And another mechanism frequently mentioned was public-private uh, partnerships. Canada's Connect to Innovate program, for example, envisions broadband rollout initiatives that are carried out jointly with the private sector. And in other plans, the approaches to achieving digitization uh, goals at times relied on software instruments, such as coordinating activities or adopting interoperable formats and open standards, for instance, in Turkey or in Portugal, respectively. And that was the how. Looking over the entire set, a few final remarks can be made. Most country policies in the set we have examined so far include more than one policy target, more than one instrument, so hopefully this potentially reflects an understanding that library connectivity needs are multifaceted. And this can also reflect the understanding that libraries can play more than one role in connectivity and broadband strategies in a given nation. Uh, and different libraries can come into play. In many cases, uh, the policy was targeting libraries at large or in frequent uh, cases, public libraries. But we also have references to national libraries, academic or even school libraries. And based on the inclusion of various policy documents in the policies we've examined so far, several broad types of approaches can be uh, suggested. First one is policies that improve connectivity of all or most libraries in the country. Uh, a subcategory of that would be policies that involve a universal service fund. 
A second type would be public access point type projects, where libraries are one of the anchor institutions chosen to play a role in community connectivity. Uh, an interesting category to look at would be the projects and policies that include digital literacy initiatives, whether targeting libraries at large or in libraries among other institutions. And finally, we have digitization initiatives and other software instruments. So these categories reflect the most common ways libraries are engaged in broadband plans and strategies. And looking at these allows us to reflect on how libraries have already been included in broadband plans and strategies, the scope of activities they can carry out, and the kind of support they need to be able to fulfill those roles. Thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious, how long, did it, how long did it take to do the piece of research? I mean, can you talk a little bit about the methodology and how many, you mentioned there's about 30 plans involved. I mean, what's the geographical spread? Uh, absolutely. We have been working on this project uh, on and off, uh, not full time, s roughly since July uh, of this year. Uh, and at the moment, I believe we have a set of 32 countries. They are the countries and the documents that we have analyzed are listed in the annex of the draft that has been made available right before the session, which can be reached at the uh, email, uh, at the web address that uh, is included in the leaflets. Uh, and your other question was about methodology. Yes, yeah, so you were, you were, what were you examining to, to, what was the corpus you were examining to find the plans? Absolutely, so uh, as a starting point, we take a list of countries from the broadbandpolicy.org uh, tool, which is just allows for a keyword search among a list of uploaded policy documents. Then having a list of countries, we have looked at what has been classified as their formal broadband policy by the Broadband Commission. And plus, if uh, a document that is cited in the broadbandpolicy.org has not been included in the set, if it's still a relevant document that we still included it in the set. And then we scan the documents for mentions of library, libraries, public access, uh, as well as examples of other anchor institutions like schools or universities to make sure that we're not missing out uh, policies that are targeted at a large, uh, large variety of anchor institutions. Anybody have any quick comments or questions from, from what we've heard there from Valencia? Just immediate? Okay. Okay, well, Nena, it looks like you're going to get the first chance to, to comment then. Um, Nena, no, I can, uh, how do I say your second name? Just say Nena. Nena uh, <laughs> is uh, the chief web advocate at the World Wide Web Foundation. Uh, and she's also been working on something which I'm sure many of us have seen uh, this week in the news, which is the contract for the web. Um, what we've asked her to talk about today uh, is really to comment on this sort of situation overall, but really to talk about libraries um, and public access and affordability strategies, which is something I know you've been working on in recent years. So the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I noticed that the ascenseur, the lift was not working. So if you are here, it means you took the staircase. Congratulations. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. I think I've spoken a whole lot about the contract for the web, which uh, Tim Berners-Lee launched uh, on Monday, and had, we've been talking about it. However, I want to begin on a personal note. I got connected to the internet early in 1998, 1999, I was a student and I was doing postgraduate uh, studies and also working with the African Development Bank. And my most reliable connection was at the university library. <laughs> so I'm grateful for that. When I say my name is Nenna, I come from the internet. I want to be grateful to the library uh, society and organization. And on behalf of the Alliance for Affordable Internet, of which you remember, I also want to uh, give a shout out to librarians and libraries across the world for, for being the last mile for millions of people across the world out there. I want to talk a bit more about the things that affect inclusion. The, the first is about rights, about the, the, the policy framing for inclusion. I had spoken earlier uh, on the high-level panel about REACT, about rights, education, access, um, 
content and targets. Now, in most places, libraries are the most political organizations. And so we accept them, um, we, we know them, we trust them. And this is very important for new digital natives. People who are coming into the digital world are not afraid to go to libraries because this is where analog and digital come together. It's, it's, it's a good maternity to be born into the digital world. I, I'm trying to be very, very simple with my language because I know there are people online I have invited to listen to this. So I'll be speaking to you as if you don't know anything about big IGF technology and terminology. So the first thing is that libraries are a very good place for people to migrate from analog to digital. The second is the community spirit of the library. Sometimes these things, we think digital is about technology. It has never been about technology. It has been about how people use technology. You, how many of you still remember your library days? How many of you, Stuart, did you give your girlfriend uh, a rendezvous at the library? Absolutely. Because no parent of any girl will object to you going to the library. <laughs> That's where we, things happened. So libraries have a community spirit and it's a good place for people to meet. And this is what we might be missing as we go more broadband and more 5G and more personalized. The other thing that sometimes we forget that we try to bring to the table in policy issues is gender responsiveness. Um, we worry about artificial intelligence, we worry about the digital divide, the gender digital divide, but libraries are, the, are one of the most gender responsive areas. They are open, they are welcoming to all genders. I want to come back on some of the work we've done on universal access funds. Universal access funds, we've had them. We, they were supposed to extend access to the last mile to the uh, to populations that were underserved. And the study that we did at the World Wide Web Foundation shows that most of the funds are lying there idle and not being used. And we believe that these are places that universal access funds need to, to serve. I want to come back to meaningful connectivity. I think we did talk about it uh, because for, for us to be really inclusive, we need, um, we have said speed of the connectivity, broadband speed. Uh, we, we need reliable connectivity and uninterrupted connectivity. And we also need affordability and devices that are uh, capable of giving us that um, capacity that we need. Now, what I want to uh, say here is that while we are struggling, while we are working to connect the other half of the world, while we are waiting for everybody to be fully equipped, to be fully educated, to be fully compliant, to be fully 5G or 4G, libraries are here for us. And um, we actually have one of our partners from Universal Access Fund in Bene who would have wanted to be in this, uh, in this room. But the, the point is post offices and libraries are community centers de facto community centers. These are de facto gender responsive spaces. These are de facto community spaces. These are de facto places where analog can easily transform into digital. And I want to end with something. I know you're sitting here in Berlin and most of you are from the global north. Technology still scares people. Technology still scares women. The good thing about being in a library environment is that there is always help. You don't call it help desk. You don't use those big computer names. But there is always someone who is willing to help you. And this is what many people need, whether it, it is in, sec in digital security, whether it is in skills, whether it is being able to carry your voice as a person, there is always help at the library. I, I'm bringing in all of these 
uh, because when we talk about ICT policy, people think we are talking big technology. I want you to begin to rethink the way you see libraries and their role. And I'm speaking to you as IFLA as well. Don't just see it as books and technology. See it as a means of getting people from where we are to where we want to be. And if it is the digital home of people, if this is the maternity where digital citizens are being given birth to, what else are we looking for? Is that not the reason we came here? I like that very much. I'm used to hearing a lot in the advocacy work I do that, that libraries are not just books because people then want to talk about how libraries are actually technology. I like the idea that now I can say, well, libraries are not just books and technology. Yeah, they are a means that. of taking us where we need to go. I have a very quick follow-up question, which um, it was about the, the research that you've done into the universal access funds, mm -hmm. and you said that a lot of them are lying dormant. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll ask this question now because I think it will frame some of the, the conversation we'll go on to have. Why are they lying dormant? I'm curious. I'm not going to prevent you from downloading that report and reading it by yourself, but most of these are policy related. And um, one of the things that A4AI is doing is actually helping countries um, redraft their universal access fund policies, which is what we've done in Mozambique, and we hope to be doing, uh, we're already doing in Benin Republic. Now, if you recall, universal access funds uh, were, were put in place years ago when we were talking about telecommunications, they were brought from telecommunications tax. If you recall in the MDGs, we, di we didn't even have ICT in the mention. And then we've moved to SDGs, and we still don't have huge um, technology mention. Technology is mostly found in Go 9 and Go 5. You see where we're coming in from the digital gender divide. So that is how we can slip it in. So you, you find countries who don't have a clear view about where this funding should go. And by the time you do all the political battles, the years are gone. Um, if, you, if you allow me, I will mention the case of, of Brazil, for instance, where the, it's gone to court and the Supreme Court has just frozen the funds. I was like, you hold on until we see clearly. So we have a bit of these funds that are in court. Some are for policy reasons, some are planification. So those are some of the reasons and other reasons, but I'm not going to tell you all. Please go to A4AI, A4AI. A, the letter, well, the, the number four, A4AI.org. Read, first of all, the affordability report, and read our report on universal access funds. Thanks, I think that's kind of interesting, what you raised there about um, the lack of mentions to ICT and internet access in the actual targets of the SDGs mm -hmm. themselves, it's interesting to think that that might be causing some confusion as to where to allocate sort of funds. I think that's, that's something I might come back and pick up on. But before we do that, um, I'm going to move on to our next speaker. So Nena, myself, we've often worked in that sort of big, broader policy environment. We've heard about research into some of these policies. Um, our last two speakers are actually kind of working to implement those policies and as such I think it's an extremely interesting angle to the discussion we're, we're having today. Uh, Paul Kiyaj is joining us from Kenya where he works um, in, with the Universal Service Funds um, and he's working at the Communications Authority in Kenya. Uh, Paul, do we need to get your slides set up whilst I introduce you or are you in good shape? If, could we get the PowerPoint? Perfect. Excellent. So Paul's got nearly 20 years of experience working in monitoring and evaluation and project management. Um, and the presently, as I say, he's the Assistant Director at the Universal Service Fund at the Communications Authority of Kenya, where he's providing strategic leadership in the development and implementation of USF projects. And he's going to be talking to us today about the Communication Authority's strategic partnership with the Kenya National Library Service to support ICT integration in library services in the country. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Stuart. Uh, as been said, my name is Paul Kiage. I work for Communications Authority of Kenya, which is the regulatory agency in charge of licensing of telecommunication, broadcasting, and postal and courier service providers in Kenya. In addition to that, the authority is also in charge of uh, uh, supporting the implementation of universal access projects in Kenya 
of which I'm here to present to you what we have done uh, with the Kenya National Library Services. Uh, thank you. So I'll take you through my slides. Uh, the first one being uh, where USF is placed within the authority. And uh, the authority has three strategic objectives of which the Universal Service Fund sits under uh, access and market development with the sole objective of uh, supporting uh, widespread access to ICT services in Kenya. And uh, that is what we are responsible for. And it is the one shaded in red in the, on the slide. The next one uh, is the intervention that has been done by the authority through strategic partnership with the Kenya National Library Service. It started way back in 2012, uh, where we entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Kenya National Library Service. First of all, to start on a pilot basis, uh, supporting 10 uh, libraries. And later on, this was scaled up to cover all the libraries in Kenya. And uh, the partnership entailed supporting ICT integration, and mainly this in, uh, involved uh, supporting the installation of LAN cabling in all the libraries in Kenya, supplying co 10 computers to each of those libraries, provision of internet connectivity to the libraries, uh, support the supply of digital, uh, the card printers which enable the members to register and their cards printed. Uh, in addition, we also supported capacity building and training of librarians and uh, digitization of content within those libraries. Uh, the scope or the cost of uh, the, the support uh, is uh, to the amount of 2.1 million US dollars, uh, and that is uh, covered in those components that I, I read much earlier. Uh, and where are these libraries uh, is, uh, located in Kenya? That map shows you the spread of those libraries in the country. So we have presence across uh, most of the counties in Kenya, with a few having, say, uh, more than one library. In terms of, uh, that is just uh, the official launch of the partnership, uh, so that is the leadership of uh, the Communications Authority and the Kenya National Library Service in 2012 when this partnership was actualized. Uh, in very remote areas where we don't have connectivity to the national grid, the authority supplied solar panels to enable these libraries uh, run the computers. So this is one of the such libraries, very remote in rural areas. Uh, this is just a pictorial of uh, the, the support that the authority gave to uh, the 62 libraries in Kenya, uh, the, the, the PCs, the furniture, and the connectivity. So the, that is continuation of the pictorial support. And in terms of project achievement, uh, this project has achieved a lot in terms of the numbers. Uh, we've seen an incremental increase in the number of users within those libraries, whether uh, students or community members are utilizing these libraries to access uh, digital content, be they uh, e-government services like applying for your passport, ID, or filing tax returns within those libraries. They also get EL services, including access to e-market information where uh, the farmers go to access the prevailing market prices for their livestock or crops within those libraries. We've also seen that these libraries have been used uh, as uh, access points for the community members, uh, particularly those who are marginalized uh, and are living with disabilities. Uh, they have been able to access uh, a lot of information because we were able to get uh, appropriate assistive softwares which enable persons with disabilities to interact with technology. 
It has also attracted other strategic partners like Digital Opportunity Trust, uh, Microsoft, Intel Corporation, among many others. So uh, we've seen a lot of achievement in terms of increasing universality and accessibility uh, using these libraries. And then lastly, uh, under some of the lessons learned, we've seen that uh, when you leverage uh, on the strength of uh, partnerships, you can increase accessibility in uh, the use of ICTs. And then uh, there is a need to capacity build the library administrators to be enabled uh, to pass the same information to various people who are also visiting these libraries. Uh, we have also seen that uh, we can get better from what we do by integrating uh, ICTs into this library so that the libraries don't just serve or just, pre just avail books to the users but can also be uh, able uh, to integrate the use of ICTs within uh, those access points. Uh, then we've also seen that uh, digital technologies can be used by uh, persons with disabilities to be able to change their lives. So with those few remarks, I say thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I have a quick kind of follow-up question, actually, because okay. there's, there's good stuff there about the, the impact of the project. Um, I wondered, in some ways, um, why did the government do it? So what were the, the reasons what did it take to get the project off the ground? I mean, who was advocating for it? Um, and, and sort of what arguments were being made that in the end made the government want to go for it? Uh, thank you so much for that question. Uh, why did the government use it? Uh, when you look around uh, the countryside, uh, this uh, library is provided uh, a good opportunity for public access to communities, students, and even government officials who are working in remote areas. So traditionally, they are known to host books. But we found that it was an opportunity to integrate ICTs into this library so that we could attract uh, more users to the libraries, as we've seen incremental increase in the number of users visiting the libraries, but more so for the government, it provided us a, as an opportunity now to fulfill our mandate of extending or increasing access to ICTs to those marginalized populations which hitherto could not access uh, ICTs. Thank you. And I noted that it, uh, it started in 2012. Is it, is it an ongoing project? Is there a commitment to, to keep funding? Uh, uh, as I said, it has attracted many more partners. So I think the project is self-sustaining, even without the government support. So it is able to run without further funding. But we've covered all the libraries in the country. It's the dream we all dream, a project that requires no more further funding <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and goes. But that, that is, it's, a, it's a very good example of what happens when the government is prepared to utilize that existing infrastructure and to go for it. And I think we're going to hear a little bit more uh, along these lines. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Emmanuel to, um, to, to speak now. Emmanuel Wiyomba is the project, management, uh, or the project manager at the Rural Communications Development Fund um, next door in uh, Uganda. Um, and today he's going to be talking about his focus work that he's been doing on broadband. Um, I read your bio, Emmanuel. You've got responsibilities I think we can all sympathize with by making your projects deliver on time within budget but at a high level of quality. Good man, you can come and work for me. Um, today we're going to be talking, or you're going to be talking about ICT public access facilities within the public libraries project that you're working on with the National Library of Uganda <coughs> and Electronic Information for Libraries. So the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Stuart. Nina mentioned that uh, several fans have are idle, the funds are not used. I wish they could pass them on to Uganda. We've got <laughs> a lot to do. We could make use of those. In Uganda, uh, 
We have close to 30 million people who are still offline, yet our population is 44 million people. So that makes about 68% of the population which is still offline. They don't have access and they are not using the internet. And we know uh, one of the reasons for this is the lack of access devices, but also because some can't afford to pay for the internet, given the economic situation of some of the people, the cost is still a bit prohibitive. The other reason is the uh, uh, lack of digital literacy skills in especially the rural areas. So the Uganda Communications Commission through the Rural Communications Development Fund, which I work for, uh, partnered with the National Libraries of Uganda in order to use the public libraries as a place where people can access internet and where people can get digital skills. Uh, in this project, we have partners like uh, the Electronic Information for Libraries, which carries out trainings for the librarians uh, to enable them to to enable them to have responsive services to the communities in which they exist. Three weeks ago, I visited the three of the libraries which we supported in the first place to find out what they are doing with the facilities we've set in place and also to know the challenges that they have. And I was uh, surprised to find that uh, they are doing everything you could imagine which you use for the internet. Uh, there are students who do research from these libraries. We've got university campuses which don't have libraries in the rural areas. So their students go to the public libraries to carry out their research and to do their coursework. Uh, there are also people who are pursuing online courses from international universities or from deeper uh, academic institutions which are not within Uganda who go to these public libraries to do their online study. I also discovered that uh, the people use the government e-services from the libraries. Recently, there was a need by the Ministry of Education to have teachers uh, register on a teacher management information system. And many of the teachers don't have personal laptops or personal computers and it's the libraries where they go to do this. People also do tax returns from the libraries, and they also do internet banking from these facilities. So the outcomes of our project include the fact that uh, we now have libraries with computers and internet access where the public can go and use these services free of charge. So this takes away the cost barrier for some of the people who are offline because of the cost. On average, you get about 35 people in each library per day. And we've had library staff trained by EFL to offer community-based library services. The public also uses these libraries to access Wi-Fi. Those who have their own devices like smartphones and laptops just have to go into the environs of the libraries to access uh, the internet through the Wi-Fi. Some of the challenges we've found in the project include unreliable electricity in these areas. The grid is not so reliable in some of these areas. Uh, 
the cost of maintaining and sustaining uh, these facilities is a bit high because currently the service is offered free of charge. Uh, the Uganda Communications Commission through the Rural Communications Development Fund is the one meeting the cost of the uh, internet bandwidth, uh, but would, would prefer to have uh, the libraries or the communities in which they exist to be the ones sustaining these facilities. There's also limited physical space uh, for these facilities. And in many cases, you find that the reading space is the one used for the computing. So where someone would want to use multimedia services, maybe make a VoIP calls through the internet, there would be an inconvenience to the other library users. Also currently, they would there is no user management software in the libraries because they will perhaps want to limit how much time uh, each user uh, is allocated because the users are many and the libraries are few. That's another challenge. There are many users, but uh, computers themselves are limited. So, um, So the way forward, uh, we are phasing this project because of limited funds. We roll out a few every year as the funds allow, and in Uganda so far, we've covered 10 libraries out of the 47 public libraries. Thank you. Thank you oh, uh, I've got a short video from the users of the <laughs> facilities. Uh, please watch to get it from their own mouth, their experience. Blessed Hope Secondary School, Nakaseke. I'm in Form 3. Uh, the reason as to why I come at Nakaseke Public Library is that at our school, we are unable to access internet due to the fact that we don't have enough computers. So I come to our library since it's a public library to access internet. I'm to message your friend that in charge of going a public library. I'm grateful to Uganda Communication Commission through Rural Communication Development Fund that enabled this library to have internet access. Indeed, this project has helped the community through various ways of accessing up-to-date information. The community has benefited quite well because when you look back and you don't have enough computers for the users to train on and also do their type setting work from and the Wi-Fi also, we can also use them to surf, to surf in our phones. And one of the things that will really benefit from here, yeah. one of them is free internet access. And with that free internet access, it's quite easy to do more research about what you spent. It helps you to communicate with other people when you want to submit your coursework. Once or if it has to be submitted online, Sometimes you also use it to read emails or the newspapers and find out what is going on. I began by appreciating UCC 
coordinating for locking computers. Actually, we are we are very happy for accessing internet services in this library. That uh, as for us users, at least uh, there is uh, an easy way of accessing internet. It has been spurred in Palsa here to access internet since we had no internet cafes. Uh, but for now, it is very cheap. We are accessing internet here. We can download. We can check on apps. Uh, we, we are so glad to use wireless internet on our phones, Wi-Fi, which has enabled us to WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, actually send mails. So actually, yeah, it's very easy to update files to friends. And also, the users actually have been able to access the registration services here. That uh, it has been simplified, free internet. It's very easy to access uh, with a higher speed. It's very easy for us to download files now. So it has been so hard. So we appreciate everything in the library. So that, that for me is, is great because it enables those of us in the room here to really actually see that, that what we're talking about when the policies that we're writing down on paper are implemented, we can see real change in the communities. And I'm struck by the, the commentary of the people in the video and why the library is so important to them because actually I hear the same words when I meet users in Irish libraries. So these are universal needs that are happening at the same time in Uganda, in Kenya, and also in the country where I'm currently working, and libraries are solving those problems. Um, before we move on to a bit of discussion, I did have the same question for you, Emmanuel. Why did the government decide to go for it? Who persuaded you, or did you come up with the idea yourself? I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued as to what made the project happen. Thank you. Oh. We knew that there was a need for public access uh, because we knew that uh, one of the challenges which is stopping some of the people from getting online is lack of access devices and also because some cannot afford. So for Synergies, uh, we needed a partner who is out there in the communities and the library was a good place to do this project. Because much as we are putting in the computers and uh, giving them the internet, they already have the physical space, mm -hmm. and already they are already open to everyone, uh, without uh, any biases, be it uh, gender or age. Because the RCDF mission is to ensure through targeted interventions that location, physical inability, gender, and cost are not barriers to access. Uh, broadband for any sector of Uganda's population. So the library is one of the partners we could uh, work with to achieve this. So I, know we do, I know we do have a, a question that's come in remotely, I think, but um, this is one of the first times when we've done one of these panels that um, we've, we've been lucky enough to have two colleagues from government, um, civil society and, and policy development, but I, you know, in terms of people that actually work in libraries, we're a little, we're a little bit light. And I understand we have a colleague from the German library sector who I've not met before who's sitting very close and paying great attention. Welcome. I wondered if you had any comments or any thoughts from the perspective of the community here. Yes, hi. Um, I don't have comments. Actually, Valencia asked me to, uh, to talk a bit about the situation in, in Germany. If you, if you want to, I can do that now or later. In this Sounds week. like comments to me. Yeah. That's why we came to Germany. We want to hear what's going on here. <laughs> okay, great. So, yes, my name is uh, Jacqueline Breitlid. I indeed work for the German Libraries Association. So, not, not within an actual library, but, but for the association. We represent uh, Germany's uh, around uh, 10,000 scientific and public uh, libraries. Um, our goal is, is, of course, to strengthen libraries so that these can uh, provide citizens with free access to, to information. Um, I'd just like to give you maybe a little insight into um, the situation in Germany and, and the sort of um, issues we work on with regard to um, digital inclusion. Um, and the three main aspects we see on that is, is libraries as a, as a venue for providing connectivity, um, secondly, um, as a place to access digital resources, and thirdly, um, as, a, as a place where users can get digital skills. So with regard um, to the issue of being a venue for providing um, 
connectivity. Actually, the picture in Germany is, is quite mixed. So um, if you look at the 80% of libraries, uh, if you look at the, the libraries that are managed on a, um, a full-time basis, uh, over 80% of those are connected to the internet. Um, so that's, that's quite a high number. But if you look at um, those libraries that are managed uh, on a part-time or on a voluntary basis and that are mostly in rural areas, actually only about 20% are connected. So the, the picture is, is, is not as good in Germany um, either. And that is uh, why the German Library Association is actually um, calling for a nationwide expansion of network um, infrastructure so that also um, the very small libraries in the, in the rural areas um, get connection. And that's one of the issues we actually talk about in, in our report on state of libraries in Germany. I brought a, a copy with me today, so feel free to, to pass by and, and get a copy later on. Um, with regard to accessing um, digital resources, so accessing e-books, e-journals, uh, movies, etc., um, we, we believe that uh, e-books are a particularly important um, resource and libraries in Germany do offer e-books, um, but often in a restricted manner because of, of difficult licensing conditions. So another thing that, that the German Library Association is, is calling for is legal equality between physical books and, and e-books. And then finally to, to digital skills, I want to sort of end on a, a bit of a more um, positive note and uh, just tell you about the project that, that we are managing. It's called Total Digital, so totally digital. And it aims at providing um, youngsters with both digital and, and reading skills. Um, so I just want to, to show you one of the projects. It's, um, it's, a, it's a comic that was basically made by, by youngsters. You'll see it here. And um, uh, what the youngsters did was to, uh, to, to, to write a story for a comic themselves. Uh, then they, they took pictures of themselves acting out the story. And finally, they used a computer program to turn it all into a, a comic book. So a very fun and playful manner of, of, uh, of, uh, of learning about both digital skills and, and getting reading skills. Um, so I would just uh, yeah, like to make you aware of, of, of our, our report. I also have some information on, on this program, Total Digital, and maybe to make you aware of, of um, a website or a portal called Biblio 2030. Um, and there you can actually see practical examples of what libraries in Germany um, do in terms of advancing the sustainable development goals. So I think it's, it's a very good resource to actually get some practical examples. Thank you. So I want to open it up now. We've heard, uh, I, I think at least, obviously I'm, I'm on the library's team, um, some really good examples of why libraries should be included in, in national development plans. And yet we've seen research where I think, you know, we've got 32 countries where that's actually happening, which leaves us with a lot of other countries that we need to, to get out there and reach. So I just want to open up the floor to, to those of you in the room with any observations on what you've heard, any questions for our panelists, or anything you want to share from the situation that you find in your own country. And your hand's up first, sir, so I'm um, My name Can is you Seth. introduce yourself, and uh, we'll go from there. My name is a question. My name is James uh, Longole from USF Kenya. Um, I would like to, from the presenter so far, one of the things that has not been mentioned is, um, is um, how communities are able to sustain on their own without external support um, the services they're accessing from the library. Because when you say marginalized or rural, the assumption we are making is that they are not even able to a great extent to afford, um, I mean financially, um, some of the services they hold to, to be able, they, 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 some of the services they're coming for uh, at the libraries. So, how do you plan as now spearheaders of, uh, at the policy level of this initiative, how do you plan, what, uh, what mechanisms have you put in place to ensure that even without the external support, these communities are able to, to sustain 
these services for the next, let's say, 50 or 30 years. Uh, that's one. Number two, again, when you say rural or marginalized, again, one of the things that comes up is most of these communities are not able to, to write and read. So are there linkages you have created with the similar institutions, let's say academic in nature, so that there is a balance between uh, motivating these communities, let's say to go to school, to be able to access these services. Otherwise, the way maybe the way you, 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 you might have packaged it, it's just going to remain an elitist debate. Because what is this that, for example, would motivate me from uh, being in the village, or maybe I stay near a library, and I'm not able to read and read to, and write, but um, I'm able to say, okay, there's a library here with these services, and therefore I have to go to, let's say, for an adult education uh, class to be able to use these services found at the library. Well, let's, let's take that on, um, although I will be asking my expert colleagues to, to pick that up. Who would like to say something? Paul, you're reaching for the mic. Thank you so much, James, for that question. I think on the sustainability, what we've seen uh, is that once you open up these centers and uh, equip them with the, the appropriate devices or the computers and connectivity, uh, the, these centers have attracted other partners, like I'd mentioned a Digital Opportunity Trust, I'd mentioned Microsoft, Intel coming to offer certain courses within these facilities and offer certification to the students who come here. And uh, over time, even the, the agencies that manage the libraries see interest on the digital uh, content and they open up to look up uh, for resources to sustain the connectivity. And that's what we've seen in Kenya when many other actors have come on board and even the library itself has created a budget line for the connectivity beyond uh, the initial support that the authority supported. Thank you. Uh, I'd say uh, for sustainability in Uganda, what we're doing, we're encouraging the libraries to uh, allow free access, maybe by a limited time, depending on the demand then beyond that time, they could charge a small fee in order to be able to sustain, uh, to, to, to be able to generate some money to pay for the internet subscription. Already by taking, uh, taking the internet, you've taken away the installation costs and all the initial costs associated with uh, uh, providing the internet. So, Sustaining uh, just subscription costs uh, is, is, its money they can raise. But we do pay for the subscription for the initial two years. And also they provide other services which are not free of charge, like uh, printing and scanning documents. They charge a small fee. But we advise them in all cases to keep their fees below the, uh, what it would cost uh, in the market, in the open market. Yeah. But they also get funding from the local governments uh, where in the areas where they exist. So this can help to sustain uh, these projects. The second question was on digital literacy. Uh, the objective we partnered with libraries was to create a technological infrastructure for internet access there to enable local communities receive basic ICT training as well as gain access to online resources. So the communities uh, do get training from the same facilities in the case of Uganda. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chair, I must apologize because once I stop speaking, I'll walk through that door because there's another panel waiting for me. From the policy perspective, is the library on the, the budget of education 
or the budget of infrastructure, ICT infrastructure? I think that's one question I want to leave here before I go away. Because it is very important to get the policy perspective right. Um, if if we do not classify libraries in such a way that they can get the funding from the universal access, get the funding from education, get the funding from social and women affairs, then we might not be able to have them sustainable. I don't know how many of you come from Africa. Maybe the question I will leave on the table is, what is happening to your post office? If, because most post offices have had that issue of sustainability. And if we are not careful, libraries are going down the same way, in which we give them one role and one role alone. And if they cannot play that role, then they are going to die. Uh, and that is what I want to leave on the table. We need to have a, a sit down and have a policy uh, re-evaluation of the role of public libraries. And, know that they are in mainstream education, know that they are in digital infrastructure, know that they are in skills, and know that they are in community development. Uh, otherwise, we will overlook them in, in our SDG implementation, and if we are not careful what is happening to most post offices in Africa will happen to uh, these libraries. I live across West Africa, and I want to share with you what I've seen. What I've seen now is that people like yourself and myself are saying, we build libraries. So in their citizen-led library initiatives, where people bring in books, old books from their kids, and people bring in um, a few laptops and uh, a few handheld devices, and coupled with community connections, they get the libraries up and running. So I still want to put this on the table. Uh, I don't know if we have um, these initiatives that come into um, corporate uh, social responsibility, but I truly believe that um, libraries are here to stay. Now, whether it is the government that will ensure their sustainability or it is us as citizens that will have to take it upon ourselves, I do not know. But I want to leave that on the table and ask you whether you'll allow the libraries to die or you will make them leave. Thank you. I might ask, uh, I've got a question here before I go down to, to the end to the gentleman there. Um, I mean, fortunately, I think I can say based on experience, you can go, that's, you can go now, thank you very much. Um, I think the question whether or not the libraries are dying is obviously a huge one, but I think after working in the, in the area for 15 years, I think we've actually moved beyond that now in many, many places. Um, one of the things Nena mentioned there is about the right location for the library service within the government structure. And in Ireland, where I work, things started to go very well for our sector when we were moved out of, I think, the Department of the Environment uh, which is a strange place, I think, to, to have the public library sector, into the Department for Rural and Community Development, which is a really good fit for what the government wants to achieve in that area and has some connection to the gentleman's question around uh, literacy and improving skills in that area because that's a big focus in rural areas in Ireland as well. Anyway, Nico, I know you've got a question and you're very much based in the community or you've got comments, so I'm going to hand it over to you. Can you introduce yourself to everyone else? Hi, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Nicolas Pache. I work for the Association for Progressive Communications. And um, our, uh, and thank you for the, the amazing participation. I, I, I wish I would have had more chance to, to engage deeper in the, in the DC this year, but I'm happy that all these outcomes have come out of, of it. Um, I... We, we have been running a project for the last two years in relation to community networks. Uh, that is a topic that is very much related to uh, community, uh, to libraries in the sense that we serve the same population and uh, we are striving for the same goal for everyone that wants to have access to be able to have it. Um, and uh, I'm actually very happy to hear that the Universal Service Funds agents from uh, Uganda and Kenya, two countries that uh, we have partners in, 
are here. Uh, it shows uh, uh, the willingness of the governments to open up and be exposed to these discussions that are so important. Um, one of the things uh, that I have heard from uh, our colleague here in the back was in relation to how projects uh, can be sustainable. And this is by far one of the most asked questions in relation to um, rural problems. Uh, and in general, I think one very big mistake that we make is to try to measure um, uh, initiatives as if they were urban. Uh, we assume that things need to be measured with the same uh, rule oh, in the urban and in the rural. And we forget that the people that are in the rural areas uh, are uh, not only remote, uh, and that is a lot to say already, but also they are in the most challenging situations that can be. Uh, in general, the market is not able to get to those places. And the states struggle to get to those places too. Yeah, the Universal Service Fund probably have much less budget than the telecommunication ministry as a whole. So like the capacity for states, uh, and I relate a lot with your responsibility of bringing, like Universal Service is such a big name for, a, for, a, for an office. Um, uh, so the challenge is big and the resources are in general small, but we don't have to forget that these people are there uh, in the most challenging situations. So measuring the problems with the same rule would be a mistake. Still, um, supporting communities uh, in, in rural areas, I think it's a, a very important thing uh, because um, if, a, if, a, if a service is of essential need for them, no matter if, there are, if there's a business plan or a sustainability plan behind or not, once the service becomes essential for a community, the communities find their way to make it exist now and in the future. We, if, if you need examples for that, and, and I guess it's important to have them, water provision is one a very strong example. Communities have figured it out for ages and though they, are, they don't have enterprises that make sure that the water is there, the water is still there, and they are still having um, service. So, um, but one thing that we need to worry about, and I think the libraries and the Universal Service Fund entities are, can work together, is about the capital expenditures of having telecommunications infrastructure. The libraries in general are very well-known uh, entities within the communities and also respected entities within the state infrastructure. So they can be li liaisons with the communities when you do investment in infrastructure. Uh, by, by having this alliance in between the public sector, the mixed would be because you can have community libraries that are in between public and private, they have a relationship, and being rooted in the, in the territory they can uh, make effective use of the funds to get to the communities. But there are challenges in, in, in relation to libraries, and uh, this is the one essential comment, and I will stop there because I can talk for a lot, a lot of time, uh, that is in relation to how uh, uh, the spaces for accessing to telecommunication services. And in this place, I think it's the Achilles knee of libraries in the sense that public spaces are not always the best place where you want to access information. There are certain sensitive information that can't be accesses, accessed or you, you can be judged by accessing them on public spaces. So we need to work together to get the libraries and the communities to extend the coverage of the libraries to the community so, com so community members can access the connectivity in those private spaces where they feel comfortable and can access the services and the information that they require in the privacy of their homes or whatever place they feel comfortable in. Thank you. Yeah, I'd say that the, the, some of the work that's going on in the Dynamic Coalition on Community Networks is, is very much connected with what we're, we're doing and that extension element is something which we need to explore more. Um, there's a comment from the gentleman at the back and then we'll come back to our panelists. Thank you very much and uh, my apologies. I was on a panel 
for another session. But I wanted to join this conversation. And the last part I caught, and my name is uh, Honorable Samuel Nate George. I'm a member of parliament from Ghana. And um, I heard the comments Inena made before she left. We've had to battle with these challenges in Ghana, but we've worked what I will call as a model that seems to be addressing this. You have the Ghana Libraries Authority that is responsible for all public libraries. Now, you've realized that many of these libraries, like she pointed out, are facing the challenges that post offices face. Now, what we decided to do was to, and our libraries are under the Ministry of Education. And in Ghana, the Ministry of Education gets about 10% of our GDP, or annual budget. So there was funding for the Ministry of Education, but libraries were not a priority for the Ministry of Education. So what we did was to look at another government agency called the Ghana Investment Fund for Electronic Communications. That comes under the Ministry of Communications. Now, what GIFEC does is, by law, all the mobile network operators in Ghana contribute 1% of their net revenue to this authority. So then GIFEC is funded to then be able to use it to do what we call last mile connectivity to rural communities. And then we decided that the library authority, if you have a library in an area, let's digitize our libraries. So the community libraries and the public libraries, we started a digitization drive using the funds available to GIFEC. So GIFEC takes it over, connects it to the internet, and then it's no longer just a library but it becomes a skill acquisition center. So you can go there and read a book online, which has been digitized, or you can go there and actually get skills training in software or hardware development. So it's added a new dimension to what those libraries are. In areas where there were no libraries, we used GIFEC to build what we called enhanced community information centers. So these con uh, enhanced community information centers also give you access to digital material that you can access when you go in there. They've got laptops and, and desktops in there. And then there are also skills training that go in there. So you realize that these centers have now become the hub around which a lot of young people gravitate and find a source of livelihood. So it's, not, it's no longer just about going there to read. The centers and libraries are no longer just for literate people who want to read a book but for people who even want to get a digital skill. So you go there and you learn. So that's the model we've used. It's not perfect. There are challenges which we're trying to fix. On the issue of connectivity that you raised, for example, we, we, we have a, a solution that was developed by a Ghanaian company that just recently got awarded at the ITU that actually enables us to set up a 2G mast. That is 2G in some instances, in some instances 3G. That brings connectivity even where there is no electricity, it runs on solar power. And so in areas where there is no connection to the national grid, Ghana has 84% national grid connection, but in that little 16% that is left, you can actually have the solar power access to the internet in there, and then uh, internet connectivity and skills development there. So I thought I would share this with you and see if we could, we could look at replicating the model across. Thank you. But that is, uh, that's, uh, I think you know, these, these new models are, are essential. We, we can't stay the same. That's been something which our community has sort of recognised a long time ago. Um, Don, is that a comment from, from you? Now, we're going to make everyone be very, very quickly because I'd like to hear last words from panellists as well. best here at the Can end. you be quick, Don? Thank you, uh, Stuart. Uh, my name is Don Means with the Gigabit Libraries Network. I wanted to uh, maybe add a data point and make a pop uh, comment about the dynamic coalition. It might be helpful, maybe. Uh, one is that uh, in the US, uh, there are also people that lack access. Libraries provide internet access for one third of the adult population. Uh, roughly 80 million people, uh, 14 and over, access the internet at a library. Uh, most of them have another source of, of uh, access, but they go to the library for a range of reasons for speed, comfort, safety, whatever, for help uh, in using it. So uh, there's a whole array of uh, meanings when we use the term access. Uh, in terms of dynamic coalition, it, uh, it fostered uh, the partnership for public access since, <clears throat> since Sao Paulo, actually. I think that's when it really, uh, really started. This then has become uh, the partnership P4PA.net is a 
coalition of IFLA, of IFL, IEEE, uh, A for AI, uh, the People-Centered Internet, and several others, which are making the case that uh, universal public access is, can be achieved through uh, uh, three strategies that, accommodate, that could accommodate almost any circumstance. Uh, one is, as Nico pointed out, community networks, uh, public access centers like libraries or even offline internet where there's just no backhaul at all, that, that that could accommodate almost any circumstance and achieve universal access and that, uh, that there's no uh, credible strategy to actually bring everybody online without a public access component. And so uh, uh, our, my, my final comment is that, that the purpose and the value of universal service funds to actually achieve universal service can be most effectively invested to reach uh, public institutions, notably libraries, and that 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 can serve as a backhaul for build out of community networks together it's to uh, optimize uh, the investment and really achieve a goal that we've been working for for a long time. Thank you. Thanks Don and one of the things that Don and I also talk about is what, what can happen when you can take the connectivity that a library has to the next level and when you can put real super fast broadband into the public library the services that the library can offer just you know, really go out through the roof. So certain libraries in the US have very big pipe coming in, libraries in Finland, and that's where you can really kind of take things, as I say, to, to the next level. If you want to just say quickly on Yes, that. quickly, well, it's exactly right, Stuart, and there's one more thing that you can do once you have high capacity backhaul is that you can extend it beyond the library using wireless technology that I think now are available in Kenya. Uh, TV white space is a, is a wireless, open wireless technology that some libraries are using to support remote library access points, fixed points around the community to further uh, uh, make this critical service convenient for more patrons. Now I'm going to return to our panelists for any last comments. We had a, a remote question which was about how we drive people uh, who hold the universal access funds towards libraries. And I think we've covered some of that in the interventions um, from, from Paul and Emmanuel. Um, any sort of final observations? And Valencia as well, I know you've obviously been sitting here listening to the things and you've done the piece of research. And I have to say that they've put the main dynamic coalition session where we have to report back in three minutes. So it's uh, not a great piece of scheduling, but uh, let's take some final comments. Uh, well, one final comment here would be that uh, the Dynamic Coalition does have a plan to continue working on this piece of research and our plan or our goal is to follow up and move on from studying uh, simply the policy outcomes to go uh, more closer to the ground and see how these policies are being implemented. So moving on from assessing uh, outputs to impacts and uh, we have, I believe that the conversation that has been here uh, today will be able to inform our thinking as to what kind of questions we're supposed to ask. So for example when discussing uh, the role of libraries in broadband policies it would be a good idea to see where exactly they fall uh, within government authorities. That is uh, something that can arise from today's conversation. We can ask questions about sustainability, we can ask questions about uh, how the implementation took place and what the impact has been for the community and what uh, potential has it created for further action. So uh, many thanks for the conversation that took place today and if any uh, of you have been inspired uh, today to put forward some ideas as to what we should be looking at for the implementation, we would welcome these suggestions. Thank you, Stuart. Um, one of the things I discovered uh, when I visited the libraries was that uh, they enable more sharing of facilities, of the internet and computer facilities that we put in the communities. At the Rural Communication Development Fund, we've done a lot of projects with secondary schools, why we put an ICT lab in a secondary school but you find that when you do that, it's only the school and the school community which benefits from the facility. 
But at one of the libraries I went to in central rural Uganda, I found that two schools actually use the library for their computer studies because the schools don't have uh, computer facilities. So in addition to the community, general community using the libraries, we had two schools, two secondary schools using the libraries. So this means that if we have more intervention in the libraries, then we have more benefits, much many more people than say when we take the facilities to one school. So with these kinds of uh, uh, findings, we, we are more encouraged to do more of this kind of projects in other libraries. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think, as for me, maybe one of the things I needed to stress is that uh, maintenance of this equipment within the libraries uh, given that they are uh, placed in very rural areas has uh, proven to be quite a challenge. But what we've uh, realized is that when you use local actors who are able to reach those centers uh, very fast, then it eliminates the downtime in terms of response to any challenges uh, which may uh, occur within the libraries. And for sustainability, to me, I think, given that the synergies that come on board when the equipment or the CAPEX cost has been met, you find so many actors that will come on board that's allowing for sustainability of such projects to enhance accessibility. And then as we implement these projects, uh, we need to uh, have uh, at the back of our mind that about 5% of our populations are people living with disabilities. So we need to integrate and uh, uh, carry with us uh, uh, persons living with disabilities by availing assistive devices or some of these um, equipments to allow them also to engage and also learn digital skills. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Ramuna Petuhova. I am from Electronic Information for Libraries, and it happens that uh, IFL has worked in Ghana, Kenya, Uganda with library authorities that uh, managed to get USF funds. So if you want to talk about it, just come to me and I will say, tell you a secret. Well, you, you heard it here first. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, the IFLA website, the IFL website, the P4PA website, all have background information relevant to this session. Um, I'm sure you all have digital skills, so a simple search of Google will lead you there. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you soon.
So, hello and welcome. We are going to start with the workshop now. Hi, my name is Lea Gimpel. I'm the co-lead of the project Fair Forward, Artificial Intelligence for All, um, implemented by the German Development Agency on behalf of the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And I am your moderator for this workshop session. We will start with a short introduction and then we will have, we'll have insights from uh, six speakers sharing in five minutes a slot their take on digital commons and uh, digital public goods. Before we actually make this a real workshop and we'll break out into working groups for around 25 to 30 minutes discussing some of the key aspects our speakers will have highlighted in their um, introduction. And at the end, we will all come back here together in the uh, bigger group and share the insights that you uh, discussed uh, in the smaller groups. But let's start with a short introduction to the topic of the workshop. Data is a fundament of today's digital society and of innovative technologies such as artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. But data is also deeply problematic in uh, more than one dimension. First of all, there is a data gap. So there is just not enough data available in order to develop, for instance, um, voice assistance in regional languages and local languages from the African continent. There is just no theory in Kenya, Rwanda or in Tigrinya. And especially the Global South and here the African continent produces only a tiny, tiny fraction of the global data that is currently available. So we definitely need, in general, more data. Then we have the whole problem of data access. Most of the data that we have is locked behind doors currently. Or it's very expensive to obtain. Which, again, reflects the power imbalances that we are currently seeing in the digital economy. Because most of the data, of course, is held by multi multinational corporations who use this data to develop their own products, which, again, then produce data so these products can be uh, improved. And this feedback loop actually leads to quasi-monopolies in this space. And third, of course, there's the whole topic of data bias and uh, representation and data. Because data, of course, reflects our, our world, how we see the world. And this world, of course, is again deeply biased. So who is actually represented in data? How about gender issues? How about uh, marginalized groups? All of these different aspects are currently baked into the data we are working with and we are training algorithms with. So as a German development agency, we do have an interest in empowering partners in developing local artificial intelligence solutions in order to solve local problems. Because we believe that in this technology lays a, a huge potential, for instance, to give people access to data and information or to services by for instance, providing access in, with voice recognition in languages such as, I've already mentioned it, Kenya, Rwanda or Tigrinya. Because not everyone is speaking English. In fact, only 20% of the global population and only 5% speak English uh, as a mother tongue language. But, of course, we have to tackle a major problem and this is the access to data and the availability of data. So, by opening up data and discussing um, models such as data commons and uh, digital public goods, we hope to level the playing field for technology development. We also would like to foster local value creation by allowing local entrepreneurs to actually develop solutions for local markets. And, of course, being able to express yourself, for instance, in your own language also gives you the possibility to actually culturally express yourself and to preserve different currently marginalized cultures, which actually don't have a space in the internet and digital society today. And ultimately, with this whole approach of making more data available to the public, we would like to make technology development more inclusive and more democratic. So, this means that we, of course, have an interest in different data governance models, which allow for the non-excludable access to data as a fundamental infrastructure for today's uh, society. And more specifically, we are interested in data as a public good, which means data that is centrally governed, for instance, or data as commons, data that is collectively governed or polycentrically governed uh, by a group of people who are actually producing and maintaining and using this kind of data. 
I have to say that we do have a slight favor for comments um, because they truly empower people in the production and development of data and the use of these data actually. And even comments have a history in the computerized and the internet age, most notably for instance as the free software movement or the protocols our internet is based on or also Wikipedia which is one of the best known comments uh, currently um, in this world. But at the same time, we also see well that there's a lot of talk around comments and data comments uh, specifically. So for instance, with the AI Commons Initiative, uh, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative, the governments of France and Canada are aiming at building the Wikipedia for artificial intelligence. And the Global Data Commons Initiative is under the same roof. However, currently little is done so far in translating this into practice. So how do we actually go about creating these comments? How do we go about governing these comments? How do we go about building an ecosystem around these comments? And certainly one crucial aspect here is uh, the design of these governance models because we know since the tragedy of the comments and the work of Eleanor Ostrom that governance models and design principles for comments are essential in order to make them successful as a third model beyond the state and markets. So in this workshop, we would like to discuss and reflect on different viewpoints and experiences in the creation of data commons and the institutions, the governance models and legal frameworks needed to guide their development. And we will now give the word to our uh, six panelists. Um, the first one here is Renata Avila. She has many different things. <laughs> Among one of them, the member of the Board of Creative Commons. Renata, please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Lia. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here, like in Berlin, because in Berlin was one of the first places when we started uh, discussing Creative Commons long time, time ago. And uh, it's an institution that will be like uh, next year, 20 years old. So we have been discussing and dealing with the challenges that digital poses to sharing data for a long, long time. Uh, what changed, I think, in the framing and also in the culture of our spaces in civil society and governments is um, at the beginning we, we saw um, content, content creation. It, it was different framing. Uh, we, we, uh, we used to see it as, a, as cultural goods or as, as, it was not exclusively a commodity. And when, when uh, digital and specifically data is framed into the commodity space, data is the new oil and all of that, I think that that uh, fundamental change of mind uh, was crucial to um, disrupt in a bad way the future that we were trying to uh, build about uh, digital commons. And I think that we need to uh, have a profound cultural shift right now and uh, stop considering data as, as, as a commodity. And um, the, the proposal here that I want to discuss with you is how can we frame data as common infrastructure? And as a common infrastructure to build projects upon. And a common infrastructure either attached to a community, a city, or even to a country, or, or even better, to a region. That will really uh, develop the, the potential it has. Um, when uh, Leah was, uh, was talking, I realized rapidly that the same problems of in infrastructure that we have today with highways and with hospitals and with, like, you know, uh, with uh, uh, systems of sanitation, we will soon have with data if we do not consider data this key infrastructure, this key part of our, our digital societies and the way that we build our digital societies. And we, we have a lot of problems because uh, uh, currently our privacy rules, our like trade rules, and most of the rules that uh, uh, regulate digital are conceived with that frame of data as, uh, as commodity. So the first and the most challenging change, uh, change that we need to adopt is precisely that of uh, data as commons. Uh, but it's not only uh, changing data as commons, in, it is how can we um, have who, which authority will have a transparent uh, data handling and, and, and usage of the data it collects, and which rules will control that. 
and who will decide the rules. Um, I think that uh, the best model will be to have data uh, shared according to rules uh, set by the community and, enforce, uh, and, and to have an enforceable gov governance because, uh, of course, we uh, run the risk of, um, f f let me reframe it. First, uh, abstaining from taking uh, uh, different frame uh, will only increase the power of big tech and will leave us with even a deeper divide, a divide that we haven't seen before because uh, it will be basically digital imperialism, the, the, the problem that we're facing. Uh, second, uh, the, the place where I think that we can most rapidly adopt um, solutions on this is at the city, at the local level, and there are examples of it that I, we can share later. And uh, third, uh, my proposal of this framing is we cannot adopt a new data frame without, uh, an, uh, without the benefits of data sharing reverted back to the communities. I think that we have been exploited for so long, and this extractivism that we already saw with resources and with knowledge and with many other things that should be like commons, like, the, like our, our like forest and environment and water and so on, it cannot continue with data. It, it, is, it will block the possibility to fully exercise our human rights, and not only in, not economic rights, but also cultural rights is, a, is, a, is a, um, if we tied our hands as citizens and we cannot participate in building the infrastructure of the future, building the societies of the future, uh, we have a lot to lose. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, one, uh, one notion, if you have questions, please keep them uh, in your mind. We will have the discussion rounds later on to discuss them uh, further into the, in smaller groups. And at the end, we will also have uh, time to, to discuss at the end. Uh, next one up is Alex Klepel. Uh, he's the head of strategic partnerships at Mozilla's Open Innovation Team. He's based in Berlin and he drives the collaborations at the intersection of technology, politics and media to help scaling Mozilla's research and development efforts. And currently he has a strong focus on open voice data and technology. Thank you very much, Leah. Um, thanks for having me. Um, yes, I work for Mozilla and most of you know us as being a builder of browsers, but we have a broader topic spectrum. One of them is artificial intelligence, machine learning. And um, one angle we're taking, at least the foundation is taking, is exactly thinking about the frameworks of trustworthy AI. And uh, complementary to that, the Mozilla Corporation, um, the technology builders behind us, um, have two projects uh, focused on voice technology. Mozilla is a, has a history in open technology, but uh, in fact with open data, um, not so much. Um, and these two projects on voice technology are basically also our kind of pilot, pilot step uh, into that area. And uh, why are we focusing on, on voice technology and open voice technology? Because it's, it's not only a convenience factor, but it's um, a crucial access point to information, to services um, uh, of the internet, and that should be accessible to everyone, and not only owned by major corporations. And uh, we've been basically struggling with the same issues uh, the whole ecosystem is struggling. Um, speech technology these days is gated through major monopolies that have heavily invested in the technology and they keep it um, because it's precious and um, a ma major advantage they have is they can collect speech data through their products and these data sets are siloed and basically serve only those companies who collect them. Um, if you want to innovate in the field, um, there's massive barriers. One is, um, as I explained, the technology is bundled in only a few companies and also the data. So what we're trying to do is um, a twofold approach. One is we have developed an open source speech recognition engine, which is uh, publicly available. Uh, the f fully fledged version will come out next year. You can always uh, tinker and test it already. Um, and the other part is, and this is how we collaborate with the BMZ and the GIZ, um, is called Project Common Voice, which is basically a crowdsourcing initiative to open up speech data in as many languages as possible, with as many accents as possible, and generally creating a broad application of the diversity of voices out there. 
And um, right now, um, we have collected about 2,400 hours of voice data in 33 languages. That sounds a lot, and we are actually the largest publicly available data set. But if you think of, for quality production speech recognition, you need about 10,000 hours um, per language. So there's a lot to do. And um, one of the um, interesting projects we're having with the GIZ is actually around um, project uh, Digital Umuganda. And it's, for me, it's fascinating just to see how, well, it's not fascinating, but it's eye-opening to see how difficult it actually is. Even if you provide the right infrastructure, the platform to collect that voice data, actually to get in the place where you can start incentivizing people to donate their voices, um, finding the right uh, text resources that are license free that can actually be used because otherwise you have uh, uh, license baggage and the technology building on these data sets um, or the technologists will actually need to have legal departments to deal with that. So that stifles innovation as well. Um, so I'm most interested in kind of the mechanisms of how to incentivize people um, to be open uh, to open data, but also to support the entire value chain because data is the foundation and this is already a massive threshold. But then how do you process it? Like who is able to train the algorithms? And I'm not even talking about the application side of things. So there's a huge gap between like even the lack of data and then actually creating services and products that are locally relevant and that are actually sustainable and not only dependent on one player or even singular persons, but that are being shared by um, a multitude of stakeholders that have a common interest and that um, want to build up these kind of infrastructures for the public good. All right, thank you so much, Alex. So that is really a fascinating project and let's hear how it's operating on the ground. Um, next one up is Odas Nyankuru. He's the founder and CEO of Digital Muganda, a tech startup in Rwanda that is uh, collecting open voice data together with Mozilla. Yeah, um, thank you, Leah. Um, I'll start by, by, by giving um, some statistics uh, about internet connectivity and I'll, I'll dive in why I'm, uh, I'm starting with that. 46.4% um, of the world is not connected to the internet at the moment, and 72% um, of, the, of the population in Africa is not connected to the internet. And I think we can all agree that it's not a problem of, of lack of infrastructure. It's not just a problem of lack of infrastructure, but also a problem of lack of content, especially in local languages. And um, to solve that problem, I believe giving access to people in local languages is one key uh, uh, solution. Uh, the problem becomes that um, the, that sort of data is held by big corporations that will not share it with uh, others and that its uh, innovators are not able to access that information. And it's in those uh, regards that we, we looked at the problem and how to create uh, data commons such as, as, as open voice data to solve that problem. But most importantly, how do we also enable um, local innovators to take use of that, all those technologies so that can be able to actually produce solutions on ground. Uh, we partnered with Mozilla, as, as Alex said, and, and, and GIZ, and we are currently building open voice data sets in Kinyaranda, but also looking at how to accommodate as many languages as possible, because uh, with open voice technology, then um, you could think about the, the, the enormous applications, especially since um, African um, um, cultures tend to be oral cultures, and oral tend to be the preferred uh, way of interaction. Um, so if you could think, um, let's say, somebody in rural Rwanda trying to access uh, justice system because they've been facing injustice and they cannot do that because uh, lawyers are scarce and the free legal clinic is at kilometers away, but they could be able to uh, just call in a number and get access to that information because it's, it's in a database somewhere. Um, and the, the barrier becomes that they don't have, let's say, a smartphone to access that information, but with voice technology, you could think about many ways in which they could just dial in a number and, and, and get that information and get access to justice through voice technology. That's why I believe in, 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 in the application of voice technology, especially uh, in underserved communities such as the ones I come from. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, Odas. And uh, now we have another speaker from the African continent. Um, Baratang Mia has 17 years of experience as a tech social entrepreneur. She's the founder and CEO of Girl High Women Who Code, a software engineering academy for women and girls. Um, thank you, Leah. I am going to echo what he said about internet co connectivity and say that I think for for us as Africans, it's always important to realize that most Africans are not connected on the internet. And ITU has just reported that in the past two years, um, most of the people who are not using internet are now women. In the past it was 13%, now it's fallen down to 11% of women are now lessly using the internet. And um, there's a lot of data bias um, on as women, we do not have access to proper education. The literacy level is very low. So now the people who are creating content and um, for Africa are still males. And we're still mainly the consumers of uh, the internet information. So we are recommending that public data commons must be made available to um, us and especially people who are not using data to build AI only, but to understand and to reshape the future of the AI. And um, in that information should be made available and freely used, that can be reused and redistributed by anyone with no existing local, national, or international legal restrictions on access or usage. At the moment, there's many restrictions. If you want data from government, you have to go through many, many channels to just access data. We're still struggling to find, especially in South Africa, to find out what's the, no what's the number of women who are not being subsidized by government or what's the number of women who are, subs are not subsidized in terms of um, when they want to start their businesses. And that's just a simple concept. To, you could just go to the internet and find information. But if you want uh, proper, reliable information, you have to through, go through loads of channels um, from government, and sometimes you don't even have it. So that for us, it's still a major barrier. So we think the key to collect high quality data and use it e effectively is by having more data commons and having capacity building for us to be able to use it. And one path is to set the standards that will format the data and enable high quality data because at the moment we don't trust it to be easily shared and understood by a normal public person and not to be taken for granted that today it's only because it's up, what's there it's only acceptable according to um, standards of, of other people. Um, I don't think there's any proper African standards for internet usage or data usage. Um, in as much as we know that data can catalyze innovation and improve services, we are also aware that at the moment we are there's this overselling of data being the new oil, whilst we underestimate the impact that it's gonna have on it, with, especially with the algorithms built on the perspective of white males mainly at the moment, because they are the ones who work mainly in the um, engineering sector, and they are the ones building the future of AI at the moment. So we need more perspective. And if we're gonna say the data is the the new oil, we need to realize what oil did to the world. When, it, when, it's, when oil has too much power, it creates too many dangers. So we don't want AI to do the same to the world. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, there's already some controversial discussion here. If data is a new oil or shouldn't be a commodity at all, <laughs> let's uh, discuss this uh, later on in this session. Um, then we have an, as the next speaker, Mgada Kazinskaita. Budeberg, she's a program specialist uh, of the Knowledge Societies Division in the Communications and Information Sector at the UNESCO in Paris. Mgada, please. Uh, thank you, Leah, for this invitation. And uh, before I start, I just would like to ask how many of you know what, uh, what do we speak about 2019? 2019 is a year of indigenous languages. I don't know how many of you know. 
There are some hands, very good. Uh, and this is where basically uh, my intervention will be focused exactly on um, under-resourced, underrepresented languages. Because what we tend to speak a lot about technological solutions, data processing, and of course artificial intelligence and many other aspects, but we very often forget what we speak really about small number of languages around the world. We speak probably around 50, 100, maybe sometimes we can refer to 500 languages, but in reality, linguists count up to 7,000, and if we take into consideration dialects, we may count up to uh, 10,000 uh, languages and dialects around the world. And what does it mean? It means that when we speak about these issues, we have to address um, data and openness data related to linguistic and cultural diversity. Um, we could clearly see what uh, many of those languages are spoken, especially um, those which are, are not constitutionally recognized. Uh, we very often could be community languages only spoken by very small community. Uh, or those what we already have heard by some speakers before me, but these are the oral cultures which may require as well specific um, arrangements in terms of what kind of uh, solutions we provide. Well, it's clearly what we don't have tools which it would be available for those which are um, well represented dominant languages around the world and the resources available would be much more uh, broadly available and of course opportunities provided. So what it brings us to, uh, to one of the key uh, uh, question is how, what do we do with those languages which are not uh, dominant, which are underrepresented? Uh, what are the financial models could be uh, uh, taken into consideration? Because as we have heard, um, uh, if this is a huge investment uh, to prepare full data set, and uh, we probably only focus on those which are economically, financially interesting for the companies and as well um, organizations which are involved in this, um, in this work. Um, UNESCO, uh, has a world atlas of languages in danger, which will be changing next year to world atlas of languages. But we clearly can say today what from those, um, from data what we have, that around 40% of uh, linguistic diversity around the world is in danger. Some of those uh, languages are vulnerable. We are present online. We have as well all written systems which could be used uh, for providing uh, access to, to, to information in those languages and resources. But uh, what we clearly see as well, that a majority of those languages which are in danger are spoken by uh, fewer than 10,000 speakers. So it means economically it's really not interesting uh, to actually document those languages unless we are really interested in the cultural, linguistic, diversity, heritage, if we're interested in traditional knowledge, passing um, historical um, information to next generation, or so, in some cases, for instance, uh, discovering new traditional practices, uh, traditional practices which could be converted into profitable uh, solutions in any industry. So this means that basically uh, our technological solutions very often have to be based exactly on audio and, and video files and on and different solutions provided and not necessarily on one what we would uh, imagine would be written systems. Um, so another important issue is what I want to bring uh, to your attention. What um, as we involved in International of Indigenous Languages, and it's only one uh, month left, but we could see it clearly what around the world we had more than 900 um, international events taking place at different levels, whether it would be institutional, um, higher educational institutions, whether it would be governmental organizations, private organizations, and many other ones related to capacity building workshops and uh, presentation of dif different solutions. But one thing what it comes out clearly, what, what means public and open data for us, it doesn't mean necessary for communities the same way. Um, uh, in some communities, we clearly see what its affects as well, the way um, communities see um, the understanding with uh, external world, and uh, there is a need of clear um, and direct communication with communities where we really the data and communication we have with those communities collecting this data is fully understood by community because very often we clearly see it what um, sharing something means as well giving away. 
And that means what we have to explain to communities, to language speakers we work with, what um, something will be returned. And I would echo those few speakers before me who said what we have to return this as well to communities. It's not only for industry, it's not only for the public goods, but as well something which it could con uh, um, concretely mean uh, for the communities themselves. So therefore we have to address issues related to privacy, to intellectual property issues, and we have to be, of course, clearly um, and well discussed with those communities. Um, what are the sustainable governance models uh, for data commons? I would say, of course, multi-stakeholder approach is one of the commonly used approaches, but I would as well come back with data, especially one which is provided by language communities, should be owned uh, by communities. And we could decide whether it is open, free, or it's preparatory, or or other things. Um, we as well have to clearly define what we want with those um, structures, infrastructures, what is the purpose, what is, um, uh, what is objective, what are expected outcomes, because sometimes um, data collection for the sake of collection data, it it's, does not lead much. We have, of course, to convince that this data has a value not only just uh, for community, but as well could have a value for humanity. Uh, so uh, here it brings a question of how data, what we collected, um, is accurate and scientifically valid, uh, because that gives, uh, brings me to the next issue, but if we uh, do not take into consideration, um, let's say, scientific aspects while we collect data, it is not easy uh, for policy and decision makers to integrate this data in decision making processes. And for instance, for us, like inter intergovernmental organization like UNESCO, we frequently discuss with our uh, department, uh, with our Institute for Statistics, which is an official body to collect data, um, statistical information for UN agencies, and which has access to many uh, national uh, department of statistics, where alternative ways of collecting data are not necessarily seen as scientifically valid. So there is a need as well to have more dialogue with different department of statistics at different levels, but it would be clearly understood what we mean by open data, how it is collected, whether it is scientifically valid and accurate, and um, uh, in order to avoid situations where data by default is rejected. Uh, and that's a very important point because if we want to integrate this and, and see as a, um, data commons would, would be an instrument for, um, for innovation policy, uh, this aspect is important for, for, for formulation of, uh, of new policies uh, and, and solutions. Uh, so that would be for, for the time being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amgana. So, raising a lot of interesting questions. For instance, how to define the purpose uh, of the data use, and that is certainly uh, something that needs to be done collectively when we are talking about comments. So, as a last speaker, we have uh, K.S. Park. Uh, he's coming from the Korea University, and he's also the director of OpenNet Korea, a digital rights organization. Um, and he has worked on key open data movements in the country such as court judgment databases, the right to be forgotten, and the use of pseudonymized data and other things. Park. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about something that uh, people in this room probably don't want to talk about being too nice. Um, basically, data protection law. Um, databases of uh, court decisions are the treasure trove of uh, information about a society and its norms and practices, uh, but are most often suppressed into silos reserved only for judges in different countries, most often for the reasons of uh, data protection for the people involved in the dispute or for the reasons of uh, personality rights of the people uh, involved. Um, Korea, uh, in Korea, uh, less than 1% of uh, the Supreme Court's decisions are published. Uh, less than 0.5% of lower court decisions are uh, made available publicly. Um, all for reasons of uh, uh, data protection. So what arguments can we uh, make to unleash the communal power of such databases 
to make the society more just in dispute resolution, make the economy more efficient in resource allocation. Um, I want to propose a certain idea, uh, the idea of uh, data socialism, uh, which is not very far from what people have said so far. Uh, Renata talked about data as a uh, infrastructure. Um, or if data is an infrastructure, then it should be socially owned and socially uh, uh, controlled. Uh, let me give you another uh, example why we need to uh, take head on the challenges of uh, uh, making reconciliation with the data protection law. We talked about how AI may not function fairly or ethically. Um, now, uh, Amazon shut down its hiring system because uh, it could not uh, fairly select uh, uh, female uh, candidates. Um, how do we solve the problem? Uh, some of the facial recognition technologies are being shut down because they don't recognize uh, African-American faces uh, correctly. Um, one of the reasons that uh, the AI functions are limited uh, may be because there is not enough data about uh, women who have uh, made successful careers in the Amazon hiring system. Uh, it may be because, uh, as uh, one of the panelists said, uh, uh, people making the system uh, have not collected uh, enough data about African American communities. But what are, you ta what, what are you saying here? I mean, then do we need to go out there and collect more data from them? That means less privacy for them. Uh, that means uh, less data, pro uh, that means less data protection for them. Um, what ways, in what ways can we come out of this uh, self-defeating uh, dilemma? Um, so we come back to this idea of uh, data socialism. Um, in a way, data, personal data, is born social. I'm a law professor. People call me Professor Park. But I cannot be a professor alone. I'm a professor only to the extent that there are students willing to sit and listen to my lecture. Um, my identity, uh, my identity or my job as a professor uh, is something I cannot own or control. It's not something that I can prohibit other people from sharing just because it's about me. Because that facet of me was not born entirely from me, but it, it was created socially. Of course, I mean, socialism has nothing to do with whether the property, uh, whether, uh, uh, whether the commodities uh, come from social sources or not, but just in advancing the argument why some of the personal data, if not all, should be considered uh, public resources instead of uh, uh, libertarian commodities. Uh, um, I'm, you know, to, 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 to advance the argument, I'm, uh, uh, I'm making that uh, observation. Uh, this idea is not necessarily an opposition to data protection laws. Um, data protection laws, uh, the actual mechanics of it, is built on the metaphor to data ownership, uh, that you own your data, but I mean, that statement is uh, cyclical, right? If you if it's yours, then that means you own it already. Uh, what's really meant by the statement is that you own data about yourself. But then again, data about yourself, as I said before, 
has social origins. Uh, my job, uh, I mean, even in the uh, uh, structuralist, structuralist uh, philosophy, um, I mean, what is a tomato? Is there substance to tomato-ness? We all know that there is no such thing. Tomato is tomato only because it doesn't have the features of other fruits or vegetables. Uh, it's all relative. So uh, the identities, personal identities, come from uh, relations with other people, relations within the communities. Another reason to uh, think about uh, communal uh, ownership of uh, some of personal uh, data. Now, uh, the uh, proponents of uh, data protection laws themselves understand that data ownership uh, is supposed to be only a metaphor, uh, not the uh, actual uh, truth uh, by which uh, privacy is to be uh, protected. So there are exceptions carved out of data protection laws. Uh, for instance, uh, Singapore, India, Canada, Australia, they all have exceptions to publicly available data, just as uh, Germany uh, used to have until uh, 2017. Um, so, uh, well, I'll stop there for now, and uh, I'll uh, develop more in questions and answers, if you have any. Thank you, KS. So now it's actually time for working groups. Um, I already said this in the beginning, it's a real workshop, so uh, you have also to do something, dear guests, uh, namely forming groups now, let's say three or four, uh, maybe in the corners of the rooms, and you have 25 to 30 minutes with the speakers to discuss your questions that you have, which came to your mind during their statements, and they also prepared some guiding questions for the discussion. Um, I would put forward maybe to go uh, in, about it this, in this way, that uh, Renata and Baratang can team up and uh, discuss um, institutions and governance structures and inclusiveness um, of efforts uh, to build data commons. Then we will have a group on community efforts to build data sets, incentivizing structures and building an ecosystem around a specific data set with Odas and Alex. And as a third group, I would propose to have um, Umgada and uh, KS to discuss privacy, data socialism, and the right not to be represented, repre be represented in the data. Um, yeah, please spread around the room. If there is a fourth group which would like to form, uh, please feel free to do so. The only important point is that you have someone who can at the end um, be a rapporteur and wrap up what you've been discussing in the next uh, 25 minutes. Thank you.
So hello everybody. I hope you're having inspiring discussions, but I need to ask you to come back to the bigger forum now and share your insights. Okay, once again, we have to wrap up here, so please come back to uh, the forum and um, let's see what you have been discussing. Okay, so time is ticking. Uh, please come back uh, to uh, the bigger group and um, stop your conversations at this point so that we can all learn what you've been discussing so fiercely. Okay, I think it's actually a good sign that you are still um, discussing, which means that there's a lot of energy in the room, even at this uh, point in time, and I'm sure it was a long day for all of us. So we have, I think, um, a few minutes left. So I would like to learn more about what you've been discussing in these three groups. Do we have three rapporteurs, we can quickly wrap up the discussions. Okay, so Daniel will start with the group on incentivizing mechanisms and building communities. Thank you. Okay, I hope this is working. Yeah, it's working. Cool. All right, so our group basically looked at um, the supply side of things. How do you collect data sets um, and the demand side, so what, what could be done or who could be interested in using those data sets um, with Alex and Odas. In terms of data collection, um, we looked at incentive mechanisms. Uh, Odas from, from Digital Umuganda uh, actually shared with us their approach, which is to do the data collection um, basically leveraging on an existing uh, voluntary community day that happens, uh, I think, once a month in, in Rwanda. 
and that idea of uh, sort of self self care and cooperation to collect data, and they do, they do that together with universities and schools to collect the data sets. They are using a technical platform that is uh, provided by Mozilla, which Alex presented earlier, the Common Voice platform, which is basically crowds offering offering a platform for crowdsourcing the data. There was another interesting example from the project Wheelmap, which uh, builds on OpenStreetMap infrastructure for collecting information about accessibility in places, also a lot with schools, uh, students, voluntary contributions. Um, what was interesting was we also talked about biases in data collection. For example, with a common voice, they find that there's a lot of male voices. Uh, so even though in the theory, crowdsource data could be balanced, in practice you find that the people who crowdsource are actually, you know, there are biases and representations there, and there's a challenge there. And on the demand side of things, um, we talked about, um, let's see, from, from, from the run-in side, for example, that uh, they are working on a larger ecosystem around voice data, universities, entrepreneurs, media companies, um, public institutions that are all interested in using this, this um, voice data sets and the voice recognition models. We also talked about the preserving of languages, um, and there was one gentleman who talked about the language uh, that, um, I, I didn't get where you were from. From Belarus. From Belarus, exactly. And that was the language that is being sort of re, uh, re recorded by their audio samples. And, and he asked whether Mozilla would be able to incorporate that into their platform. And it, theoretically, technically, it would be possible. But then the question comes down to the license, which was quite interesting because they use the CC0, so a very open license. Uh, last but not least, in terms of challenges on the demand side, it was very much about expectation management because building a voice data set in this case takes a lot of time. It's not something very quick. And another issue that was raised that open access to such, such data sets doesn't necessarily mean equal benefit or equal usability of these data sets because you also need people with the skills to make use of that data. Perfect. Thank you so much, Daniel. This was quite uh, comprehensive, uh, I'd say, being part of the discussion group as well. Um, let's go to, um, well, Case Park or Renata or who would like to go first with the group and who is... Um, Philip, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so we basically started with the idea of data socialism, um, <laughs> which well, maybe obviously um, was quite controversial, but we talked a lot about communities and the rights of communities um, in terms of, well, protecting and also benefiting from the data that is collected about them. Um, so we, for example, talked about how scientists, researchers, etc., cetera, um, interact with indige indigenous communities and um, perhaps not collect data, but at, po uh, at some point um, extract data. And then the idea came up, okay, when, at what, at what point is the uh, raw data uh, part of the community and at what point does the researcher or any other institution um, make a data set out of the raw data and presents it as something new. And then the question is, okay, who, who owns the raw data? Okay, then you maybe have a more direct link to the community, but once it's a data set, it becomes more complicated, right? Um, so there's a disconnection between the data and the subject in the research and how in the end you're going to use it. Um, and the second part of the discussion focused more on the data socialism part and how personal your data can be because you're always embedded in relations to, well, not only other people, but also in a social environment, in a community. So I think if I got the idea right, what Kyungshin Park tried to explain with data socialism is try to moderate these, this metaphor of data ownership um, and that this would lead to a more nuanced approach to data protection. But from the discussion, I, I think what came out is everybody came up with different kinds of examples um, where um, a blanket approach to data protection would not work. And if you, if you are advocating for a nuanced approach, then it is basically it goes down to every individual case, um, which can become, become problematic. 
Thank you, Philip. And I think last one up is uh, Uta giving a wrap up of the discussion on um, what did we have here? Institutions and governance structures. Is this right? Yes, that's true. Um, so maybe um, to to sort of underline again why we are here, I found uh, one statement very rem remarkable because we tend tend to forget about it. It was uh, the statement that. Um, uh, What's your name? <laughs> but Taka, I, for, I forgot your name. Uh, that you said that in Africa we need access. Um, we, we are talking very much about data protection here, but in Africa, uh, be it an African country, be it uh, through silos, data is very often very protected. Maybe not in the sense that we think of data protection here, but uh, there's really uh, the need for data, the need for access. So it's not. Uh, it's not a luxury, there is a need. And um, you also highlighted a key question there that just needs to be sort of a guiding question, and that is, does the data that we are producing, that we are freeing and whatever, does that serve the issues of the communities and uh, you need consent from the communities that I would put sort of as an overarching understanding in our group uh, on top of this. Um, then we, would, we were discussing about what would institutions for data look like and uh, um, how can we uh, empower people with data. We, we claim that, but how does that translate actually? And Renata was saying, how, we, how can we democratize the tools to actually enable pe people to do something with data? And that uh, connects to a topic that we spend a little bit more time on, um, on how to create usage of that data, be it by fostering the tools or be it also by um, uh, by creating communities that are interested in the data and have the capabilities of, of using it and have, an, have, an, uh, have use cases. And that could be, of course, uh, commercial actors, but it, uh, of course, could be other actors as well. Um, there was the idea to, um, so one step back, because we sort of understood that very often we are demanding uh, the openness of data and we are not yet um, uh, able to show so much that this innovation um, hypothesis that we have that that is, uh, that is holding true because we don't see um, the widespread innovation yet. That was sort of a, a diagnosis. And um, we believe that this, is, uh, that this is possible, but maybe it hinges on uh, also supporting um, side systems um, for this data, uh, such as journalism, such as, uh, such, as, uh, such as science, for instance, people who can use that because not everybody will become a data scientist. And um, in line with that, um, we were uh, trying to think about the encouragement of innovation and the use of data um, to, um, for instance, um, address the question of, um, uh, of, of what other drivers uh, for use cases could be. And uh, there was the, the sort of the, um, the, the takeaway to think about problems, global problems, where uh, data um, uh, that we that we uh, use, uh, that we create, can actually contribute to solving of the problem. One of the problems that was named was uh, climate crisis. Um, so that would be a concrete problem space where we could uh, and should argue for um, for collaborative data generation that is actually of use because it's about showing that there are use cases for these uh, for these um, for the public data or the data commons depending on which way you would want to go there um, what was left open a little bit is the the question that we should uh, include the um, uh, include the challenges of how to maintain clean add and um, continue with data data sources it's not a one time issue but you you have to sort of uh, um, encourage future processes around the data governance um, and there, the idea was sort of held that uh, we should more explore the, um, the partnerships between the private sector and the public sector in terms of maintenance. And another approach, uh, I will close, oh, two, two more, no, another approach I will close with that was a con concrete proposal for funding, because that's always key. Um, the, the rule was proposed that um, for community or non-commercial use, the, um, the data could be free of charge fees could be, uh, could be waived, but that there would be licenses for companies to use community-generated data. That was a very uh, tangible suggestion that came out of our group. Thank you so much, Uta. Case. Uh, yes. I, I also want to uh, make sure that our group also ended with a, a little bit of promising note uh, by uh, uh, s supplementing the report. I also took, took, took the notes. Uh, 
So we talked about solutions as well. So when we talked about uh, data extraction from indigenous communities, uh, capacity building uh, is important. And also there are uh, movements to uh, share uh, data uh, between uh, small businesses because uh, only big businesses uh, have uh, enough data to, do, uh, uh, to, to make good applications. Uh, and also uh, as to the, uh, uh, the, the nuanced approach as opposed to one size fits all approach. Uh, the uh, distinction between uh, private data and personal data were talked about where, uh, where privacy uh, is considered more like a boundary, manage boundary manage management for each person uh, where each person uh, controls uh, the boundaries, uh, boundaries uh, over which you know, their personal data uh, uh, are not allowed to uh, leave or cross. So the, the last comment was that uh, along the line, uh, the kind of data you submit to uh, telecoms to get phone service, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to complete a transaction uh, should be uh, uh, protected strictly as uh, private uh, data. Okay, thank you uh, for, uh, for this add-on. So time is already up and I'm not trying to do a wrap up of the wrap ups. <laughs> so let me just say uh, thank you for sticking with us throughout this workshop. Um, it was, I think, an interesting discussion and certainly a discussion that we have to take further. And uh, for now, I just wish you a nice evening. Thank you. <laughs>